Welcome, uh, everyone. Greetings from New York City. Uh, my name is uh, Rafael Yuste. I'm a professor of biological sciences at Columbia University, and I'm also the director of the Neurotechnology Center. Um, the Neurotechnology Center is hosting this meeting with the Donostia International Physics Center from San Sebastian, Spain. And um, I'm doing this together with my colleague, Aitzol Garcia Echari, who's uh, over there, Aitzol, in the Basque Country. Hello. And um, uh, we're going to, um, to say a few words before we get uh, started. So, um, so first, uh, what is uh, nanoneuro and why is this important? So, and why uh, now? So nanoneuro um, could be defined as the intersection of nanoscience and neuroscience. And uh, as you know, both fields are healthy, strong fields, but they uh, seldom interact. And it turns out they have a lot to, uh, to talk to each other about. And particularly uh, in the last decade, um, neuroscience has undergone a revolution in terms of methods. So this is neurotechnology and this uh, was jump-started by the launching of the US Brain Initiative, a White House initiative by President Obama, which is slated to last 12 years in the US and currently uh, encompasses more than 500 laboratories in the US and the world. Um, and there's similar uh, brain initiatives uh, in other parts of the world. And the purpose of this brain initiative is to generate uh, neurotechnology methods to record and modulate the activity of the nervous system. And the reason this is important is because unless we have these methods, uh, it's very unlikely that neuroscience will be able to provide a general theory of how the brain works or be able to treat the mental and neurological diseases. So at the heart of the brain initiative from the beginning was the push to take advantage of the great uh, uh, discoveries and uh, the generation of new science that has occurred in nanoscience. So nanoscience has its own history and maybe I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that as of today, there's a vibrant community of nanoscientists, mostly coming from physics or from chemistry and engineering, uh, that are generating nanomaterials that could be used to build these new tools that we need in neuroscience to uh, study the brain. So that's why uh, nanoneuro is important because you could imagine harnessing a lot of nanomaterials from nanoscience and put them to good use in neuroscience. And that's why it's important to do this now. In fact, in the original proposal to the Brain Initiative, it was already suggested that proposal was uh, sent by a combination of uh, neuroscientists and nanoscientists. And it was already suggested that nanoscience could, uh, could have a lot to say in the future of, of neuroscience. So that's the reason we, uh, we are interested in nanoscience. And that's the reason we organized this symposium. Columbia University is, um, has uh, a deep bench in terms of neuroscience and the DIPC in San Sebastian uh, is uh, similarly uh, very strong in nanoscience. So this is a natural collaboration between both institutions. So last year, in 2020, uh, we were going to have an on, on, on-site meeting, a nano-neuro meeting in, in San Sebastian. And we even got a grant to, uh, to fly people over, but we got hit by COVID. So instead we did it uh, online and it was actually very successful. It was a two day meeting. Uh, and this year we decided to uh, repeat the meeting uh, with uh, different speakers with one day. And this meeting is now more focused uh, on, uh, it has two sessions. So maybe let me just uh, share my screen so that you see, uh, you see the, everyone can see the, the program. Uh, I think you should be able to see the program. So we're going to uh, to start right away with uh, session one, which is focused on uh, optical methods. And then uh, we're going to have a session two, focus on uh, uh, electronic and magnetic, electromagnetic methods. 
and we're going to end up with a keynote address by Shenan Bao from Stanford University, and she's going to tell us about skin-inspired uh, electronics for neural interfaces. So the speakers um, have uh, 25 minutes for their talk, and there will be five-minute uh, Q&A after each of them. And at the end of each session, we're going to have a panel, a panel discussion, which is going to be moderated by uh, myself, Anna Itzol, uh, and all the speakers uh, should remain uh, in the session. All the speakers of each session should remain in the session because they're going to be brought uh, uh, into the panel to have a joint discussion between all of them. So um, without further ado, I just wanted to, uh, to thank uh, uh, the Kavli Foundation, who's uh, partly uh, um, funding this, this meeting. And, um, and I would just like to pass the, the mic to Aitzol. Aitzol, the, the floor is yours. Yes. After everything that you have said, I don't have anything else to add, I would say. Mostly looking at the clock, it's already six past three, and I don't want to delay the meeting. Just saying things that people probably are not that interested about compared to what we are going to learn from our speakers. So, Rafa, if you agree, uh, I would start the, the session. Um, yes, why don't we get started? So um, the speakers who are not, um, the speakers should have the camera on um, during their talk, but otherwise, uh, uh, please turn off your camera until uh, it's your turn to speak and uh, mute yourself. And with uh, that, um, I told you can just go ahead and take it from here. Yes, so super briefly, our first speaker is James Alejanti, and he will be talking about functional nanoparticle bioconjugates for enhanced neuronal recording and stimulation, which yeah, is very nano neuro. So the room is yours, James, please go ahead. Great, thank you, it's, it's all. And uh, thank you, Rafa, uh, for the invitation, and I'm happy to uh, kick things off and be the first uh, speaker of the symposium this morning. Um, very much in keeping with Rafa's comments uh, in terms of the intersection of nano and neuro, um, it is from the nano side that I that I come to this. And so my the title of my talk is Functional Nanoparticle Bioconjugates for Enhanced Neuronal Recording and Stimulation. And so my laboratory really spends uh, much of its time thinking about how to interface uh, a variety of nanoparticle materials with cells um, for a variety of purposes, whether it be for enhanced imaging or sensing or drug delivery or globally controlling um, cellular function. So the reason much of the motivation really comes from a sense of scale. So in this, in this picture on the left here, you know, mammalian cells exist at the micron scale. 50 micron, 100 micron neurons can be even larger than that. But the actual cellular machinery, the, the, the pieces that make the cell function are on the nano scale. Um, organelles like the mitochondria, specifically for our purposes here today, the plasma membrane uh, is an organelle and it's on the five nanometer scale. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how to interface uh, nanoparticle biological conjugates with cells with control. And so one of the materials that we use that I'm going to talk about today are semiconductor quantum dots. Um, these are small nanocrystalline materials synthesized on the, on the three to 10 nanometer scale, and you can control their emission by controlling their size. And so some of the systems that we have developed are centered on using these materials as scaffolds to attach peptides and drugs and to be able to control drug delivery uh, and to control cellular function. So um, just a little bit uh, up front for those who are not familiar with the Naval Research Lab. Um, it was the idea of Thomas Edison back in the, in the mid, uh, around 1915, uh, had the concept that the Navy should have a, should have a lab uh, to develop materials and technologies uh, for the warfighters, specifically uh, Navy and Marine. And so the lab came into existence in 1923. I work in the in the division called the, the Center for Biomolecular Science and Engineering. And there are a number of different tracks or thrusts in the division as shown here. And I am in a section that centers on understanding the biotic, abiotic uh, interface, interfacing materials with biological materials such as peptides and proteins and DNA 
uh, to achieve really value added materials, something that the, the combined material cannot do that the two individual materials can't do alone. So um, following on Rafa's comments about uh, the, the inception of the BRAIN initiative, uh, he's very much correct in terms of where does nano fit in neuro? And we began thinking about this in, in our laboratory uh, in about probably when, when the when the initiative came into existence in the, in the 2013 timeframe, because the conversation uh, started right right up front with, do we have the right tools or do we have the best tools and to to address the issue of not only imaging and recording neuronal activity, but perhaps even controlling neuronal activity. And so there was open debate and open, open, lively discussion that, you know, what can what functionalities can nanomaterials bring uh, to this problem of understanding uh, brain function? And so, uh, again, in sense of scale in terms of materials, whether they're quantum dots or gold nanoparticles or liposomes, what have you, nanoparticles, particularly on the size regime of, of five to 20 nanometers are ideal because not only do they have a large surface area that you can display materials on, uh, you can attach things to the surface. Uh, and you're gonna see multiple examples of the systems that we have designed that takes advantage of that. And one of the driving features there is multivalent display, the ability to array around a particle, multiple copies of biologicals. And when you do that, you oftentimes enhance the activity of the attached biological. And for eventual uh, use in the body in vivo uh, applications, these materials can, can clear the body uh, in respect. So an example I'll show you is, uh, this is an example of a quantum dot based uh, voltage sensor uh, that here it's shown attached. This is a high resolution TEM where it's attached to the plasma membrane. And this, this particle changes its luminescence uh, in response to changing uh, electric field. So a very general brief outline. I'm gonna start with uh, some, uh, a very brief discussion on physical chemical properties of nanoparticles that we are interested in taking advantage of. Some very early work in terms of bioconjugation and how we interface them with cells and then how that got us into <clears throat> developing. I'll show you two examples of a voltage sensor that's, that's based on a quantum dot and a voltage actuator where we use gold nanoparticles to actually induce and control uh, electrical potential, membrane potential in neurons. So from the perspective of quantum dots, um, many of you may be familiar about their optical properties. You can control their emission uh, based on the size in which you synthesize them. They cover a broad range of the visible spectrum. Um, out into, uh, into the even the near IR. Because they have very large uh, absorptions in the, into the UV, you can excite multiple populations of, of uh, the quantum dot materials with a single excitation that is far removed from their uh, emission. They have very, very narrow uh, emission spectra, which means you can use them combinatorially because spectrally they are easier to resolve relative, for example, to uh, fluorescent proteins or organic dyes. They also have some very unique electronic properties that allows them to engage not only in uh, energy transfer or foster resonance energy transfer, but also electron transfer. Uh, and so we're gonna, I'll show you how we take advantage of that too. Also gold nanoparticles have uh, photothermal properties. Um, that is to say, you can, you can illuminate them with, a prop, with the appropriate wavelength of light and you can generate localized heating uh, around the surface of the particle. And so I'll show you an example of how we take advantage of that. So in all of these materials, what, what really drives what we do is our ability to control not only the nanoparticle size, but what is on the surface in terms of ligands that make the particles uh, biocompatible or stable in biological media. And so uh, much of that is driven by ligand technology, examples shown here where we have synthesized a whole library of the various uh, uh, multifunctional ligands that really consist of an anchoring domain, uh, really this, this dihydrolipoic acid, which, which binds very tightly to either the quantum dot surface or the surface of gold nanoparticles. We then have a hydrophilic segment typically based on PEG. This gives colloidal stability. And then these ligands terminate in various functionalities that that basically are handles that we can attach biologicals to. And so you can tune 
the surface of the nature of the particle. This is an example here where if you have a uh, predominant negatively charged surface character, you can drive and you can, you can move the materials through an electric field and get them to run in an in, uh, in electrophoresis experiment. You can do the opposite when you have a particle that is, uh, that is largely positively charged. Um, one, of the, one of the aspects in terms of bioconjugation that we take advantage of regularly is what's called polyhistidine uh, self-assembly, uh, metal affinity-based uh, self-assembly. And so what that, what that is based upon is peptides or proteins in which you have recombinantly expressed them to contain uh, uh, polyhistidine tracts, this, they bind very tightly to the, to the quantum dock surface. And so that allows you to self-assemble uh, multiple copies of peptides. And so here, what you see is an example where you increase and, and append increasing copies of, the, uh, of, of a cell uptake peptide. You see starting uh, along the top, you see as you add more and more numbers of copies to the particle, you drive increased uh, uptake into the cell. And so this is something that we take advantage of uh, very often. So what got us into thinking about uh, implementing and interfacing quantum dots um, with, uh, with neurons and doing neuronal-based experiments was really initially taking advantage of their, uh, of their optical properties and really their, their very large uh, two-photon absorption, which allows deeper tissue imaging. And so this is an example of our early work where the goal was to ask the question, you know, could we coat the, the patch pipette, the, electro, the, the electrophysiology pipette with quantum dots and use it as a visualization tool. So rather than doing an experiment where you're guided or you're visually guiding the, the pipette through tissue by expelling an organic dye, we took an approach where we just coated the, the surface of the pipette. What we were able to, to demonstrate is much deeper uh, tissue visualization down to, uh, in this particular study we did as deep as about 780 microns. So this, is, uh, this was work that we did in collaboration with uh, Janelia Farms and Tim Harris's group. I think Tim is on the call uh, actually as well. So this got us thinking about not only taking advantage of their optical properties, but also their electronic properties and being able to realize a, a, an optical voltage sensor. And so initially thinking about there's, re there's really two ways that you can, can approach this. You can either make a particle that, uh, that embeds itself uh, in the plasma membrane, a little bit difficult because this has to be hydrophobic. Uh, and then you're, you're asking it to kind of travel through aqueous environment uh, outside the cell and then kind of partition uh, to the hydrophobic environment of the, of the plasma membrane. So we took a different approach and created and realized a, a quantum dot peptide uh, electron acceptor hybrid conjugate that actually, so the hydrophilic quantum dot sits outside the, the exofacial leaflet of the membrane and this, this uh, peptide electron acceptor actually embeds into the membrane. So this, this, this construct engages in electron transfer. So schematically, it's kind of represented here. We have a quantum dot that we self-assemble uh, a, a peptide. The sequence is shown here, so it's very aliphatic, so it's, it wants to partition into the membrane. And then at the distal end is a C60 fullerene or buckyball. So this is a very good electron acceptor. And so this system is driven by the fact that uh, the, the, the photo-excited quantum dot is engaged in electron transfer with the fullerene. And so when the membrane potential is at rest, um, the system is designed that the quantum dot has its maximal fluorescence. So then under uh, conditions of depolarization where the charge, the charge differential reverses, the, the rate of electron transfer is actually enhanced to the, the buckyball. And when that happens, the quantum dot actually becomes dim. And so this is a reversible system that actually oscillates back and forth. And so you can see some uh, here where we start doing some uh, steady state photophysical experiments where we're characterizing the system. We start with a quantum dot and start adding increasing numbers of this peptide fullerene conjugate. And you can see we get concomitant quenching. And so we pick a system and a number of peptides. In this case, it turns out to be about 20. Uh, that we array on there. So that starts us out 
at a starting fluorescence intensity or, uh, of the quantum dot that's at about 75, 80%. And then that's where our sensing starts. So we, so we have a big, we've got a big, uh, a big delta to, to work with in terms of uh, delta F and, and change in fluorescence. And so uh, here's, ex here's an example of our initial characterization of this system in um, HeLa cells. Uh, we were depolarizing the cells with uh, with potassium chloride. So um, here you see the top the top at resting potentially you're, you're bright, and then we get uh, concomitant decrease uh, in the illumination. Uh, interesting to know that when you have the, uh, the the peptide closer to the closest to the quantum dot surface, that in turn turns out to be the most uh, the most efficient system. We've also demonstrated this in cortical neurons, and we get very uh, very large uh, delta F change in fluorescence on the order of about 20%, which compares very well to uh, some of the best uh, commercial standard uh, dyes, such as uh, such as uh, things like Flogol. Uh, indeed, these materials are very well uh, very well tolerated uh, uh, um, by uh, in cultured cells. The viability upwards of 90%. So we move this in then to uh, 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 in vivo systems where uh, they did a mouse uh, uh, cortical stimulation experiment, excuse me. And so that's what you're seeing here where we've injected uh, into the anesthetized mouse brain while it's on the microscope and visualizing it and then insert the electrode. And we are uh, injecting um, current in a profile that looks like this. And so what you see in this example is the area of, uh, of quantum dots that is most proximal uh, to the to the electrode, uh, when the current is injected, you see a very a very rapid and reversible uh, and reversible uh, change in fluorescence on the order of uh, of about of a two percent um, delta F, which relative to some some of the standard dyes used in this type of experiment is on the order of about twenty to forty fold greater in terms of its uh, delta F. So. Very, very uh, excited to see these results. We actually use this, uh, uh, use this, uh, this, this system, this sensor in, um, in collaboration with Mike Levin's group at Tufts, where he's uh, working on the developing uh, Xenopus embryo. And here, what he wanted to do was inject the sensor into both uh, both sides of the neural crest. The left side has been kind of made quiescent uh, with a drug, but what you're seeing is the the, the signaling and firing the neuronal activity uh, in the right hemisphere here. So we've actually moved these systems into in vivo systems uh, as visualization uh, tools. So in this last part, I'm going to switch over to not uh, the voltage imaging, but rather voltage um, actuation. So I mean, this is a system that is based on uh, um, spherical 20 nanometer gold nanoparticles. And the idea here is, uh, is to take advantage of the photothermal properties of the gold nanoparticle and to append the gold nanoparticle very close to the plasma membrane and then illuminate it. And that gives off just very localized heating that is then transduced into the plasma membrane. And that is enough to raise the temperature of the plasma membrane by about one to two degrees Celsius. And when that happens, that is sufficient to open um, ion channels uh, and, and mediate um, depolarization and, and, and actuate um, action potentials. One, one area of application here um, is to possibly restore vision in the, in the eye when you have damaged photoreceptors. Um, one um, area of application where, where this would be, would be uh, fruitful is to be able to implement and interface these materials with the retinal ganglion cells. So to be able to bypass the damaged um, signal transduction and to be able to, to stimulate these uh, uh, ganglion cells directly and, and generate a signal down through, uh, through the optic there. And so this takes advantage of, of, uh, of, the, of the photothermal properties of gold. This is currently being used uh, in cancer therapy where the idea is to, is to heat uh, gold nanoparticles in order to, to really um, um, you know, cook cells. Whereas here, the, the approach is, is much more, more elegant and be able to just uh, very, with very fine control, uh, illuminate and heat and just in, and induce 
um, action potentials. And so we started out in collaboration with the with the Benzania group at uh, the University of Chicago, and they approached us and wanted to take advantage of our ability to make these conjugates and really get the part get the gold particle as close to the plasma membrane as po as possible. And so we set out making uh, gold nanoparticle peg cholesterol conjugates. And so the results of that uh, that work here is shown here, where you see for each various uh, laser pulsing uh, power, you can see as you as you modulate and increase the laser pulse time, you can realize uh, increasing control over over the induction of action potentials. We then move this system a step further and actually ask the question: uh, If we have, uh, you know, can we really demonstrate the ability to modulate? Uh, the control of the of the induction of action potentials by controlling the distance uh, of the particle from the plasma membrane. So that's what we did here by by developing different length pegs. We can we can tether the the gold particle uh, over a five nanometer or six nanometer distance, and that does translate into control over uh, inf efficiency of induction of action potentials or depolarization. Here that that that's what I'm showing you here, where you have the particle tethered closest with a with a peg that's at 600 molecular weight, you get uh, more enhanced depolarization uh, of the membrane potential. So, uh, and again, these these materials are very well tolerated uh, in cells. Uh, minimal perturbation uh, on on cellular proliferation in in cultured cells. And so, I'm going to wrap up there and just. Uh, Give kudos to the folks who have worked on on these systems uh, and and also the sponsors. The main sponsor of all this work has been uh, the, our Institute for Nanoscience uh, at uh, NRL. Um, I'll leave my contact information here and because uh, I'll take any questions. And we also like to collaborate and share materials. And so I will uh, I will leave it uh, leave it there and answer questions. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, James, for this super interesting talk. Also, thank you for keeping the time, uh, well, <laughs> exactly, cover 30 minutes. So I don't see any questions from, from the audience, but I have a, a ton of questions myself. So, oh, look, there's one question here. So Arjun Barioke is asking, could you suggest ways to direct the particles to only one subset of neurons? That's a question that I also had. So, yeah, you know, and that's that is something that we think about uh, all the time, and and that is uh, so. You know, what you what you would think about are specific peptides or specific small molecule drugs or such. Uh, that you know, one thing that is uh, advantageous of particularly 10 nanometer, 20 nanometer gold nanoparticle or, uh, or quantum dot is you can make um, surfaces that are mixed in nature. Uh, you know, so that, by that, I mean, you can attach, you know, different numbers of different peptides. So if you're thinking about a peptide, perhaps to get this across the blood brain barrier, and then another peptide that would then subsequently direct it to a specific neuron that you're interested in targeting, um, that is that is something that uh, you know that is well within the capability of the of the nano community to do. So, and that's that's something that uh, the nano and neuro folks should really should really talk about uh, in terms of you know what would those what would those materials look like. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, for the audience, uh, if you want to ask questions, you have the Q and A option below there. So please use that option instead of the chat if you can. So I have one question from Javier Alfaro and then I give the, the mic to Chris Hsu, who's also raising his hand. So Javier Alfaro is asking, which is the biological mechanism involved in the photothermal activation of neurons by nanoparticles? Why the neuron fires when the nanoparticle temperature is increased? So what's the, the biological mechanism behind the effect? So the, 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 physical, uh, the, the physical mechanism underlying that is the, the heating that the heat that gets transferred from the particle into the membrane results in a capacitance change in the membrane. And so when the capacitance changes, you get a voltage change and that is enough to open uh, voltage or enough voltage gated sodium channels to then drive 
uh, the generation of, a, of an action potential. Okay. Yeah, I think that that answers the question very, very well. Uh, Chris, you had a question yourself? Uh, yes, uh, I just want to see is with uh, those uh, gold nanoparticle heating, uh, what kind of a spatial resolution you think you're achieving here? That how localized is that heat uh, activation? So, the, so the, it really, so the, it's a good question. And it's, it's, a hard, it's, it's a difficult one to, to kind of tease out. And that's something that we're kind of working on. So it, it really has to do with two, two parameters. What is the density of the particles that you have on the surface of the cell? And then what is the, what is the focal area of, of, the, of the laser pulse in, that you're using? So in, in those examples that I'm showing you, the, the area of illumination was only about, uh, if I can remember correctly, about three to five microns of the, of the surface of the cell. Now, I can't say specifically and tell you, you know, within that, within that five micron area, there were 200 gold particles or, or, or such. Um, that's something that would take a little bit more to, uh, to, to kind of tease out. But clearly what we do know is that for a given laser intensity or laser input, you can toggle the system and control the system by controlling the amount or how the, the concentration of particles that you have incubated the cells with to start. So there's clearly a concentration dependence in there. Good question. Okay, we have a couple more questions here. Jonathan, do you mind if I ask one and then I go right ahead? Your mic? Okay, so Sen Pen King is asking how much membrane potential change does the nanoparticle heating cause? So how much does the membrane potential change when, when the heating happens? So in the example, I won't reshare my screen, but in the example that we had that I showed you, uh, you know, you're getting a full you're getting a full action, you know, you're getting a full action potential from, you know, minus 30 millivolts or whatever the resting potential would be to, uh, you know, two plus 40 plus 50. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Jonathan, if you want to ask. Yeah, I, I wanted to, I, maybe I missed this in your talk, but um, have you considered using a two photon uh, heating of the gold instead of direct excitation. Yes, absolutely. Um, in, in, you know, in that instance, uh, relative to, you know, spherical uh, gold nanoparticles, their gold nano rods would be the ideal uh, materials to use in that instance, because they do have uh, a much, their the plasmonic absorption is there shifted into the, into the near IR. Or yes, um, you can also do even, with the spherical gold, um, which would normally be exciting with, uh, you know, a 530 nanometer laser, two photon, two photon would be ideal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a couple more minutes and a couple more questions. So Tian Tian is asking, sorry for the naive question. Uh, what is the advantage of using quantum particles for voltage imaging over genetically encoded voltage indicators? Thanks for the super interesting talk. It's a very good question, actually. Right, you're right. It is a good question. So, I mean, the I think all of these tools have their their appropriate context and use. Um, but from the standpoint of, of uh, uh, you know moving to in, in vivo, the one in, a, a very distinct advantage that that particle based uh, imaging has is the 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 lack of the need for it, it kind of relieves you of the need to have to genetically transform. Uh, or transfect or stably transfect uh, uh, transfect the cells, um, and you know these um, the particles can be excreted. Okay, they can be delivered. You know, kind of just think of them as a drug, if you will. Can be can be delivered, can be used, and then uh, and then be ex excreted uh, after the fact. So, okay, and we have one last question, and maybe. We will move to the next speaker. So Karen Dijon is asking, does the gold activation change refractory period for neurons? That's a that's an outstanding question, you know, and that is that is not um, I can't say specifically um, how it affects refractory period. What I can tell you is in the studies that we did with the Benzinia group is you can clearly 
on the same cell that's labeled, you can clearly in the same spot repetitively pulse and induce action potentials. Um, I I can't I can't speak to what the what the refractory you know how what the temporal resolution is and how and what the refractory but that that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. And as there are no more questions, let's try to keep the the meeting on time and move to our next speaker. Thank you very much James, you. for this amazing talk. And we'll see each other at the panel discussion where people actually will have uh, opportunities to ask many more questions to all of the speakers. So if you have questions, please save them for, our, for the panel discussion. So our next speaker is Jonathan Owen, and he will be speaking about imaging neural uh, neuronal membrane potentials with luminescent colloidal quantum dots. So, Jonathan, if you want, you can share your screen and yeah, the floor is yours. All right. You can see my slides now? Yeah, okay. Yes, everything's All right, fine. so um, I'm gonna tell you about our efforts to develop quantum dot uh, probes for measuring the action potential. Um, this is a collaboration between a couple of different groups here at Columbia. Um, and uh, before I launched into that, I wanted to give my own take on some of the advantages of quantum dots in, um, in, in, in this application. Um, and no doubt you've heard that quantum dots are these wonderful tunable emitters. Uh, it's possible to make samples with um, essentially perfect photoluminescence. And they have very, very narrow line widths. Um, they have uh, and also powerful um, absorptive properties. They're tremendous two photon absorbers and so on. And all of those aspects of quantum dot science make them useful in a variety of applications. Um, two of the most prominent ones uh, are lighting and displays, uh, and of course, two photon imaging in biology. Um, and so I wanted to just highlight those two things to kind of give you a flavor of some of those advantages. Uh, the first one is a shameless plug for my group's primary focus, which is the development of quantum dots for solid state lighting. Um, and um, this is to kind of help you see uh, just how uh, high performance these kinds of emitters can be. Um, solid state lighting based on light emitting diodes is uh, sweeping the globe. Roughly half of all lighting on planet Earth is now um, based on light emitting diodes and it's all dependent on this gallium nitride crystal, which emits blue light and photo excites uh, other emitters in the LED. And quantum dots are one of the possible emitters that you can put into a light emitting diode, um, and they allow you to tune the spectrum of the light bulb. And um, the, I think for the purposes of this talk, I'll say first that uh, you know, the amount of energy efficiency gain possible with lighting um, or with quantum dot enhanced lighting uh, is tremendous. Something like 5% of all power generated on planet Earth goes into light bulbs. Um, and quantum dots have demonstrated efficiency gains of 25% and uh, defined the uh, world record performance for, for light bulbs. Um, the, the primary challenge in this application is actually the photostability of the material. And so um, quantum dots that go into these kinds of devices um, typically are encased in a series of different layers of different materials. So um, this diagram here shows you a quantum dot microstructure you're going to see throughout the talk, actually. Um, and you can see a series of different semiconductors, cadmium sulfide, cadmium selenide, cadmium sulfide, zinc sulfide, and then this shell of a metal oxide here. Here's an electron microscope image of the quantum dot that functions in a light bulb. Uh, you can see most of it is actually the metal oxide shell, and very little of it is, is the emissive a quantum dot material, and that's required in order to make quantum dots stable uh, under these kinds of conditions. These kinds of conditions in this test device that uh, we developed with Osram, um, uh, the, the quantum dots are being irradiated with 10 to 40 watts per square centimeter uh, at 450 nanometers where they absorb strongly. So you're, you're taking a very potent absorber and irradiating it with tremendously high power light uh, and it is stable over um, hundreds or thousands of hours. Uh, and so this is, a, um, I would say, the state of the art uh, in terms of quantum dot performance in this particular kind of an application and hopefully gives you a sense of the robustness of this kind of a material. 
Um, the other application is in two photon uh, photoluminescence um, in biological imaging. And uh, there are many examples of this kind of thing in the literature, um, one of which is a, a collaboration um, with Rafael Eusta's group that was driven by Krishna Giant, who's now a professor at Purdue University. And Krishna and, uh, and a variety of other people made patch pipettes um, similar to the type that Delante showed earlier. Um, in this case, however, they were uh, making what they called nano sharps or nano pipettes that are on the order of 20 nanometers in diameter at the tip. So tiny, tiny little pipettes. Um, and quantum dots, strongly absorbing quantum dots made it possible to position those pipettes in such a way um, that they were able to patch a spine head. So they're directly patching uh, a small portion of the neuron, uh, something on the order of about a micron uh, in dimension and perform, we're able to perform voltage recordings because of this um, uh, two photon absorption assisted uh, positioning of this sort of pipette. Um, I will say also that during this collaboration, uh, I noticed that uh, Krishna was actually using a sample of quantum dots that was not very brightly photoluminescent compared to the, what we gave him at the outset. Uh, and from his perspective, the thing that really, uh, it, it didn't matter too much to him that the quantum yield was not optimum. Um, and I say this because uh, the real driving force behind that performance was the two photon absorption cross section. These are very, very strong absorbers. Uh, and that's what makes them so potent in this type of a, an experiment. Okay, so the main objective today is to talk about uh, voltage imaging. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not an expert uh, in voltage imaging, but I've attempted to curate a collection of somewhat recent results on various uh, uh, voltage sensors that are um, more commonly used than quantum dots, GCAMP, ArcLight, ASAP, and Quasar. Um, and you know, each of these different applications or each of these different approaches has various uh, pros and cons. Um, the primary con so far uh, in my mind are two, um, one of which is the uh, response time of these types of uh, voltage indicators has traditionally been uh, rather slow. Um, so uh, for example, a calcium sensor, there's a time constant for the release of calcium into the cell, the um, uh, capturing of calcium by the sensor and the, uh, uh, the result is a, a um, temporal resolution on the order of about 100 milliseconds. And so this is, uh, um, uh, although a very readily used and commonly used voltage indicator, um, it, it has troubles in this sense. Um, and many of the others, you know, there are serious problems with uh, long-term photostability. So these types of, of chromophores bleach relatively rapidly, uh, and it makes it possible to do short-term experiments, but um, getting to long-term uh, observation um, requires a much more stable chromophore. And that's a place where I think quantum dots have a, a very significant potential advantage. So um, just to give you a sense regarding the lifetime, here's an example of a uh, fluorescence quenching trace of a neuron that was um, patched uh, and labeled with this GCAMP. And you can see the calcium signal, the photoluminescence signal here plotted in red and the patch pipette uh, signal plotted uh, in black. And so while it's possible to see spiking events using this type of a, a indicator, one of the primary things missing from a lot of this uh, information is um, things like uh, pre-threshold or sub-threshold uh, membrane potential changes. Um, and so if it were possible to make a much more responsive and sensitive chromophore for this application, quite a bit of this other information would become uh, accessible. So colloidal quantum dots have, um, have uh, been uh, discussed, I would say, and, and demonstrated. Uh, as potential uh, probes for measuring the, the membrane potential. Um, and some of the application, uh, some of the opportunities in this, play, in this regard are described here, um, along with associated challenges that I'm gonna refer to for, through the remainder of my talk. This is somewhat of an outline uh, of what you're gonna see uh, next. Um, and so, you know, one of the things is that it's possible to tune the photoluminescence characteristics, the absorption characteristics, um, and the voltage sensitivity by adjusting the quantum dots microstructure. So using 
uh, synthetic chemistry, we can make higher performance materials uh, and increase the sensitivity. Um, and this also is a, a weakness for these materials because um, it turns out that any heterogeneity or a distribution in the structure creates heterogeneous luminescence characteristics. Um, and of course, this is problematic. You don't want your dye to be different in one region of the cell than in others. Um, <clears throat> quantum yields, of course, can be very high. Uh, the absorptive properties um, can be very strong. Um, but quantum yield is really sensitive to chemical structure. And you saw in that example material used in solid state lighting that there are a variety of these different shelling materials that are applied to the material to achieve the kind of high photoluminescence quantum yield and long-term stability. And those types of shells um, uh, limit the sorts of materials that can be used for membrane potential sensing. Um, and also the uh, environment of the quantum dot, the surface structure, it turns out, uh, tends to be very important for uh, quantum yield reliability. Um, another is embedding quantum dots in cell membranes um, and targeting membrane pr proteins. There are, of course, a variety of ways to deliver quantum dots to cells and to make them stick to particular cells or particular parts of a cell. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of research on this aspect of employing quantum dots in biology. Uh, uh, often, early on, it was to avoid nonspecific staining, and then, of course, to um, make the staining targeted. Um, and then finally, I'll say the resistance uh, to photobleaching. So um, quantum dots are uh, very stable, but they also do undergo photochemical degradation. And this causes something called photoluminous, photoluminescence intermittency or blinking. Um, and uh, those kinds of chemical changes are, I think, a very uh, significant problem uh, for this material system in this application. So um, <clears throat> there are a variety of discussions in the literature about the application of quantum dots for membrane potential sensing. Uh, a few of them are listed here on the left-hand uh, part of the slide. And the bottom line is that uh, if one can position a quantum dot within the membrane uh, of, of a, a neuron where the electric field drop uh, is the strongest, then it's possible to measure changes in the photoluminescence, uh, including things like the photoluminescence brightness, but also a shift in the luminescence uh, wavelength. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the great opportunity, of course, is to use this type of an application of quantum dots to do sub-micrometer uh, and sub-millisecond resolution measurements of action potentials um, and things like sub-threshold uh, behavior. So I've already mentioned, of course, the advantages, the two-photon absorption, of course, is very high. Um, uh, another very important characteristic is the very rapid luminescence uh, from these types of materials. For small quantum dots that might fit within a, a membrane, you're talking about 10 nanosecond uh, luminescence lifetimes. Um, and then the luminescence is quite sensitive uh, to electric fields, which we'll talk about. Uh, uh, finally, uh, for this type of an application, it's necessary to work with quantum dots that are very small. So the, the sorts of materials used in solid state lighting might be more like 10, 20, 30 nanometer structures. Um, but to, to sense the membrane potential uh, most directly, you're talking about working with, with particles on the order of five nanometers or less. And that does a lot to limit um, the types of materials that can be used uh, in this application. And it places severe constraints on um, things like the photoluminescence brightness and its sensitivity to the environment. So um, what is the sensing mechanism? So the, the, the tantalizing part here, piece here is that the direct luminescence, there, there's a correlation between the luminescence characteristics of the quantum dot and the membrane potential. There's no secondary sensing of ions, uh, you know, moving of large biomolecular pieces. We're talking about direct measurements of electric field um, using the quantum dot luminescence. And uh, the sort of simplistic picture of how this works is diagrammed here. When you photo excite one of these quantum dots um, or a small molecule dye, you have an excited electronic state or an excited electron, um, which is said to orbit a hole. This, this excited state is referred to as an exciton. Um, and that excited state undergoes polarization in an electric field. 
electric field separates the two charges from each other. And uh, this results in a variety of different changes, um, one of which is the energy of the luminescence uh, shifts. There's a stark effect on the photoluminescence energy. Um, and there's also uh, changes to the luminescence lifetime. Um, those changes are sensitive to two aspects uh, or a number of aspects of the, of the uh, experiment. One is the radius of the material. So the size of the quantum dot has a big impact. Um, the larger the quantum dot, the more sensitive. Um, and then secondly, uh, is the, this parameter here, the effective mass of the photo excited charges. You can think about this as a, um, a metric of the polarizability of the exciton. And then of course, there's this electric field term labeled F here. Um, and, and so you can see a strong dependence on both the electric field and on the size of the material. This has been known in the solid state physics community for quite some time and was demonstrated by Munji Bawendi in 1997. You can see this shift in the luminescence energy versus applied field uh, for a single quantum dot uh, illustrated here. So there is this very interesting quantum confined Stark effect um, that uh, we're going to try and leverage for this purpose. Now, um, the polarizability is one aspect of this problem that is material dependent in a way that it can be leveraged. Um, and I'll just say that there's a tremendous amount of work over the years um, tuning the characteristics of quantum dots by adjusting their microstructures. Uh, and uh, let's focus for a moment here on the right-hand side of this uh, picture. You can see this quantum dot I've diagrammed here. Uh, it's a series of different semiconductors layered on top of each other. Um, and it's designed, this particular quantum dot is designed um, to force the excited state to be localized in the center of the, the material to prevent it from interacting with its environment. Uh, and, and in so doing, you can raise the photoluminescence quantum yield. Okay, and so um, here is a radial distribution function of the excited hole and the excited electron. And you can see that they have some overlap and that overlap is very important to the luminescence, uh, to the, the radiative rate and brightness. Um, and it depends upon uh, the dimensions of the shells. So this cadmium sulfide shell wrapped around the cadmium selenide actually houses a portion of the photo excited electron. And as a result, the dimensions of the crystal will change the luminescence characteristics and it will change how polarizable uh, that excited state is. And so all of this work that's been done over the years, tuning quantum dot microstructure gives us a way to improve uh, the voltage sensitivity of quantum dots. <clears throat> So um, an example of this was demonstrated by Shimon Weiss's group. Uh, he made what's referred to as a type two a heterostructure using two different semiconductors attached to one another. Those semiconductors house different parts of the, uh, uh, the exciton um, and make this quantum dot more sensitive to uh, membrane potential um, or to applied electric fields, I should say. And they demonstrated delta F over F of 10 to 30%. Um, at 400 kilovolts per centimeter. Uh, we're more interested in, in electric fields on the order of 100 kilovolts per centimeter or less um, to give you a sense of the, the magnitude uh, we're after. Um, but a significant and important aspect of this study is the demonstration that different quantum dots in the sample showed different characteristics. So here's a series of different wavelength shifts recorded for individual particles. And you can see that uh, the purple and the green um, samples showed this kind of linear response at all applied fields, whereas the black and the red and the blue had a rough quadratic dependence. And so part of the heterogeneity that you're seeing here um, is a consequence of the fact that the sample is anisotropic, so there's an orientation dependence, um, but it is also uh, sensitive to the microstructure of the individual crystal being measured here. Um, and so the homogeneity of the synthesis of the quality of the crystalline sample um, is a very important metric to understand and, and to gain, a, gain control over to, to make a high quality material. All right, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the materials that we've been preparing. Uh, we've developed uh, synthetic chemistry of our own to control microstructure. I'm not gonna to get too into this, but um, this is something I poured a lot of time and energy into. Uh, we have fine control over microstructure on a variety of link scales uh, using 
uh, new synthesis reagents that my group has developed, and it allows us to produce um, a variety of different structures uh, that we've made and characterized in, in a series of publications here, um, uh, in part largely uh, for solid state lighting, but also for uh, mem membrane potential sensing. And uh, two aspects of quantum dot structure that we're very interested in for this application, um, one of which is uh, grading. So we make a heterostructure of cadmium selenide and cadmium sulfide, but it actually helps the photophysics um, if there's a little bit of alloying between the two substances that our synthesis mixture allows us to control. Um, and then the other is the development of this multi-shelled architecture versus a more traditional core shell type of an architecture. Um, this gives samples that have much higher photoluminescence quantum yields, um, and we thought could be useful for membrane potential sensing, um, in part because that multi-layered structure makes the exciton more polarizable. Um, so we did some uh, simple calculations on uh, what the excited states look like here in a traditional core shell quantum dot. You can see the excited electron and hole are localized toward the middle of the material, and then at 200 kilovolts per centimeter, you can see that the hole is slightly polarized um, to one side of the particle. In the spherical quantum well, this multi-layered architecture, the hole uh, is stuck in this red layer. Um, and you can see upon applying the same electric field that the, the, the hole becomes much more polarized to one side of the crystal. And that gives rise to a greater sensitivity um, to applied, uh, applied fields and, and potentially for membrane sensing. So we've um, made a variety of these types of structures and uh, we test them primarily using uh, um, a capacitor, sort of a test bed where we can put a thin film and then monitor the luminescence with a, a microscope. We use this uh, type of a thing so that we know the applied fields precisely. Um, and we can look at things like the, um, uh, the stark shift of the photoluminescence as well as the uh, quantum yield. Uh, you can see the luminescence peak of this core shell quantum dot quenching as you apply the, the, the field and also shifting to the right. So this is red shifting um, and quenching under an applied electric field. And the quantum well does something very similar, but uh, its changes are much more pronounced. And so this type of a microstructure change does give rise to um, greater performance uh, uh, in this capacitor device. We've, we've gone about tuning a variety of aspects of the nanostructure, one of which is actually just the total dimensions. Um, what we're changing here is a, a shell of cadmium sulfide in the outer part of this spherical quantum well. By increasing its thickness, um, one of the things that we can do is make the quantum dot brighter. Um, growing that thicker shell isolates the excited charges from the environment and increases the quantum yield. Um, and you can see very interesting changes here to the extent of the quenching. The y-axis is changing from left to right, but uh, the big and interesting thing here is that the smallest quantum dots with the thinnest shell show the greatest photoluminescence quenching. Um, and as you isolate the exciton from its environment and you encapsulate it in a thicker and thicker shell, uh, the quenching actually decreases. Now, um, this is a little counterintuitive uh, in light of what I told you earlier about the quantum confined Stark effect, which has a radius dependence that should make a larger quantum dot more sensitive to applied fields. Uh, and so the question is, why would a smaller quantum dot show this more pronounced quenching? How could we take advantage of this quenching uh, in a membrane potential uh, measurement? <clears throat> So um, I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, but I will say we have spent some time trying to stain neurons with quantum dots using a variety of different surface chemistries. Um, our objective is to put them within the membrane, uh, and doing so is a challenge because the quantum dots are uh, soluble in lipids, but they have to make their way through the, um, the, the medium uh, to the surface and then embed themselves. And so we've taken on, uh, we've done, we've taken a, several different approaches to this. The most useful has been the, the use of micelles um, and uh, things like lipofectamine that can help um, deliver quantum dots to that bilayer. Um, and we have seen staining that looks like uh, it may be associated with the membrane, but we have never seen a correlation between 
um, uh, potential changes uh, uh, in the neuron and, and the photoluminescence characteristics. So, so far we have not observed any kind of uh, membrane potential sensitivity, even with our most, our highest performing materials. So um, <clears throat> back to this question of uh, thin shell versus thick shell and the differences in the uh, voltage sensitivity. Here's a plot of the delta F over F that we see for these two types of quantum dots. Um, versus applied field. And you can see at 100 kilovolts per, per centimeter, uh, we're seeing delta F over F on the order of 20, um, which is a respectable number. That's a fairly sensitive type of a response. Um, it's smaller uh, in a thick shell material. Uh, um, and that is counter to what I said about the polarizability. Uh, the larger the quantum dot, the greater the uh, quantum confined Stark effect. And so the question is why? Um, and it's really because the photoluminescence quenching that you're seeing here is a product of, of the radiative and non-radiative uh, kinetics of the material. So the non-radiative processes in a small quantum dot also have a quantum confined Stark effect, uh, and you're changing that parameter much more substantially than you are uh, the radiative process. And so this quenching that you're seeing here is the turn on of other mechanisms that degrade the luminescence. So, um, there's the time here. So, uh, what's going on here? And so, just to, to, to sort of illustrate this problem to you, I've shown an electronic structure cartoon of a uh, quantum dot. These are cadmium and selenium orbitals combining to make the, uh, the wave functions of the material. Um, and so, the typical explanation of this type of an electronic structure is that those linear combinations give you homos and lumos um, that are diagrammed here as these um, black lines. Um, but it turns out that uh, the surface atoms on quantum dots make fewer bonds than the atoms in the interior. And this results in something called surface states. And those surface states, although they are not visible in absorption uh, environment, or at least they're very weak, weakly absorbing, um, they're very significant when it comes to photoluminescence characteristics. So uh, you can photo excite an electron across this gap here. Um, and that photo excited electron can undergo a trapping process or a photo excited hole can undergo a trapping process by localizing at the surface uh, of the quantum dot. And so that makes the photoluminescence quantum yield extraordinarily sensitive to the environment that the quantum dot is in uh, and the types of ligands that bind to it. And this is made uh, doubly challenging uh, because this sort of trapping process can give rise to something called photoluminescence intermittency or blinking. Um, and th this is a trace here of the photoluminescence coming from a single quantum dot recorded over, I guess, about 25 seconds here. And you can see there are regions of time where the luminescence is relatively stable um, and then it turns off. And then a short while later, you might get a little flicker out of the material. And then finally it turns on and then it turns off again. And so uh, this is visible when you look at individual uh, nanostructures. Um, of course, the sum of all of these luminescence events is what defines the quantum yield. It's the ratios of the um, on states and the off states, but also gray states. So states of the quantum dot that are not as emissive, they're not either on or off, but um, they have an intermediate uh, type of a luminescence. And this comes from a process uh, called Auger recombination. So uh, trapping at the surface can give rise to a, a new type of a electronic structure um, where you have an extra electron uh, in the, the quantum dot or an extra hole in the quantum dot. And this charged uh, quantum dot state um, does this other type of recombination called Auger recombination. And so the charging of the surface and the ionization of the quantum dot in its environment can create a whole host of different uh, recombination events. One can have positive trions, you can have negative trions, uh, and these charge states each have their own uh, luminescence characteristics. So here's another blinking trace um, illustrating that and a single excitonic state has a fairly bright and stable luminescence, but the negative trion and the positive trion uh, show other characteristics. So I mention this because, you know, each one of these states uh, has different radiative rates, 
um, and has different photoluminescence uh, quantum yields. And controlling that aspect of the nanostructure um, uh, is very, very, very difficult and something that is a longstanding problem uh, in this area. Uh, it is a very significant uh, limitation, I think, of this material uh, in this type of an application. Um, I should also say that these kinds of problems are more rampant in a small quantum dot. So you thicken the shell, you isolate the nanostructure, it's less likely to do this kind of thing. But at the size uh, needed for membrane potential embedding, or sorry, membrane embedding and, and voltage measurements, um, those are very significant challenges. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I guess my take home uh, message from this talk, uh, in addition to the fact that quantum dots are powerful and tunable structures, there are two very significant limitations, I think, that uh, require additional research. Uh, staining, selective staining of lipid bilayers um, and uh, you know, knowledge that the quantum dots have embedded uh, in, in where you want them. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's a, a real significant uh, hurdle for the community. And then the other, I think, is this photochemical instability um, and charge trapping that gives rise to photoluminescence intermittency. In principle, this could be leveraged. Um, in practice, this gives rise to heterogeneous characteristics that I think are uh, going to be very are going to prove difficult to control. All right, so um, <clears throat> I'll stop there and, and uh, say thanks to uh, uh, Krishna, Vidika, Jonathan, Leslie, and Ilan, all of whom worked on this uh, project, uh, which was funded by the MIRI um, and in collaboration with Rafa Yusti and Ken Shepard, um, uh, Darcy Paterka, and Oscar Sahin. So thanks very much. All right. Thank you very much for your talk. Before we start the Q&A, uh, our next speaker is not connected yet. So Chris, if you don't mind, could you talk next and... It's okay. Okay, thank you very much. All right, and with this we open... Oh yeah, he's, he's online, he's here. But I don't know why he's not connected as a panelist. He's connected as an attendee. So James, could you take care of this, please? Yes, okay. I will. Ah, okay, <laughs> really easy. Uh, okay, so with this, we open the, the q and I don't see any questions coming from the audience. So I do have one question. When you are talking about the surface states that you can create in, in your core shell quantum dots, it was not clear to me if at the end, the surface states help or, or if they go against the effect that we are yeah. <laughs> looking for. Well, uh, I have learned to talk about challenges as opportunities. Uh, <laughs> I would say that, um, you know, in principle, one could control the surface structure mm -hmm. uh, and dictate the type of quenching that's possible. And I think, um, you know, in so doing, you could design a, a uh, response to applied electric field that was optimized uh, for membrane, membrane potential sensing. Um, in practice, quantum dots are very complicated structures. They're made up of hundreds or thousands of inorganic atoms. Um, we're trying to control this internal microstructure, but there's also a surface structure. Uh, there's a facet structure. There's a ligand binding issue. Um, and it's very challenging to study those kinds of those parts of the uh, quantum dot structure. And this is what my group has worked on for more than 10 years now, and very little is known about the types of structures that cause these quenching events. Um, and it's difficult to do anything but shell them in other materials to sort of protect the, uh, isolate them with inside of a crystal. Um, mm -hmm. But doing that in a five nanometer or smaller quantum dot structure um, is, is, is quite difficult. And so, uh, you know, that type of structural control is something that could um, be empirically optimized or maybe designed uh, uh, to, to leverage for this, uh, but I think that's a really significant challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes. I see, I see. And Rafa has a question. Yeah, I have a question, uh, John, a wonderful talk. So why, um, is it known why the quantum dots are so effective with two photon uh, illumination? Or what is the, the, or give us an intuition of why that? I, it's mostly because of their physical size. You know, they're, they're large absorbers. 
and the absorption cross-section scales with the volume. Uh, and so, um, you know, you have more absorbing material and that makes them better at capturing two photons. That's the simplest explanation. So in that case, if you made it smaller and smaller, that you would pay a price with the two photon. No? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, you know, so uh, a five nanometer quantum dot might have a, you know, 2000 inorganic atoms that can contribute to the absorbance. Uh, you know, you look at a small molecule chromophore and you're talking about 10 to 20 or something, you know, so you're still talking, you still get orders of magnitude relative to um, small molecules. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, I, you know, the two photon absorptive properties, even of quantum dots appropriate for a membrane are going to be significant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a quick question, uh, another quick question I told if I may. Yeah, um, yeah. A, a, a John, does the heterogeneity that you showed us have to do also with the environment or do you think that's more or less shielded by the, uh, by the shells? Um, it's certainly very sensitive to the environment. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of the work on the surface chemistry, the ligation of the quantum dots um, has been about protecting the quantum dots from their environment, um, you know, and cellular environments contain a variety of different things that have a strong impact on luminescence characteristics, one of which is thiols. Thiols are uh, um, very redox active uh, that and cause chemical changes to the material that, that in fact quantum yield. So um, yeah, it's certainly the case that, that the surfaces are very sensitive to the chemistry of the environment. Thank you. Okay, so we have a couple more questions, but they're actually great questions for the panel discussion. So if you don't mind, uh, attendees, we'll keep those questions for the panel and we'll move to the, uh, our next speaker because we're running out of time and we don't want to introduce too big delays. So our next speaker is Eric Hossi, finally, <laughs> and he will be uh, the title of his talk will be Why Nanoscale Co-Organization of Glutamate Receptors is Essential to Understand Synaptic Physiology. So it sounds super bio to me. I'm a nano person, I'm a material science person, so I'll let you explain <laughs> the title yourself with your talk. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, 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 and we hear you well. And you can hear me well, so great. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation. As you said, it's right, I'm more neuro than nano. So I use nanotech, but uh, it's more to de decipher the physiology. I'm pretty happy this is my first time in New York, unfortunately, it's, uh, through Zoom. Uh, um, so, so the idea is uh, to explain you why we use a super resolution uh, technology to decipher how synapses are organized and to show you that in fact, we did a couple of mistakes on the concept of the synapse that we had till now. Um, do not hesitate if there is a, if you do not understand, I will try to speak as a normal physiologist and not too much complex things. So um, excitatory synapses, probably you know how it works when there is an action potential from the presynaptic synapse, there is a depolarization and you release a glutamate in the case of a glutamatergic synapses. Uh, so you convert uh, electrical signal to chemical signal. And in front of that, you have ion channel, which are um, ionotropic uh, uh, receptor, which catch the glutamate and transform the, the, the chemical signal to electrical signal, creating this small depolarization that you can observe here, which is a synaptic transmission. And at, at the end, everything are summed in terms of time and space to deliver another proper uh, signal. And so there is three main glutamate receptor at the post-synapse. Two are ionotropic receptors, the AMPA receptor and the NMDA receptor. So the AMPA receptor are responsible of the fast synaptic transmission and NMDA from slow and more uh, calcium permeable synaptic transmission implicated in the plasticity. And so the plasticity is a way that we can imagine the memory and learning. So you change the synapse strength. And there is another one, which is a metabotropic receptor, MGLUR, which is a G-coupled uh, signaling protein. So you catch and you activate some signaling pathway. And so, as you can see, the organization of the spine, even if it's one micron size, so this is why we, we use nanotech, it's because the size of the spine is pretty small. 
um, this is one micron and there is a thousand of different protein all interacting with a different kion and k off to at the end uh, are responsible of the efficiency and reproducibility of the synaptic transmission and the role of the main part of this protein is to organize the NMDA receptor, the AMPA receptor, and the MGLUAR receptor at a certain position re uh, regarding the uh, release site. And so for a while, there was a, a bit misunderstanding because what people consider is when you release glutamate here, you are going to saturate the entire postsynaptic density with glutamate. And so in this case, the amplitude that you can measure was just based on the number of release glutamate and the number of AMPA receptors that you have in front of that. And there is a gorgeous work from a Richard Tien lab um, in 1999, where we demonstrate that it was not right. What he did, it, he measured the variability of the current at a single synapses at the single synapse here. So it's the same synapse is that it stimulates multiple times. And he observes this type of current. So the amplitude is around 20 pico amp of uh, current. And after he come with a pipette and he puff with ionophoresis glutamate at the single synapse, the same synapse. And what he observed is he can reach a current of 80 pico amp at this proper synapse. So of course he repeated this many times, but the conclusion of this work was that in the average, you just activate 20% of AMPA receptor at the synapse. So it means that there is kind of an inefficiency of the spine when there is normal glutamate release. The explanation come a couple of years after when we had the first simulation of the gradient of glutamate uh, inside the spine. So here you have really the, the distance at the presynaptic site when there is a fusion of the vesicles. And after you see the concentration of glutamate, how it's uh, fade away pretty rapidly in function of the distance from that. So what we know is the synaptic cleft is 20 nanometers. So it means that at the post synapse, you already just have in the maximum two millimolar and 100 millimolar after you already reach 0 0.5, which is a, a k -ion for AMPA receptor. So it means that in an AMPA, if an AMPA receptor, which are responsible of the fast synaptic transmission, are more far than 100 nanometers from the release side, they are barely not activated. This means that the nanoscale organization of the receptor are crucial to understand synaptic transmission. And so this is why we start to use super resolution because when you release glutamate here, you are just able to activate AMPA receptor in a very small area, which uh, represents less than 10% of the entire spine um, because after they are too far and their properties are not able to be activated with glutamate. And so what we decided to use to uh, decipher this organization is to use electrophysiology to record the, the synaptic response, to use modeling because we cannot get access to the glutamate, uh, glutamate diffusion and other without modeling because this is thing that we cannot measure from now, and to use single molecule based super resolution microscopy. So we developed a couple of techniques as a UPAIN technique and we implement in the lab other as a distorm and the palm. I do not go too much in detail. Uh, uh, of this technique, probably you, you already uh, have knowledge on that. Uh, the main one that we are using are the distorm technique. And so what we tried is to combine these three types of uh, different approach to understand what the role of the nanoscale organization of the receptor. So just a brief introduction of the storm technique. We mainly use a distorm for direct storm technique. The idea of the single molecule uh, technology, it's when you have a single uh, fluorophore here, you cannot collect, of course, a single um, um, localization, but you have a diffracted signal. And if you look at in terms of intensity, this, this signal can after be uh, fitted by a Gaussian fit to come back to the original localization. Of course, uh, I do not say all the detail, but the amplitude, the intensity, the peaky, idea of this uh, will determine the accuracy. And the important point is to be sure to be in a single molecule condition. If you start to have two molecules blinking one close to the other, you are going to have a difficulty to properly fit the, the signal. And so the principle of the distorm technique is you label 
all your receptors. So you need to have really good antibody and to really well master how you um, coupled your primary with the uh, with the fluorophore. And after uh, many many times we use uh, Alexa six forty seven, you put in a certain condition all the uh, fluorophore in a triplet state, meaning it's a dark state. Uh, I will show you after just an image and, and a small movie. So you do not go through the normal uh, emission uh, photons that you can observe, but with a proper medium and high intensity of laser, you are able to put all the receptor, all the fluorophore in a dark state. So they do not emit, except some of them, which stochastically are going to emit and you feed this in here. So this is exactly the idea here. This is a neuron, which is uh, immunolabeled at the surface you will see with the, that the intensity is pretty low of the laser and at, at a certain point we push the intensity so all four four emit and after they go in a dark state and just some of them come back and this is why we have single molecule fluorescence and we can fit all of the signal to try to uh, reconstruct the localization at the nanoscale of the receptor. So we have a pointing accuracy, which is of around 10 nanometers in our condition. We can estimate the number of blink event per fluorophore. And so based on that, we have a relatively good ef uh, efficiency to determine the number of protein because when they are too close one to each other, we see a cluster and not an isolated protein. And so we can determine the number of protein per cluster. So when we start to look at the nanoscale organization of the AMPA receptor, so the re glutamate receptor responsible of the fast synaptic transmission, we observe this not homogeneous distribution with small subcluster here and in the average 20 to 25 on power receptor per nanodomain. So the vision that we had initially of a glutamate receptor was kind of wrong. There is not an homogeneous distribution, but more clustered uh, on power receptor in one to two small cluster, which are tightly organized. And so, of course, as I told you initially, um, what is important, it's the organization of this cluster regarding the release site. Because if you release at this position, you are not going to activate any receptor. So what you need is to know if the uh, glutamate release site here that you have at the presynapse is co-organized or not uh, with this um, cluster of AMPA receptor. So uh, there is a really nice paper from Thomas Blampier uh, in Nature in 2016, where they introduce the notion of transsynaptic colon. So they look at the protein ring here, which is organized uh, at the presynapse in front of the active zone, and PSD95, which is uh, one of the main orga organizers of AMPA receptor. And he observed this type of colon here, when there is a higher density of RIM in front of uh, um, PSD95. And so this is why he introduced this notion to say that probably there is a co-organization between AMPA receptor and PSD95 at the post-synapse with the presynaptic release site. And so in this case, we, it means that we are going to improve uh, the idea of the synaptic transmission because we will release glutamate directly in front of AMPA. So one of our question and to verify if it was right, it's what molecular mechanism are able to organize at nanoscale the glutamate release site with the nanodomain of AMPA receptor. And so we imagine um, that probably the uh, adhesion protein neurexin neuroligin, neurexin at the presynapse and neuroligin at the postsynapse could be the main uh, organizer of this uh, transsynaptic colon. And so what we did it's we make dual color super resolution. Um, so we use Alexa 647 and Alexa 532 with a, a more than one watt um, uh, power laser uh, to have storm in two color and to correct all the drift that we can have. And so we look at the co-organization between neural ligand and glutamate receptor here, uh, on power receptor. In purple here, you can see the nano domain of on power receptor. And so this is domain and this is single receptor and the pair of neural ligand. And when you do super resolution, so this is the scale, 500 nanometers. Uh, when we do uh, dual color super resolution, we see that almost every time when there is a cluster of AMPA receptor, we see some 
spot of neural hygiene. And when we do the quantification, this is what we observe. So this is Mender's coefficient. It means that zero, there is no co-localization. One, there is an 100% co-localization. And so sometimes you see that a part of the signal is out. So you, you, you are on this uh, scale. And so if we look at, at the nanoscale, the co-organization between the nanodomain of amparo receptor and Uraigin, we see that there is only 20% of the nanodomain which did not present any labeling of neural ID. So to see if it was important, what we did, we suppress acutely the binding site of neural ID to PSD95, which attach neural ID to, um, uh, to the scaffold, to the scaffolding protein, so to the organizer of uh, glutamate receptor. And in this condition, when we suppress uh, this co-organization, we see that we have a totally different vision. There is nano domain and there is barely uh, neural ligand at this domain. And when we make the quantification, we saw that more than 60% of nano domain does not present a co-organization with neural ligand. So we were able by playing with the molecular properties of neural ligand to split neural ligand to ampar receptor. And so we try to understand what could be the um, physiological effect of this splitting. And so we measure the current. So this is a single synapse current amplitude that we can observe with electrophysiology. And when we express the mutant of neural ligand, we see that this amplitude decreased drastically. It's 25% to 30% decrease of the amplitude of the current. And so the idea, um, Oh yeah, after we did it by, um, sorry. Um, the idea is really we are able to break the co-alignment between the pre-synapse and the post-synapse. So the paper is a bit more complex than that because we look at the pre-post organization. But the idea of this, it's really, we observe a shift uh, between the alignment with the presynaptic release site from, um, to the uh, nanodomain of ampar receptor. And so we use modeling to try to validate our hypothesis. So this is an M-cell model that we are doing with the Terence Sejnowski at the Salk Institute. So we mimic the spine. We have the organization of ampar receptor and we release glutamate either at the center of the nanodomain, what could be the physiological uh, role of neural ID to uh, align them. And after we shift from 50 nanomolars, et cetera, the localization of the release site. And we can measure in function of the number of glutamate vesicles, the amplitude of the, um, uh, the amplitude of the current that we observe. And so this is this graph, uh, when we shift it from 50, 100, 150, 200 in function of the concentration of glutamate. And what we observe is in fact, it dropped down pretty rapidly because if you release a normal, uh, value of glutamate, which is probably 2,000, you see that with a shift of 100 nanometers, you already lose 20% to 25% of the amplitude. And 100 nanometers, it's from the center to almost the edge of the nanodomain. So it means that this co-alignment seems pretty crucial to determine the activity of the Ampar receptor, and so the efficiency of synaptic transmission. This is not just a detail because neural ligand and neurexin are a model of autism. And so it means that when they are mutated, this is pathology, which are related to this misalignment between the different receptor. So what we observe, it's in fact, there is a co organization. So as I told you, only with super resolution uh, microscopy, we were able to determine that there is a co-organization between the pre-synapse and the ampar receptor nanodomain uh, based on uh, this assembly between neurexin and neuroligin molecular, uh, molecular assembly. And so after there was another question, as I told you, there is three types of glutamate receptor, ampar, NMDA, and the amblua, which are metabotopic one. And nobody had any idea of how they co-organize inside the synapse. So we improve even more the dual color super resolution and we try to understand how AMPA, NMDA and AMGLOA are co-organized inside the synapse. And so here in green, you have NMDA receptor and in red, you have AMPA receptor. And what you can observe, so this is uh, 300 nano, uh, 100 nanometers here. So this is around 300 nanometers. It's, there is AMPA receptor which surround a single cluster of uh, NMDA receptor. 
And if we make the distance, the centroid to centroid distance between these two clusters, we have this distribution of uh, between 80 to 100 nanometers center to center. So as I told you, the diffracted limit limit normally is 250. So it means that if you look at with classical microscopy, you just have a pure co-localization between them. We wanted to know uh, if, because we clearly see a single NMDA cluster, if between the other AMPA clusters, so one or two, there is a um, typical co-organization by putting one at, at the left and the other at the right or not. And in fact, there is a random distribution. If we align on the main cluster, the secondary here that we observe, we see that there is a random distribution all around the NMDA of AMPA uh, cluster. So NMDA are organized in a single cluster located at the center of the PSD and AMPA cluster are randomly spread around. This has been confirmed by electron microscopy. So we, we um, collaborate with uh, Shigeki Watanabe uh, in US and uh, he look at the co-organization between the vesicles of release and the AMPA and MD NMDA current. And what we observe is AMPA are more spread all around the PSD while an MDA receptor are unreached at the center of the PSD. So this is 3D reconstruction of the spine. And so it really confirm um, first this co-alignment between AMPA and uh, glutamate vesicule and the uh, central localization of an MDA. So after there is uh, what I told you about the MGLUAR. So MGLUAR metabotropic receptor for a while, people consider that they were probably over accumulated at the perisynapse. So perisynapse is not molecularly well defined, but they imagine that it could be something like this. And in fact, when we look at the distribution of MGLUAR, they do not form cluster, but isolated single uh, protein, which diffuse pretty rapidly because we are doing this in live. And we observe that there is a decrease of 50% of the density of MGLUAR around the AMPA receptor uh, enriched domain. So it means that they probably physically exclude out of the PSD. And if we look at the distance, so uh, our control is to calculate the distance between AMPA and AMPA when we label them with uh, uh, two antibody. So our best co-localization for uh, centroid to centroid uh, be, between a uh, cluster, it's 40 to 50 nanometers when we look at AMPA and AMPA. We saw that AMPA and MDA are more distributed between 80 to 100, and AMPA and MGLUAR is pretty far because there is a random distribution. And so we mimic this random and we clearly observe this distance. So after what we did, it's we extract the activation of AMPA receptor. I already uh, spoke about that previously, which are the miniature. We block AMPA receptor and we put glycine, which is an activator of NMDA receptor. So to observe this type of current, which are a bit weird. And when we block NMDA, we see that we have a, um, uh, no activity. And so we could extract the AMPA activation and the NMDA activation. And we did single channel analysis here. So we extract from the noise here the uh, uh, conductance of a single receptor. And when we divide it, uh, the amplitude current by this value, we can extract the number of receptors that we activate. So we previously did that in another paper for, for AMPA receptor. So we know that we activate between 15 to 20 AMPA receptor per miniature. But for an MDA, we did the same. And we saw that in the average, we activate between one to three receptor uh, per miniature release. And so this is why after we use modeling in collaboration with Terran Sejnowski, because MGLUAR, we cannot determine them because they are metabotropic receptors. So we cannot determine if these receptors are activated or not. So we create a, a 3D model where first you have the co-organization of the receptor uh, exactly as we can, as we determine by the, the, the super resolution technique. So you can see that here you have AMPA receptor here you have NMDA receptors, so they, they tend to have an affinity for uh, a central port. So we create all this interaction. And so I can just go a bit further. But you see that at the end, you have an equilibrium when you have a part of mobile AMPA receptor, some 
nano domain, which are randomly distributed around the NMDA reset, uh, NMDA cluster. And the, the small M that you can see diffusive everywhere are the diffusive uh, M glow R. And if we stop at each moment, we have the good quantity of NMDA receptor, the good quantity uh, amount of AMPA receptor, and the diffusive m -R. And after, we can mimic the release in front of NMDA or in front of AMPA receptor to determine their activation. And so we validate first uh, this model by looking at the number of AMPA receptor and NMDA receptor at the nanoscale, which are organized. After by calculating the distance between the two clusters, so between the centroid of NMDA and AMPA, you have here experimental data that I already presented previously with a peak at uh, 80 to 100. And this is a distance of simulated data. So we saw that they really correspond to the same um, number. We were able to release glutamate and to estimate the number of activated m -R. And so after we did a lot of other control to show that what we observe electrically and with a super resolution correspond exactly to what we observe with a model. And at this point, the model start to be predictive because we can determine in function of the affinity of the m -R, the number of receptors that we are able to activate per release. And so based on that, for the first time, we are able to estimate the activation of m -R receptor in a normal synaptic transmission. And as these receptors are implicated in memory, for example, we, for the first time, are able to estimate the, um, their activation uh, based on uh, classical synaptic activity. So uh, the take home message is that due to the non-saturating glutamate concentration, uh, receptor nanoscale organization tune synaptic transmission. And so based on that, we need to use the nanotech to try to decipher nanoscale organization of the receptor. And a modification of this nanoscale organization have really um, uh, important uh, effect on synaptic transmission because it's the cause of various pathology and more particularly to the neurodevelopmental pathology as uh, mental retardation or autism. We demonstrate that AMPA are aligned with the pre-synaptic release site, uh, mainly due to interaction between adhesion protein, neurexin, and neuroligin. And if you just disconnect a little bit this organization, you lose more than 30% of the amplitude of synaptic transmission. NMDA creates a unique central cluster surrounded by one to two cluster of AMPA receptor. And the role of the modeling uh, offer an interesting way to predict the non neonotropic receptor activation. And so now we continue to use this to understand uh, autism and uh, mental retardation. So uh, just to thank the people, uh, this is a various PhD uh, student and postdoc who are working on this project uh, with Daniel Choquet, with who I'm, I'm collaborating since a while, and Tom Bartol and Terence Sejnowski, the people who help us for the um, uh, modeling, and the group of Jean-Baptiste Sibarita and Florian Levé to develop all the super resolution technique and more particularly the analysis, uh, so to help us to, to solve this question. So thanks a lot. Okay. Am I, am I on time? Yes. Yeah, more or less, yes. So thank you very much, Eric. And actually, we already have one question. Uh, the question is coming from Victor Cornejo. And he's asking, great talk. Is there a possibility that these nanodomains, blue receptor plus ligand molecules, are organized before reaching synaptic sites, spines? Or the organization depends on the interaction with presynaptic signaling? So initially, there is an interaction. Yes, <laughs> people are not all perfect, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, no. It, it seems that there is an interaction through adhesion protein, and um, we had a paper previously on that. Uh, there is interaction between neurexin and neuroligin, and neuroligin recruit PSD ninety five, which after recruit uh, AMPA receptor, and so this is why there is this notion of uh, silent synapses. It means that you can create synapses which do not have uh, glutamate receptor initially. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so yeah, so between the chicken and the eggs, first there is interaction and after we organize the post synapse. Excellent. I have a super naive question. Looking at your super resolution uh, images, I wondered if you tried or you thought of doing a super resolution in three dimensions because I've seen some amazing results in some other conferences and so I don't know yes. if it's a play here. No, 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 we did. 
we did uh, uh, just by uh, um, uh, uh, the length. Uh, but so uh, the, the depth that we have um, in, in this condition is one micron. Uh, and so we lose a, a, a part. So, so the advantage of our technique for now, we are looking at membrane protein. And so we know that it's probably in 2D. Uh, so based on the orientation that we have, we know that we are looking from the top in 2D. And so we lose more photon when we, um, when we do um, um, three, three D. So for now we prefer to do, uh, and moreover the reconstruction um, of uh, two color. Now we have three color, the reconstruction of three color 3D image. Uh, it's pretty complicated to quantify. And what we want is to quantify this interaction. So it's, it's a bit more tricky, but yes, yes. Okay, excellent. Rafa. Um, Eric, uh, this is beautiful data. Um, is any of um, this data demonstrates that this happens in vivo with the uh, nano columns or is all coming from in vitro preparations? So this is the same uh, we try to develop. So now we have the single color uh, in storm in slices works pretty well. So in vivo it's in acute slices um, or brain acute slices. Uh, for the first time we saw the nano domain. So the co-organization, we don't know what we know is the tools that we use to break the co-organization between the pre and the post works in vivo. So it means that if we express this mutant, the same that we express, we observe similar effects. So as we have the nano domain and we have the same effect of the mutant, we can probably imagine that it's going to work the same, but for now it has not been demonstrated clearly. And uh, related, can you see these uh, nano columns with electron microscopy? Is there any hint of that in the EM? No. Um, so because with electron microscopy, what people see is there is docked vesicule. So the round vesicle of glutamate everywhere kind of everywhere. But what it seems it in front of the neurectin and neuridine, you have calcium channel. And so you probably, this is probably, there is really a, a lot of debates, um, but probably you have vesicles everywhere, but the probability of release of vesicles are around the calcium channel because it's calcium dependent. And so you, you probably structured calcium channel in front of ampar receptor, but you have vesicles everywhere. All right, so since we don't have any more questions coming from the audience, we are running a bit out of time. So if you don't mind, we will move to Chris Hsu, our last speaker. And then if anybody has questions, uh, you can ask them in the, in the panel discussion. All right, I'm talking to the, to the attendees right now. So our last speaker of the session is Chris Hsu from Cornell University, and he will be well, you changed the, the title of the <laughs> of the yeah, talk, yeah. so I'll, <laughs> I'll change what I would say. So he will be talking about reaching the depth limit of three photon microscopy. So go ahead, Chris. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm mostly an optics person, not too much nano, but I use this new title. It's actually the question, how to reach the depth limit of three photon microscopy. Hopefully it can motivate and connect with people in the nano field. <clears throat> So again, brief motivation. If you look at C here, it's a mouse brain, sagittal plane, uh, about cubic centimeter. Just about 15 years ago, you can see this yellow box is all we can do, right? About maybe 500 microns deep and a few hundred microns across. That's about 15 years ago. And today with mostly two and three photon microscopy, we can actually reach a volume like this. This is a red box. Clearly we made a lot of progress in the last 15 years. But on the other hand, as you can see, even with today's best technology, we're still scratching the surface of a mouse brain, not to even say, think of a bigger brain like a monkey brain. We only go about a couple of millimeters deep. So it's really no brainer. Everybody wants to image a lot deeper than what we're doing. It turns out deeper is the hardest. It's scaled exponentially. Imaging bigger volume, imaging faster, scales linearly. So it's a much easier problem. So let's focus on imaging deep. The problem is really tissue scattering. It, I take out my cell phone, I put a uh, lens paper in the front. You can, see, you can see light, but you cannot see any high spatial resolution information. And just my office, you can clearly see the window corresponding to this big blob of light. Again, scattering destroys high spatial resolution information. And look at the mouse brain and the cranial window. You really have to think about looking through a piece of tofu or cheese. It's hard to imagine seeing a single cell 
you want to see subcellular structure at a micrometer resolution and let's say a millimeter thick tofu uh, uh, cheese. And the technology we, technology we use is called multi-photon microscopy invented at Cornell in 1990. It's still the best technology for, good to, uh, for fluorescence imaging going deep in the brain. And the reason is very simple. Here's a fluorescing solution, transparent, no scattering. You can clearly see the difference between one photon excitation and two photon excitation. One photon excitation shows a very nice double cone structure for the excitation profile. In addition to the focal plane, lots of fluorescence above and below. For two photon excitation, we can probably have seen this before, only the focus is bright. Now, imaging deep in scattering tissue actually is a very simple problem. As long as you can, you can form a sharp focusing 3D like this. You can do X, Y, Z scan. You, your time is your space, so you can go as deep as you want, as long as you have a sharp focus. So it's worth emphasizing, high resolution optical imaging is possible as long as a sharp focus could be, could be formed. So it's a very simple problem. So what is the depth limit of two photon imaging? Again, tissue scattering. Let's look at the cartoon over here, I'm mimicking a brain tissue. You want to focus to a one micrometer spot size, the focal uh, diffraction limited focus. Let's say you want to go a millimeter deep, about thousand to one ratio. Every time a photon hits a scatterer in the brain, it will deviate just so slightly from its ballistic trajectory. Now, since they're shooting a very small target over vast distance, if you, if you scale this, this is like a sniper shooting a person from 1,000 meters away. If your bullet hits anything between, your chance of hitting this small target is essentially zero. And that means that the signal or the photon arriving at the focus goes down exponentially as a function of imaging depth. That's why imaging deep is really hard. It scales exponentially. Now I want to keep the intensity at the focus the same to maintain signal strength, which you must do is to scale up the intensity at the brain surface. You have to increase the power exponentially. Now at the very deep, you can clearly see the problem because as this gets weaker and weaker, you have to increase more and more power. That means even though you're not focusing at the sample focus, but eventually here, the power is so high, you still generate lots of out of focus fluorescence. So this is like a hand waving cartoon explanation. We can also do experiment. This is a photo from Jason Kerr's lab. You can see that as you go deep in a scattering bead sample, we just pour some bead into the fluorescing solution. You can clearly see here is a focus, a little dot, right? away from the focus. You can see a lot of out of focus background generation as you go deep enough into the tissue. So how to form a sharp focus then in a scattering tissue? For the last 10 to 15 years, we are focusing on one thing, using long wavelength to make this exponential decay as slow as possible. That allows you to go deep. And we're also focusing on three photon excitation to form a much sharper focus than two photon allows you to do. This idea of long wavelength, when we looked into this at the time about 10 years ago, it's really a no brainer again. You look at the light in the mouse brain, it encounters absorption and scattering. As you go to longer wavelength, scattering clearly decreases. This is scattering coefficient. The lower the coefficient, the less the scattering. So long wavelength is definitely good to reduce tissue scattering. Now, long wavelength scares people at the time because long wavelength is much more absorbing by water, right? You can look at the water absorption at the long wavelength window. Short wavelength in the brain, blood absorption dominates. Long wavelength, water absorption dominates. Now this is log scale. That means as you go to longer and longer wavelength, water absorption really increases dramatically. In the brain, you're about 80% water. So that scares a lot of people. But if you look at the mathematics a little more carefully, you can see that the amount of excitation power reaching the focus goes down exponentially for scattering and for Beer's law absorption, right? By those two expo uh, exponents, you can define new length, we call EAL, effective attenuation length, which combines the effects of absorption and scattering. So clearly you can see that because of both exponentially decay, so that imaging depth to the first order just is proportional to EAL, effective absorption length. And the inverse of this, we plotted over here, called effective attenuation coefficient. 
the less the coefficient, the less attenuation, the longer the EAL, the deeper you can image. Now you can see the lowest value here is clearly observed at about 1300 nanometer and 1700 nanometer, much uh, longer, uh, lower coefficient than what you typically get in two photon microscopy over here, about 800 to 1000 nanometer. Again, hand waving argument, but works very well with experimental com confirmation, experimental data from many groups. And we can also confirm this water bump about 1450 does exist in the mouse brain. So long wavelength is optimization. It's a trade-off between tissue absorption and tissue scattering. So we can leverage the relative transparency window in the brain around 1300 and 1700 to allow us to go deep for imaging. So why do you go three photon instead of two photon? It's all about forming a sharp focus again. Again, one photon in a fluorescing solution, no scattering, two photon, all wonderful. Sharp focusing 3D, you can do XYZ scan to form a 3D imaging. But again, as we saw before, you pour some beads into this, two photon, lose it, its localization. In addition to the focus, there are lots of fluorescence above the focus. You can imagine if you scan, if you do XYZ scan on this profile, you get a very blurry image because the fluorescence is dominated by out of focus contribution over here. You can add a photon to it in the same environment, scattering bead environment. You can see a very nice dot. You do a three dimensional scan, you form a nice image. Just to show long wavelength enough is not enough. To do this, you can see two photon excitation of red beads, right? Bright red over here being addition. You can also see lots of background generation by two photon. So clearly the high order nonlinearity really suppresses this long range out of focus background generation. And we can do wonderful things. We showed a few years ago, you can image brain activity, for example, in the mouse hippocampus. We can watch mouse thinking very deeply penetrating through the cortical column, through the white matter and reaching the hippocampus in the mouse brain. And we can even image through the mouse skull. As you can see, we can watch this unthinned and intact mouse skull. And we can look at the neuron activity. The donuts are each uh, G-camp label neurons. You can look for neuronal activity through the unthinned intact skull. We can still achieve very good spatial resolution, uh, lateral resolution about one micron, axial resolution through the skull is about five micron certainly more than enough to resolve individual neurons. So we can do a lot of great things with long wavelength and three photon approach. Then the question is, what is the depth limit for three photon microscopy? We show we can go deeper than two photon. It's been confirmed by us and many other groups now in the last several years. But how deep can three photon go? Let's do a little bit of modeling following the work done first by Winfrey Dank in 2006. So let's model this background generation a little more carefully by looking to light propagation in a scattering tissue. So you can see here the focus, you have a focal spot, you have a sharp signal being addition away from the focus. You can see also background generation. And you can model this system in two photon excitation in the blue, three photon excitation in the red. And you can, if you want, you can do four photon excitation in the brown color over here. Now you can see why high order is better for two photon, right, or image about five attenuation length deep in the tissue, you can see the suppression of autofocus background by three photon excitation, really out of the magnitude over here. And you can plot this, here's your signal, right, here's your background, you can look at signal to background ratio. In this case, we plot three photon excitation for two different labeling density. One is 100% labeling. So it's as, as much labeling as you can, you can get. The other is about 2% labeling, which you call inhomogeneity factor of 50. It's inverse of that is 2% labeling density. Now as you label less, the background of course is less. So you have a little bit better SBR, right? And you can say that at about SBR equal to one, when the signal in the focus and the background out of focus is about the same. So SBR equal to one, is roughly your imaging depth limit because the image gets very blurry at that time. The contrast is very low. You can work out the details for two photon, for three photon, and for four photon excitation. For example, for mouse brain vasculature, if you label just a blood vessel, it's about two to 3% labeling density. You can see two photon can go maybe about a five, six scattering depth. 
and the three photon can go about 9.4, four photon can go beyond 10, right? That's the imaging depth we're talking about with the labeling density of blood vessels in the brain. So that's theory. We can do tests. Now, the easiest thing to test is we made a, a tissue phantom by, uh, by using fluorescent beads mixed with non-fluorescent beads in agarose gel. We can do two photon imaging of those beads. We can do three photon imaging of those beads. We can look at the signal on the bead and the background away from the beads. We can plot signal to background ratio of those bead solutions. And you can clearly see for two photon in the blue and three photon in the purple, right? The dots are experimental data. The lines are theoretical modeling we just did. And you can see the theory works very well over many orders of magnitude in terms of SBR values. And in addition to that, we can also confirm even the deepest imaging for three photon, we still achieve essentially diffraction limited point spread function. So you can see here is a bead. We do a point spread function, you know, the, the XZ plot over here. We look at the axial resolution. This is very superficial, less than one attenuation length at the very surface of the tissue phantom. You can see the resolution for the Z is about 1.6 microns for four and a half maximum. If you go to even ninth attenuation length deep, very deep in, in, the, in, the, in the scattering B sample, you can still see about the Z resolution, right? At the ninth scattering depth, you are about 2.1 micron Z resolution, still essentially fraction limited. The small degradation of the resolution actually is predicted by the theory also, as you go deep into scattering, the marginal rays in your focused cone is attenuated more severely than the sort of the, the, pref, the peripheral ray, the on-axis ray. And by doing this, you're reducing your effective uh, uh, numerical aperture. So the resolution is slightly degraded, but not by much. Now, these are the B sample. And you can also see, we can image actually way beyond the transport mean free path. In the field, most people think the transport mean free path, which is defined by the scattering length and the scattering and isotropy, right? Most people think that's the limit of high spatial resolution imaging. But clearly you can see with three, three photon technique, you can go beyond that. We have even at a 10.2 attenuation length, we essentially still achieve diffraction limited uh, resolution about a one micrometer resolution. So it's clear that three photon is capable of imaging beyond the common knowledge of a transforming free path. Now that's the bead. Now, why do we use the bead? Because the beads are about 1000 times brighter than typical in vivo labeling. The beads like equivalent speaking like a millimolar concentration when labeled the uh, brain tissue, typically you're at the micromolar concentration for for density. So here are the best data we can find for in vivo imaging in the brain. These are the Adi Pasha of Aziri's book from uh, Rockefeller. The deepest activity imaging he performed is about 1.3 millimeters deep with GCAMP label. And this is uh, imaging of a brain vasculature for my uh, former postdoc, Kerr Wong's group. He used uh, 1,700 nanometer three photon microscopy of quantum dots labeling the blood vessel. And he went about 2.1 millimeter deep in the mouse brain. And we can kind of repeat the same work from my own lab. We can also see just about two to 2.1 millimeter deep with quantum dot labeling using three photon microscopy at 1,700 nanometer. So what this shows you, it shows that the signal strength currently limits the three photon imaging depth. For the brain imaging activity wise, we go about five scattering depths deep. And for the brain vasculature, for the structural imaging, you can integrate longer. You can go maybe about six, maybe six and a half attenuation length. But the three photon imaging limit, for example, for imaging vasculature is about 9.4 effective attenuation length from the bead experiment we have done. And that means we can, we can potentially reach the depth of three to 3.5 millimeter deep for the brain vasculature imaging. So if you want to reach this limit, the only way to do is to improve signal strength. We're not limited by the fundamental reason for the background generation. We're more limited by the available signal strength. So how to improve signal strength? I'll talk to you a couple of ways we've been doing in the past. One is using a new laser that allows us to more efficiently use the excitation power. Another is we try to find um, large three photon cross sections, right? If you have a large cross section, you naturally have a brighter image. 
So we, I talk, I'll talk about a little bit about resonance enhanced three photon excitation. We also spend a little bit of time looking at animal models that, take, that can take infinite amount of laser power. If that's the case, we also solve the problem. Nothing to report yet, we're still looking on this, looking for this. So the goal is really simple. Is if I have a thousand times the signal as I typically get from my labeling strategy, I can reach the three photon limit in vivo in the mouse brain. And that means we can go about three to 3.5 millimeters deep. So the first idea is to more efficiently using the laser power, saving power by imaging the region of interest only. If neurons showing here in the green donuts are what you want to look at, you can clearly see neurons only occupy a few percent of the brain volume. So what you can do is using a laser where you only illuminate the neurons, the region of interest. So that's what I'll talk about next. It's called adaptive excitation source. Simple idea, typical laser, Moloch laser, periodic pulse train, laser scanning, you find a neuron, right? Now you can clearly see if a neuron is what you want to see, many of your laser pulses are landing away from the neuron. You're damaging the brain, wasting laser pulses, and no information from the neuron you want to look at. So the goal is to feedback using the structural information of the neuron and feedback into the laser. And we call this a adaptive excitation source. The laser adapts to the sample under study. And you, it shoots out a burst of laser pulses. And this laser burst is synchronized with, with the scanning system where it lands on the sample. It lands, only when you have a neuron, you can see you have a laser pulse, right? So the signal improvement, if you just look at a simple uh, graphics, it's very simple. The signal improvement is inversely proportional to the volume fraction of the region of interest. If neurons only occupy say 1% of your volume, you can improve the signal by hundred times without increasing the power to the brain or from the laser. Because you just concentrate your power only on the region of interest. And you must do this within the laser source. You cannot just gate the laser after the laser output. So <clears throat> that, this concept is quite simple. This is how you have a three photon laser before. It's called chirped pulse amplifier. And it's actually published in 1986 in an obscure journal called Optics uh, Communication and won a Nobel Prize just several years ago. You typically start with a high repetition rate C source, say 40 megahertz. Then divide the C down by integer numbers. So we divide, we pulse pick one out of 40, go to one megahertz, then I amplify it to much higher power to do imaging. Now that's what you have, a periodic pulse train. And when you land on the neuron, only one pulse is here. Most of the pulse is away from the neurons. Our idea is so simple. Instead of picking the pulse uniformly, we pick the pulse according to the information of the neuron. So instead of pick randomly, not uniformly from the, from the pulse train, all we did is we, we know where the neurons are by looking at a structure image, and then we just picked laser pulses where you need it, right? So we shoot a high repetition AC, we pick it down, then we amplify. I always get this question, why not simply just gate the laser output, right? I can go 40 megahertz, I amplify it to 40 watts, I pick it down to one watt, and then I can do uh, my imaging. Okay, that's what you do, you can see, simply picking the, uh, gate the laser after the output. Okay, what we do here, same seed, right? Same high repetition rate seed, but we pick before the amplifier, right? We reduce the power, then we amplify it up to one watt also. So in the end on the sample, they look identical. But if you look at the laser system you have, this is a much more expensive and a flaky amplifier than you could have with this little amplifier. And this pulse picker, I don't even know if it's available. It must be expensive and not as robust. In fact, you can scale it up you need about a 1,000 to 10,000 watts of pump power. By the way, this is not a typo, that's what I'll emphasize. You need a 1,000 to 10,000 watts of pump power to reach the three photon depth limit by using this simple gating technique. So clearly, these lasers are not available, even if you have the money you want to buy it. So that's how we implement it. It's always easier said than done. I'll skip the detail. One of the key things is to solve this gain transient problem. Now the lasers are on and off all the time, so every time you turn it on, turn it off, you have this gain transient, but that could be solved. It's just a proof of concept. I still think there are lots of room for future improvement. And with this type of laser, you can see we can do significant gain in terms of signal strength. This is three photon imaging, pretty deep, 
pretty big field of view at a very high frame rate because of signal strength we can get. Because it's a, it's a simple gating process within the laser cavity, you can see I can do it. I can compare with and without this technique. I can shoot the red, uh, a uniform pulse train, right? Conventional laser to do three photon imaging. That's the, that's a signal you get. I can turn on the burst mode called adaptive excitation, and that's a signal strength you can get. You can quantify the photon counts. You can see just by simply turning on this uh, uh, adaptive excitation scheme, I gain the signal strength by a factor of forty because my neurons only occupy a few percent of the volume of, 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 uh, of the brain. And you can look beyond the neuron, you can look for a blood vessel, for example, imaging quite deep in the hippocampus, about 1.1 millimeter deep. You can see that now we can image at such a depth with a, such a high frame rate because our photons are only illuminating the region of interest, which are those capillary blood vessels. And here we can quantify that the signal improvement is about a factor of 50 because blood vessels is only about 2% of the field of view. We can also try to explore conditions where you get a much bigger three photon cross section. Typically what you do for three photon excitation, you use three times the one photon absorption wavelength. For reflorescence, for example, you want to use 1300 nanometer divided by three is about what, 550, 560. And that allows you to do one photon, a three photon excitation of referral force such as Texas Red. But we can also explore a different way, the blue shifted three photon excitation to excite to the higher excited state. Now by doing so, you can see, for example, we can use 1300 nanometer to three photon excite molecules such as Texas Red. Now in this case, the two photon energy combined actually is very close to the lowest excited state of Texas Red. Now that's actually very useful because a little physics here, the three photon absorption cross section is proportional to the matrix elements, right, the dipole moments. And in addition, you can look at the denominator are those energy detuning factors. When the two photon energy is close to a real excited state, you can see this denominator could get much smaller and you get so-called the resonance enhancement of the three photon cross section. So you potentially could find large three photon cross section by doing this. And also because this wavelengths, normally you can do three photon excitation of green fluorophores such as GCAMP, that also allows you to excite multiple colors using a single excitation wavelength. And it works lucky for Texas Red, we do get about, as you can say, about 10X cross section enhancement by exciting Texas Red in the, in the 1300 nanometer window instead of the 1700 nanometer window. But the issue is that it's not universal. For the seven uh, four or fours we looked at, about half we got about 10x enhancement, and another half we didn't get much enhancement. I think we have some understanding of this. I will skip the details, but at least for about 50% of dyes we looked at, we did get this about auto magnitude enhancement in the three photon cross section. And that certainly allows you to do multicolor. For example, we can look at uh, Texas Red labeled the blood vessel and GCAMP labeled neurons at the same time. We can look at blood flow. We can also look at uh, neuronal activity at the same time. So just quickly summarize uh, what I've been talking about today. Long wavelength three photon microscopy, hope I, hope I can convince you that it can go much deeper than demonstrated so far. So far, what we have done is about 1.5 millimeters for activity recording and about two millimeters for structure imaging. Out of focus background does not limit long wave and three photon microscopy until at least three millimeters, three millimeters deep in the mouse brain. For example, if you want to image the vasculature. Improving the signal strength is essential for pushing the three photon depth limit. I'll show you two different ways of doing it. One is improving the efficiency of laser excitation by using adaptive excitation, changing the laser source, adapting it, to the sample in the study. And also looking into enhancing the three photon cross section as a freebie to allow multi-color three photon microscopy. But I think the room for enhancement beyond factor of 10 seem to be limited over here. To connect to the nano, I do feel like nano probes, for example, quantum dots, the deepest we have got so far is always quantum dots, could help us reaching the three photon imaging uh, depth limit. So with that, I want to thank you very much for listening.
All right, thank you very, very much. So now there's a little bit of time for questions. I don't know, Rafa, you do have a question. Uh, Chris, um, how about uh, adaptive optics? Would that help you for uh, deeper? Uh, <clears throat> yes, adaptive optics, uh, we have also explored three photon adaptive optics. You can gain a signal strength on the order of about five to 10 or for large, like a neuron structure. For smaller structure, you could get, potentially get a little more than factor of 10, but it's, it's probably around a 10-ish signal strength gain if you play with adaptive optics. Yes. So, so you say tenfold? Uh, 10 times, yes. So that's a gigantic eff um, effect. That should give you much deeper. Uh, yes. So uh, we need a factor of 1,000. That's really what you need because it, it's <laughs> exponential scaling. <laughs> it only goes about 2.3 uh, scattering length. You need a 1,000 times. That's why depth scaling is really difficult, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But with 1,000 times, I will be able to reach like three millimeter, 3.5 millimeter. Sure, but uh, there's no reason not to do adapt adaptive. Yeah, exactly. You do gain about a 10X, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a very stupid, naive question myself. So you talked all the time about, well, on units of scattering length. And for someone like me, who is a theorist, that's not a very common unit. So how deep can you can you go in, in millimeters? And yeah, micro so uh, <clears throat> currently the, the best technology is about 1.5 millimeter for activity and two millimeter for structure. Okay. It didn't want to take a couple of hundred microns at the most. But I think the limit, look at the bead imaging, right? We look at the fluorescent beads where they're so much brighter, signal is not a problem we should be able to go about three to 3.5 millimeter okay. in the mouse brain. So it's almost halfway through. Okay. All right. So let me check the Q&A. Is there any question from any other panelists maybe? Or otherwise maybe we can move to, to the panel discussion and, and the questions can be answered either by you, Chris, or, or any other person. Mm -hmm. Oh, there is one question for, for Chris actually. <laughs> So coming from Hakim Belmuadin, sorry if I didn't pronounce your last name well. So he says, or Chris Hsu, as regards the adaptive excitation source, will you not then be limited by the nonlinear damages? I don't know what the nonlinear damage um, is. <clears throat> yeah, this is the, see the adaptive excitation source, the pulse energy is the same as you do regular imaging. All we did is essentially rearranging the pulses in time. Right. If we say you have 80 megahertz laser, it's uniformly spaced, you scan that on the sample, right? So it doesn't matter if you have a neuron, you don't have a neuron, the pulse just lands on the sample uniformly. All we did is that we use the exact same pulse, same pulse energy, same average power. We just concentrate them on the neurons. When you don't have a neuron, the pulse is turned off. So in that case, you can see the nonlinear damage is the same and linear damage is also the same because the power is the same, pulse energy is also the same. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So now I do really think that we can move to, to the panel discussion. So yeah. what, all what of our that? speakers are here. So, so oh. maybe all, all the panelists can unmute their, uh, their phones. And, uh, and mm -hmm. there's actually, a, a, uh, we had a couple of questions that were made before. Uh, I told you one to read them because you postponed them for the panel. Yeah, absolutely. So the first one is actually directed more towards the quantum dot people, and is a, I mean, the classical question: What about the toxicity of the of the quantum dots? Like, can we do we know do we know enough about the toxicity of the quantum dots? Are they really toxic? Are they really non toxic? What do you have to to say about it? I think you should answer this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, the question comes up a lot because the, the workhorse material to date has been um, CAD selenide core, zinc sulfide shell uh, type materials. Um, so what I can say is, and it's a valid concern because the, particularly for in vivo use because long-term uh, persistence of cadmium in the body is, is clearly a toxicity issue. But I can tell you this from our, from our own personal experience and the, and the experience of what you see in the literature is um, it has been shown in a number of cases for same labeling type applications in, in cultured cells or in tissue 
um, relative to the same types of concentrations that you need to achieve adequate labeling with, for example, fluorescent dyes, you know, the impact uh, on, on toxicity and cellular proliferation is, is, is quite minimal and, and in fact, very comparable. Now, that being said, when we think about eventual things to move into the clinic and IND and FDA approval, um, clearly probably cadmium is a non-starter, but there are a number of materials, for example, indium phosphides that have very comparable photophysical properties. Um, and so a lot of the things that we learn in terms of biofunctionalization and interfacing them with cells and tissues can be kind of transferred over uh, to, to a non-cadmium platform. Okay. Nathan, maybe you want to add something? Um, well, uh, there was also uh -huh. the, uh, the follow-up question from Rana Fariad Ali, uh, which is related to the toxicity. It has to do with the uh, risk of ionic change um, with metal oxide coatings that are porous. I don't know if, uh, if that's a question. I mean, I guess I, you know, I'm not really an expert on the application of quantum dots in imaging per se, uh, but what I can, my impression of reading the literature on organic fluorophores and the voltage sensitive ones is that the link scale, the, the amount of time you can use them to do an imaging experiment is very short. And so when you ask about long-term toxicity issues or long-term chemical stability issues, you have to define the time scale. Uh, you know, are we trying to go from a few seconds or a minute of recording uh, to 10 minutes or an hour, or are we <laughs> talking weeks? You know, so, um, I suspect that some of these issues are meaningful, but that the time scales are much longer than, than, uh, than we're currently working to get to. Yeah, I think it depends also if you think of using this in humans, for example. I mean, one of the, as, as Jim pointed out, one of the advantage of nano tools, uh, both the nanoparticles and quantum dots, is that they don't require genetic engineering. So you can, in principle, uh, uh, put them to use in as, as th uh, human patients as therapies. No? So the toxicity, uh, we're really talking about two types of toxicity. One would be phototoxicity which is when you actually activate it by light. And the other one would be like long-term effects uh, uh, in the body, you know, uh, if you're going to have this thing floating around. In fact, uh, in terms of nanoparticles, uh, uh, someone mentioned to me that, uh, that probably our brains is, is full already of carbon nanoparticles because of the ink that we absorbed through our fingers when we were kids. <laughs> and, uh, you know, ink is uh, carbon nanoparticles too. So, uh, so they're probably non-toxic because we're all uh, loaded with them all over the place. No? <laughs> I don't know if you, if you guys have comments on that. <laughs> I mean, in terms of the brain, I mean, the only comment I would make in terms of, you know, do we already have nanoparticles? Yeah, we have, you know, we have misfolded proteins and all kinds of things that, you know, the glymphatic system, the job is to kind of, move this stuff out. So um, I think that's something that kind of gets lost or maybe that's something that people need to think more about is that, uh, you know, the, the brain has a mechanism for, for, for flushing, you know, you know, materials out of there. So. Um, so I, I have actually uh, one question that emerges from the talk of Jim, uh, Jonathan and Chris. Uh, uh, and maybe Eric can get brought into this. If you look objectively at uh, quantum dots as a method for imaging, it's so much better than all these or organic or genetic um, indicators that people are using. I mean, there are advantages, uh, different types of advantages to genetic indicators, but in terms of the brightness, uh, the optical properties, they're ideal. And for someone like Chris, he can really break through uh, and achieve all the depth um, resolution that is theoretically possible. No? But uh, when looking at the data that Jim and Jonathan showed today, it was like a bittersweet. No, Jim, you showed us data from Shannon in Vivo showing some uh, measurements of membrane potential with quantum dots, but, uh, but Jonathan couldn't um, achieve this with uh, neurons that were patched under a very controlled uh, experimental environment. So, so so how do we reconcile these things? Is it, uh, is it possible that um, the, the, the issue of targeting the quantum dot to the place where the electric field is 
uh, is going to be a, 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 a gigantic bottleneck. And if that is that going to be the the uh, a problem that will uh, derail this approach, or is that something that can be conquered? No? So this is an open question for for the for all of you. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't if you don't mind, I'll go first. So uh, you you have very pertinent issues. So from 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 my own perspective, the way I see, I think the two biggest challenges are. Uh, one, and this speaks to Jonathan's uh, approach and what he's trying to do is, um, and, and my slide kind of spoke to this, you either want to insert the particle directly into the membrane, which is a real challenge, or you kind of take an approach like, like we did where you have an electron transfer thing where, where the, the hydrophilic particle can sit outside the cell, but then be able to interrogate the, the electric field. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages, I think, to both of those approaches. But right now, the big challenge for direct membrane insertion is this kind of, how do I make a hydrophobic particle travel through aqueous environment and then kind of partition into hydrophobic? That's tough. Now, Shimon Weiss has kind of solved it to a certain extent with rods that are kind of hydrophobic in the middle, but then the ends are hydrophilic and they kind of insert and, 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 they, and they do work to an extent. So there's that. And then the other, the, the other big challenge, Ralph, and you and I have discussed this, is how do I specifically target my particle to a particular cell type or even a particular, you know, subcellular local localization when, once it's there? Now, that second issue is, I think, much more solvable and addressable because we have the capability to make particles with surfaces with various different yeah. biologicals and targeting type things. So um, that's all. I had a, a very related question, but maybe- uh, uh, Yeah, I can answer because in fact, I use quantum dot for why um, when we use super resolution. And uh, so for the toxicity, we can see that for uh, when, when you have neuron in culture, even for half an hour, not it seems that the uh, quantum dot die not affect the physiology of the neuron in EMC. It's pretty nice and there is no real problem. Uh, one of the problems of the quantum dot is its quality. It's too bright and too stable. When you want to do, for example, single particle density, you really need to have this blink effect that the palm, the U paint, or the other have. So uh, one of the problems with the quantum dot is really this. As they do not bleach, uh, you have to stay at single molecule level. And so you can have a global image uh, with better resolution that you can expect with classical uh, techniques. So uh, this is probably one of the problems. And the other one in neuron, it's still the same. Meaning when you look at the spine, uh, the synaptic cleft is 20 nanometers. And so sometimes you can expect that the imagine that the quantum dot cannot go too much inside without interfering with all the, the physiology of it. Mm -hmm. So for my imaging side, actually, I have a very simple request for the quantum dot people. Is that in the quantum dot is much brighter than say uh, dextran Texas red, we know that. But the compensating factor, unfortunately, is that the quantum dot solution is typically much uh, lower concentration because of bigger uh, quantum dots, I guess, right? So that actually takes away the brightness advantage by some, to some extent, right? Say the quantum dot is about, uh, say, uh, 100 times brighter, 1,000 times brighter, but its concentration is, say, uh, 100 times lower. The kind of way you label the blood vessel from just the blood vessel tracer, it becomes, uh, you know, the, the brightness is not as like 1,000 times bright. Does that make sense? So one of the things it's easy is if one can somehow make them more concentrated, Right, because we can only inject certain amount into the bloodstream without, you know, you can probably imagine about 10% of blood volume in the mouse, the most probably, right? So that means the labeling brightness, not as high as I was hoping, but it's definitely brighter, but not as bright as I was hoping It's compensated by the lower concentration. Yeah, I would say that it's, that's a relatively straightforward uh, issue to solve. I mean, that, that's my intuition about it. Um, you know, maybe there, it involves better, uh, passivation strategies to make the sample soluble in, in, in biological media. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can also impact the multi-photon absorption cross-sections by making more strongly absorbing structures mm -hmm. for you. And so, you know, um, I think buying a factor of 10, or if this concentration issue is a significant one, maybe we can get more than a factor of 10 and, and closer to a thousand or something like that, depending yeah, on the concentration definitely is a big issue here. Um, 
you know, I mean, I guess my my intuition about the um, the 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 use of quantum dot brightness as a metric um, for voltage imaging uh, is that there are all kinds of ways that the brightness are, is impacted. Uh, you know, there's non-specific staining issues. Mm -hmm. You label a sample. Um, you go and you look at the quantum dots. You don't know whether the quantum dots are embedded in the membrane or whether the fullerene is embedded in the bilayer. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then you're stuck deconvoluting the signal intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also all of the heterogeneity, uh, all of the heterogeneous luminescence mechanisms that I alluded to. Um, you know, deconvoluting uh, that heterogeneity to understand what the magnitude of the, the intensity change is and what it tells you. I think is a, a, a significant challenge. You know, an advantage to the volt to the genetically encoded dyes. Uh, naively, I would guess there is a lot less ambiguity about where those dyes are located. You know, and what their signal intensity means. Uh, Actually, uh, if I can jump in, um, the mechanisms of how they work, uh, no one studies them. I mean, they essentially it's a little bit like cowboy sign. You make a dye, a protein engineer makes it with all my respect and admiration for the work they stick it in a neuron they take a picture if uh, if that's uh, modulated by voltage you got a paper yeah. <laughs> and but to actually understand why that's modulated by voltage there's very very few papers that dig deeper and the exact localization of the of the dye uh, i mean i have some experience with organic dyes for example with second harmonic generation dyes which are also uh, uh, voltage uh, sensitive and uh, oh boy, it's it's not trivial because uh, it may depend on the uh, not just the exact uh, position of the dye with respect to the electric field, but sometimes the orientation. Uh, I think uh, Jonathan, some of the heterogeneity data you were showing for by Wendy uh, um, spoke, I think, to the possibility that the orientation can make a difference uh, in the response. So, so not all, not every uh, dye is going to be oriented exactly the same way. So you're going to have to actually measure that. No? But all, I mean, these are all huge, um, uh, or I would say huge. They're challenges. But uh, given that um, the potential of quantum dots, uh, I think if, if directed research was focused on solving them, the payoff would be gigantic. I mean, they could essentially revolutionize neuroscience. People would drop all the the optical tools uh, switch to quantum dots for imaging voltage, no? And uh, and I just don't see a, you can solve the targeting. Uh, I agree with uh, with Jim, the targeting is, is not a big problem. There's all this uh, uh, um, modular chemistry that you can do. Uh, you can genetically engineer cells to express a receptor and have uh, an outside particle have that binding. Um, Moiety, you know, so so that that doesn't scare me. But the I, I'm still uh, stuck on the on the negative result, Jonathan, that you had with the, or I guess that we had with the, with the patching of the uh, neurons label with quantum dots. Why weren't they voltage sensitive? No, why do you think it, it was? It's just the distance to the electric field. I don't have a good answer, but I can tell you that there are essentially uh, you know the results that Delante showed this afternoon with the fullerene conjugated samples are some of the more voltage responsive quantum dots in vivo or in cells that I, I have seen yeah. uh, so far. So there are very few demonstrations of this kind out there. Yeah. If uh, my my first intuition, uh, Jonathan, looking at, at the experiments and, and Rafa that you guys did together, um, my first inkling on why you didn't see voltage responsivity is my guess would be the quantum dot is not actually embedded in the membrane. Um, it is more likely um, on the exofacial, on the outside of the cell. I mean, one way you can address that um, is to do, you know, high resolution TEM, um, you know, prep samples, do thin slicing and see, uh, like the example that I showed, you can actually, it's, it's one of, to me, it's one of the only definitive ways to demonstrate where, where are the particles and how are they associated with the membrane. So, um, you know, that's something that you definitely want, want to, and you can even start doing that in, in liposomes. You don't have to do that uh, in, in cells, but, um, but Rafa, to your point about orientation and how orientation can affect things, whether it's a dye or a quantum dot, if you even look at the work that, that uh, Shimon Weiss did with rods, um, you know, he very clearly shows that the rod orients in all kinds of different ways, and it's only the ones that are in the right orientation 
that do what you want them to do. So I agree. That's still a, <clears throat> that is still a, a challenge to be, to be dealt with. Yeah. My, my point is that the, uh, these problems like orientation, uh, hasn't stopped, uh, people from using, let's say, uh, other, other dice before. So it's obviously a place that we should do science and figure this out and try to optimize it, but it's not a, a sort of showstopper. No, the, the, yeah. But in well, that sense, yeah. James, your, your results with the fullerenes impressed me quite profoundly. So let's say the quantum dot fullerene, because I mean, in my opinion, from a naive perspective, from a theorist that does uh, nanophotonics, let's say, uh, those systems solved pretty much all the problems. I mean, you overcame the problem of inserting the quantum dot in the membrane. Orientation is not an issue because it, the charge transfer is the one that induces the change in fluorescence. So the question is, what's the drawback in your in in your in your method? What's what's the con? So because that could be the what is the con? what is the con? Um, well, I mean, we're still we're still working on the system. What the, the con is, we have not demonstrated uh, yet uh, the ability to target it to you know. We showed mouse cortical experiments, but you know that was a craniotomy on an, an anesthetized mouse where we're just directly injecting the particles into the brain tissue so that's not how we're going to use these things in vivo probably you no know? um, so you know what we think about the big challenge for us is figuring out you know how to do you know injection into the bloodstream or is it a carotid injection and then how to get it cross blood brain barrier you know these particles have been shown across the blood brain barrier that's not a big uh, that's not, that's not the stopper. I think the, the thing, the workspace that I think in the place where there's a avail availability for big impact is, is targeting and demonstrating, uh, crossing blood brain barrier and then targeting to sure. specific targeted neurons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at least it feels like you're one step ahead in the, in the game, right? With, well, with thank you. I appreciate it. And I, you know, we started out, we started out with the approach of like, let's try to design a particle that can, that can go right into a membrane and just, mm -hmm. we kind of wore ourselves out a little bit now, but our, the quantum dot fullerene system is kind of the equivalent of the dye system that uh, Evan Miller has developed. Okay. Which is, a, which is also an electron transfer based mm -hmm. um, system. And you've got a, a hydrophilic dye, and then he's got a molecular wire to, uh, I believe it's an aniline that sits into the membrane, and it's electron transfer. It's, to me, that is probably the, the most advanced uh, organic dye uh, system that, I, that I've seen thus far. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that electron transfer is, is, the, is the only way to go, but it's, yeah. it, it seems to work. Yeah. Eric has been waiting. Just, just a brief yes. question. Uh, uh, would it help um, if the depolarization is more intense than minus 70 millivolts, the classical one, to, to see the effect of the quantum? Dot? Meaning, do you think that one reason why it's a bit difficult is because the range of depolarization is limited or not? <laughs> My point is easy. In fact, I come from plant physiology and they can be depolarized till minus 250. Could it be better to test on something which have such extreme depolarization to validate the system and then to improve or to stay on neuron which are depolarization, which is really millisecond time scale uh, from minus 70 to plus 40. And so in this case, it's more challenging to have the time resolution and moreover the limitation of the, of the depolarization than to work on another type of system even if at the end it should transfer to neuron. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think part of what your part of what your questions is is asking sensitivity. You know, sensitivity on a on a millivolt change scale. Yeah. I think that's okay. Um, I think the sensitivity is there. Um, one thing we are trying to work on right now is, and we haven't done it. We're, we're working on these is to is to do a combined, you know, quantum dot imaging combined with a patched cell. So you can actually step the voltage and, and record the change in the fluorescence and get a real, um, you know, delta F per change in, in millivolt. I mean, we've yep. shown yeah, stuff, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, because that, that, that kind of experiment will tell you, hey, can, are these things sensitive enough to see, you know, sub, sub threshold changes, you know, changes in, in potential that don't result in an action potential, but they're still important. Um, that's an experiment that needs to be done. That's also something that we're trying to do right now.
So far, we've shied away from model systems of that kind. I mean, maybe plant physiologists would like us to, to develop uh, quantum dots for their science, but you know, my, um, my intuition has been that each sample or cell type uh, is different. And so really what we care about is action potentials in neuronal tissue. Uh, and so we want to target those systems because they're all going to be different. Uh, so yeah, anyway, a good question nonetheless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we can uh, entertain questions from the audience. So anyone in the audience, if you want to send a question to the panel, uh, you're welcome to. In the meantime, yeah, I have another question for, for you all, very, very much related to what we have been talking for the last 10 minutes. So I read articles where they used up converting nanoparticles instead of quantum dots to, to measure action potentials. And I wanted to, to check with you if you have any experience or any opinions about these up converting nanoparticles as, as an alternative to quantum dots? Yeah, I mean, there have been significant advances in the, the synthesis and optimization of upconverting materials uh, recently. And, um, you know, I think that those are really exciting. The, 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 the amount of signal that you could imagine obtaining from samples like that, um, I think is greater than the traditional two photon excitation approaches. Um, I'm less familiar with their uh, utility for voltage imaging, per se. Um, often the luminescence is uh, slow. Um, and, you know, I don't know as much about the, the Stark effect uh, in that material system, but I, I think that it's definitely an, an exciting uh, material and one that is, deserves exploration in this context. Yeah, I do agree. Um, I have a, a question also, um, just one more on quantum dots actually on nanoparticles in general. So what is your intuition? It, so part of the problem with measuring membrane potential or changing the membrane potential is that it lives across a very narrow uh, space. No? And this is sort of the, the bi-length of the, of the electric field of the membrane, which I don't know if anyone has been able to measure this, but it's probably just a couple of nanometers, no? sort of estimated. So the question is, if you were to put a, a quantum dot on a particle on top, uh, would this electric field um, spread through the uh, shell or the outside? In other words, could even though you may not need to insert the nanoparticle in physically in the membrane or on top of the uh, or within the the bilength, but touch the bilength so that maybe it can it can sort of. Uh, uh, because it has uh, different electronic properties on the membrane, maybe it would be a, like a preferential um, spread of the electric field through that material. Mm -hmm. um, so what is your intuition that, and maybe uh, so Chris as a physicist, you may be able to uh, to give us some ideas of if that, that could, because if that were to, to happen, that would be a tremendous um, advantage you know, of, of using these type of nanoparticles because you can just essentially you only have to touch the electric field. You don't really have to be all inside it. You're thinking more like, almost like the nanoparticle focuses the electrical field into the particle. That's what you're thinking about. That's right, yeah. I think that I vaguely remember uh, by when they talking about this like a decade ago. I don't know if uh, um, mm. if anyone followed or has seen any, any effect like this with nanoparticles that you know of. Well, I think we tried and did not see an effect of this kind. <laughs> you no, but, know. but were you, were you yeah. sure that they were touching or were touching the, the violin? Maybe they were not. Maybe they were just two or three nanometers too far. No? Sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I think you know, Schnitzer talks about this in his review on this topic. And you know, I guess I, I can't recreate the arguments he made in that paper here, but I, I think it's his opinion. Um, that incorporation in the bilayer is essential. Uh, and, you know, the little bit I remember about this question, theoretical aspects of it um, indicate that the electric field drops off very quickly, you know, and so you, you can't, um, your chances of measuring go way down the instant you're not in that bilayer. 
so that that's yeah. but the question is whether if you put a, 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 a material that imagine you put a conductor a semiconductor touching electric field so electric field will spread through it rather than through the uh, through the membrane or or uh, if, if, it, if it's better conducting properties than the water for example um, I think that there is some effect, I, but I don't have the sense that the magnitude is very large. Yeah. That's my intuition, but it's not a very uh, good one. I think what <clears throat> I think what you're mentioning, Rafa, can actually work. Um, and like Jonathan said, the field drops off very quickly within a nanometer or two once you're outside the cell. But if you can get I had always thought about maybe a Janus type particle that was like half hydrophilic and half hydrophobic spherical. Okay. And maybe you could get, you know, so it's colloidally stable enough to go through solution, but then just enough of the hydrophobic part could kind of sit, you know, in and experience some of the electric field. It might sacrifice sensitivity, but I do think it could work. Mm -hmm. That's more of an engineering uh, task than I think anything else. I do agree. I think the, the problem or the reason why it, it doesn't work, because it should work. I mean, in, in well, I don't know. I mean, it comes to my, to my mind, the lighting wall effect. I don't know if you heard about it. But so if you put a high index electric in, in a static electric field, you will get increased electric fields around the dielectric. But in order uh, for that to happen, you do need some electric fields. And so if they decay so rapidly, exponentially, one nanometers, two nanometers, maybe what you just need is to put the particles right on top of the, of the membrane, which according to what we heard today is also difficult. But maybe doing this strategy that James is proposing of making half of the particle hydrophilic, the other half hydrophobic, maybe one could get something like that. But we have one last question, maybe we're running uh, out of time, so Marek, Marek uh, Resnak is asking a, a question. Uh, can one improve the start shift of quantum dots by combining them with, for example, plasmonic nanoparticles, which would increase the rate of radiative recombination rate? So yeah, combining quantum dots with plasmonic nanoparticles. I mean, from my side, I don't know if that would increase the Stark effect or not. I mean, that could potentially increase the the decay rate of the of the quantum dot. That I that I can see. Increasing the Stark effect is a different story. So I don't know. That's what I have to contribute to to this yeah, question. I think that's the right perspective. You know, increasing the rate of rate will increase the signal, um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, maybe it would make a greater proportion of the emissive states the the state that we care about, the, um, the neutral one as opposed to the charged one. Um, but as far as the Stark effect is concerned, I, I don't see exactly how that would happen. Yeah, me neither. Well, uh, uh, Jonathan, would it, wouldn't that be make the quantum dot more efficient? Uh, as so, uh, so you wouldn't win because you have stronger star effect, but, but because you just have more excitation. That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. You would, you in principle could obtain a more sensitive probe just because of the amount of signal that it would generate. And that could mean you could, uh, for deeper imaging, uh, you could reach uh, samples with much less power, which means you could go deeper. No? Absolutely. Yeah, you should also be, be careful with the quenching of the signal because plasmonic nanoparticles are very lossy, so they absorb a lot of light. And so if you put the, the meters too close to the plasmonic nanoparticle, instead of increasing the signal, meaning increasing the relative decay rate, you can increase the, the absorption rate. And so, I mean, it's a, it's a fine tuning thing, but it has been incredibly well studied over the last 15 years or something. So there is a lot of literature. That. Welcome back, everyone. Good afternoon uh, to the East Coast. Good evening, Europe. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, West Coast and uh, rest of the world, maybe. Uh, so we heard in the first session of the meeting um, uh, four exciting talks about uh, 
the use of optical methods, uh, and uh, we heard the great potential that nanoparticles and quantum dots have, uh, but also how uh, there's still uh, a, a long way until these things become mainstream in neuroscience, even though they have great potential. So now in this second session, we're going to focus on methods that are uh, perhaps much closer to, uh, to practice. Um, and these are electrical or magnetic uh, methods uh, coming from nanomaterials or for nano uh, electronics, microelectronics, uh, even no, magnetics. And our, uh, our first speaker is Tim Harris, uh, who is a senior fellow at uh, Janelia our research campus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And uh, I have the greatest admiration for his work, but I'm only going to say one thing about him is that he's one of at least three uh, um, speakers today that uh, came from Bell Labs, at and Bell Laboratories. Uh, and I know he wears this uh, 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 proudly, uh, this continuing the tradition of the great science that was carried on at Bell Labs. And, uh, and with that, uh, Tim, I led you off. You have 25 minutes and then we'll have five minutes for Q&A. Thank you, Rafa. I'm gonna start my big timer so I keep track of where I am. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about things that are nominally nano, but, I, but I, you can pick them up and carry them around. So um, they're, they're, they're at least tractably. Um, and I thought <clears throat> given a 25 minute talk, the best thing to do would be to go through what I think of as the entire trajectory, including all of my future work that I plan on what started out to be the NeuroPixels project. Um, and, you know, I don't know, it was at least 10 years ago or something that Rafa and many others started talking about brain activity maps. Um, and, and the question is, you know, I don't think we can get everything. And I've always wondered what is an adequate sample. And so the thing I'm most interested to hear back is, <clears throat> how close are we to an, ex an adequate sample with electrophysiology given the intrusiveness of inserting, you know, physical objects into the brain to record? My, my neuroscience friends seem to be less worried about this than me. So a little bit of history to start or, or in, in fact, current state of the art. So you want to do recording, you can do twisted wire tetrodes, and I am discouraged that they are still as common as they are. They've generated wonderful data, but they're phenomenally time consuming and they cause an immense amount of damage to the brain. Um, if you look at pictures that Nick Malocious has created of tetrodes going through brain tissue, you should be frightened. I just went to the NeuroNexus catalog and picked out the, the, the 2021 catalog and picked out where they are, which is the commercially available um, conventional probes. And um, they're still quite big by my standard. This is a 32, these are two 32 channel probes that I, that I took out of the catalog. Um, in order to, to get 32 sites and their wires up the shank, the, the probes are of the order of 145, 150 microns wide. Uh, in our experience, this creates serious problems for chronic stability. Um, and so the, an effort that I undertook not long after I got to Genelia was to see what we could do with available um, fabrication capability. And so a, a key issue is what is the lithography? How are you writing the lines? And what is the conductor pitch? Cause that tells you how many lines you can get on how big a shank. So the conductor pitch here is something like 4.5 microns per site. Um, the probes that I worked on and finished uh, something like five years ago now um, I've not had any activity, um, were made with the best available lithography that you can access if you're, an, if you're not a microelectronics company. And this is half micron lines and half micron spaces, one micron pitch versus 1.5, mic 4.5 micron pitch. And so we were able to make a 64 channel shank that, had, that was just over my 75 micron limit. Um, and you know, 32 micron or 32 channel shanks that are 50 microns wide. I'm told by the people who sell these, which is Cambridge Neurotech and DBC, the company that makes them, that they're still, you know, that they're selling them as fast as they can make them. And so it's still quite popular technology. Um, they're only 
16 microns thick, so they're more flexible than narrow pixels are. Um, and if you if you're satisfied with the 32 channels on a shank, they're they're also narrower. And I simply don't have a good feel for how important that is. There are other people who got stuck in the same place. Satiris Masmonitis at UCLA um, makes um, probes of similar technology, half micron uh, line width in gold, the same as we use. Um, his spacing is wider than I think is really optimum, um, but they're quite useful probes. I see um, papers published with them all the time. If you, he did a 1024 channel experiment, which is kind of a hero experiment. And the problem, the reason I show this picture is it illustrates the other half of the problem. It's just not sites per shank, but it's also how to get the wires out to, to the wall. And this is a system with you know, 1024 channels. Um, and you can see that it's really big um, and somewhat awkward. And I've not seen anybody try and do this and publish the data. I admire the, the capacity. The really important message on this slide is you can get these probes from Satiris at the cost of putting connectors on them. They're they're unfortunately not they don't they don't make flex they just they just wire bond them to a circuit board so they're they're not very good for chronic um, recording but they're quite good for acute recording and and they're really cheap and so I, I just put this up here because if you want to buy them you go to this website and you tell Satiris what you need and then he'll send it over for packaging and you pay the bill. So the other ones that I know of that are of this sort, and I put them up because they got stuck in the same place, 64 sites per shank, is uh, Michael Rukas at Caltech. And he, he went to this place in Grenoble, France. They have quite good technology, but it's still single layer metal for high resolution lithography. And so he did a little bit better than Satiris and I do. There's a third micron lines and spaces, but he's still making 64 four channel shanks. Um, at the most, and and the packaging was a bit more compact, but still big. I don't know if these are uh, if you can get these, or if they're accessible, if there's a way to buy them. I've not seen anybody publish papers using them, um, but I was unsatisfied with 64 channels per shank, and so I went looking for a way to to get around it, and we ended up here at Neuropixels. I'm not going to talk a lot about it um, because these have been commercially available for more than two years. Um, they, they are single shank probes. They have 960 sites, 384 channels. It is the, the integrated circuit here is a self-contained recording system. All the rest of this stuff does is supply power and, and send signals to the probe and, and signals back to the computer. It comes with a five meter cable. And this head stage is what, what does the um, digital multiplexing. There are four digital streams coming off the probe. There's a thing they call a serial deserializer chip on this that sends it out to the, the world. The flex is kind of big, but on the other hand, um, this has been a successful project by my definition um, that, that more than 6,000 of these probes have been delivered to more than 450 labs. They're sold at cost, 1,200 euros each. Support is nominally free, which means that I pay for some of it. And the community has been very generous in helping people get started. The only real complaints about support that we have is, is that we don't teach enough classes to beginners. The other reason I put up this slide, these are that the IMEC made this slide of who all's recorded them or ordered them. And it's a bit, it's probably a year out of date. In any event, what's really important for a multinational project like this, I'm gonna go back one slide because I forgot to say the people who really deserve the credit here are the people who wrote this check. This this cost $5.5 million in fabrication cost to IMEC and another several million for running the project and testing the probes. And so we are probably $10 million in to make these available to the world. And that sort of an international multi-site project is not possible without really great lawyers. And so this is Heidi Henning. She wrote this contract for the first project. They wore me out, I gave up. And she, and she hung in and Chris Heiberger, um, these are two people from HHMI headquarters. I don't think neuropistols would exist without them. So I, this is not a great picture, but I wanted to explain for those who are not familiar with, with integrated circuit technology, why this is so much higher capacity than what I can make. And so the lesson of this is there are six layers of metal, all written with nanometer resolution. And so you can read the slide, but the orange layer, this is, this is a different technology actually, the orange layer and the red layer are the in, are the output lines for the for the each of the sites. 
and the, and the, the lines are 130 nanometers wide and the space is 130 nanometers wide. And in a narrow pixels probe, there are three layers of this density. There are over a thousand lines rooting the signals um, up and down the shank. And so that's just completely outside the possibility of a university clean room to do it reliably. So um, that, that's sort of old news. The new news is that, and, and published in, in April in Science, is a, what we call NeuroPixels 2. From the very beginning, we wanted a four shank probe, um, but NeuroPixels 1 is kind of clunky for freely moving mice. And so we wanted to shrink it if we could. We were willing to give away some channels if we had to, but we didn't have to. On the other hand, you know, at the beginning, we needed another million euros, and I was always already far enough out on a limb. I thought, I got to prove that I'm not just um, spewing hot air in order to convince people that these sort of very high cost fabrication projects are worth the investment. And so NeuroPixels 2 production, we don't have these yet, I'll get them in a few months, look like this. This is a NeuroPixels 1 picture. So you can see that it's physically smaller at the, at the top end where the stiff part, um, and you can put more of them closer together. They're also lighter. And again, for funding, we put together a new consortium. The Welcome put up significant amounts of money. The, the, the Cavalier in Trondheim, uh, Nerf, Champalamode, and Janalia paid for the project. 1.75 million to IMEC for fabrication and then self-funding for, for the rest of the, of the work. At, at home, that quite a few of these have been produced already, about over a thousand now. They will produce about 1,500 of these before the, before the alpha prototypes are done. But, but the important thing is, is that they are much smaller. So here are, here's a, you know, a, a drawing of two probes. Two probes go into a single head stage. The head stage is half the area that the head stage of 1.0. And so Two probes, eight shanks, 10,240 sites. If you do mice, you can't fit them all in because it's 10 millimeters. Um, 768 channels weigh about 1.1 grams. And there are multiple examples of freely moving mice with two probes on them now. And so I think this is going to achieve what we set out to, which is give people the ability to record both laterally and in depth but it's still only 384 channels. Now that's a lot of channels uh, compared to where we were, but, but um, it's now disproportionate compared to the number of sites. So you have to decide how you're gonna program those sites. And so um, this was an idea that I think came from, from Carolina Lopez, our chief engineer at, at IMAC with her team. So we divided the world up into 48 channel groups and we lay them out like Sudoku. And so each of the 48 groups is repeated in groups of 384. So there are three and a third groups just like this on shank one and shank two and shank three and shank four. And the rules are you can only use one number each, you know, you can use a number only once. And so you can do this and 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 you can do this. So next time I teach a course, I just gave a talk at a Cold Spring Harbor meeting this week. I'm gonna bring you know, a really great bottle of wine and challenge the students to find every possible combination and also the disallowed combinations of what you can map. I haven't bothered to do that. But what me, most people do is really boring. They just record you know, this band, this band, this band, this band and work their way up to shank. And people do record the entire depth of the probe without moving the probe pretty handy. Data quality is excellent, just like you'd think. But another really important aspect of our change in design is here's a photograph of a NeuroPixels 1 shank. Um, and here's a photograph of a NeuroPixel 2 shank. This is a bit deceptive because the dark patches here are the sites and the bright things are just reflected metal. I put this drawing up so you know where the sites are. You can see that we decided to take away the sort of tetrodish pattern because it, from an information theory standpoint, it's better, but, but that's not your major driver. Of, of, I gather from the, the users that the major driver is the ability to correct for probe movement relative to the brain, or what people call drift. And so now instead of having uh, two, probe, two sites every 20 microns, we have two sites every 15 microns with only three micron gaps between probes or between sites. And, and so far, this has proven to be much easier to correct for motion. Um, there's a bit of a publication about this that I'll show you in a minute. 
Um, and and the, the last question that I'm trying to understand is how much leverage in terms of spike or unit resolution are you getting from putting these as close together as they can be laterally with our technology? Or should you just give up on that and put the, the, the second row all the way at this edge and increase the unit yield? And the, we're trying to quantify that. The answer is the redundancy is not as big as you'd like. And so we're getting probably only 20% of units better resolved because we have a second column of sites on the shank. So um, how to follow neurons across time. Again, this has been published, so I'm only going to mention it briefly. I'll note this is what the current generation probe looks like. We shrunk them in this generation by taking the capacitor and making it a layer on the silicon and getting rid of the bigger components here so we could skinny up the, the printed circuit board. So this is what you see. I mean, this is a really bad day in the lab, but you can see that when you start recording, there's slip between the probe and the, and the brain. And this is to be expected that these, these motions are of only of the order of 20 or 25 microns or so, but the probe is glued to the skull or the building and the mouse is glued to the microscope and the brain isn't glued to anything. And so, um, and so you, you know, this is not the least bit surprising. This is, this is a, a sort of worst case. And the question is, if you see this neuron, and then you see something that looks an awful lot like it 300 seconds later, how do you deal with that? And, and the answer is you try and correct the, the, the recording because it's coherent across linear space mostly. And so the corrected data looks about like this. And so you would argue, yeah, sure, that is absolutely the same neuron. Um, and so you need to do something like image alignment that's done in in, in vivo to photon. It, it's just, it's, it's a correlation experiment. This is this is a very active area of work among the people in the community and it's it's really important to the users. It is now it used to be an integral part of neural of, of, of a package called Kilosort written by Marius Pachatariu, but Marius took his um, uh, image alignment, if I can call it that algorithm out and made it a preprocessor. Um, and others are making a comparable preprocessor. So I'm hoping that in the very near term, by the time NeuroPixels 2 is available to everyone, this will be a really well-established, robust process to take a really big chunk out of the issues caused by drift. Um, so I want to mention just briefly that there are other versions that are unfortunately not available to everybody yet. So HHMI decided they wanted to do this for monkeys. And so they paid for a separate project to make a 45 millimeter version of NeuroPixels 1. You can see it's exactly the same thing. The only difference is it's got a really long shank. This was sponsored by Doris Stahl, Michael Shadlin, and Tieran Moore. And, and David is the VP of the science program. And, and my engineer, Wade's son, is responsible for every single one of these probes getting a dovetail and sharpened and off to their labs. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've done. And that is we've, we've generated just an absolute data analysis overload. And so this is a speculation I would appreciate feedback on. I'm guessing that neural pixels have created more data than all prior accumulated electrophysiology in history. Um, I don't know that that's true, but I, I'll bet it's true. If you have 500 labs, each generating you know, many megabytes per hour, per probe, many of them are using four probes. Um, you know, a typical session is 30 or 40 gigabytes of data. Uh, unfortunately, that's not information, that's, that's data. And so you have to extract from this meaning and that's that process. Most people do this by, by doing single unit resolved activity. I think it's increasingly clear to me that that's not the only way to go at this, but there are two core strategies. One is just threshold the data, find the spikes, fish out the waveforms and do principal components analysis on them. A, a, a package written here called JR Clust does that, Mountain Sword does that, there are others that do that. The alternative is to simply create a, a waveform library and match up, do a correlation-like matchup. Um, Kilosort does that, Spiking Circus does that, YAS does that more or less, um, the one from, from Liam's lab. It is much more tolerant of what are called collisions. If you get overlapped spikes, um, it, it's not as good at finding every spike. For some reason, you don't create a good template for every spike, and so you miss things. But, but this was the first place where image registration drift was first corrected. 
I think that's that's now available for everyone. So I'm interested to go back to see if you don't have a particular synchrony problem in your data, you know, are you better off doing thresholding than template matching? I don't think we know the answer to that yet. What we need is ground truth because we have no idea whether or not we've in fact extracted reliable single units. This is this is done. I have someone from Simons asking me, how many cells can you record at a time? And my answer is clearly, it depends on who's counting. And there's clearly no one good answer to that question. Our attempt to help answer that question is a project we call NeuroPixels UHD for ultra high density. This is in partnership with, with uh, UCL and the Allen Institute, and, and especially Nick Steinmetz, who's now at the University of Washington. So. Um, we made a probe that looks like this. It's eight by 48 sites. Each site is five microns square on six micron centers. The, the thing the other guys want to do with this is to recognize neuron type by, by discharge pattern. So this is some old data from Adam Camp's lab where you can see something of comparable dimension. They had more rows and fewer and or more columns and fewer rows than we've got from the NeuroSeeker project. Um, we had um, a really capable postdoc here, Susu Chen, generate a really big set of data from us all over the brain using these probes. The problem is they're eight by 48 of very small sites. And so the array is only um, 288 microns tall. So you don't get a lot of tissue for every position and you have to move it so far. We've got one with more sites coming we can program, but that's not available until next year. And so um, what we would like to understand is, can we create reference data, ground truth-like data by having far more redundancy for the, for, the, for the data? And the answer is maybe. So Susu generated all of these recordings for us. She said, Tim, it wasn't that many hours because I always had four probes in at a time. And so you can see what, what you know, an example of what happened to one mouse. Some of the systems don't have a lot of data. So you can see if you're recording the whole depth of the brain, this is a lot of recording sessions if you only get you know, a quarter of a millimeter per pop. Um, I wanted to show you what this data looks like because it's informative to what you would have gotten if you would have used a NeuroPixels probe. So here is the whole thing drawn to scale. So this is the discharge pattern you got uh, across this many sites. This is the, this is the entire array in, in, in UHD space. And, and then these pink squares are, you know, one example of where sites might have been if you were using a NeuroPixels 1.0 probe. So we blew up a little of that and here you can see the discharge. And here is, if you just average over each of these waveforms, this is what you would have seen on a NeuroPixels 1. So if you're lucky, um, you, do, you do find this neuron. It has a fairly small footprint. And the, the surprising thing that we see is more than half of the data you collect has a discharge pattern that looks like this. It would have looked like this on a NeuroPixels 1 probe, really quite, quite small pattern. Um, and so if you land in the right place, you see it. And if you land in the wrong place, you don't. And so here's an example of a really big discharge, all the way, the whole width of the probe, you know, several of rows of the, of the UHD. But if you subsample this as if it were a NeuroPixels 1 probe, 50% of the spikes were not detected by um, kilosort. And so uh, the, the important question to me is, how does that impact the science you were trying to do? Um, were you able to simply say, well, I saw half of the, the spikes and that's good enough to understand the, the correlation behavior or not? And then a second question, is there any analytical way to fix this? Can we redo the way kilosort is finding spikes in order to understand what we're seeing? So um, I'm going to finish up for three minutes here. And so this is the discouraging result of just one recording. We picked a place uh, in ALM that had really dense activity, 55 units in, in you know, 280 microns of shank. This is a lot, this is a lot of, of activity. Um, they, they had 137 of which 55 were scored as clear, clean singles. This is a manual curation step in addition to and our notion of match means that if, if we ask, okay, what would we have seen on NeuroPixels 1? The answer is we need 80% of the spikes have to be common between the two found units. So out of the 55 that we liked a lot in UHD, we only found 15 of those in the 1.0 data. Um, 
nearly 40% were lost due to failures to detect more than 20% of the spikes were missed. I mean, you can each, you know, apply your own filter to what you think missed means. 33% was we didn't, we didn't get it right. We either had a split or a merge or something. Um, and so the, the question then becomes how much better can analysis be to record, you know, to recover these guys? That's an objective. Um, and the second thing is, is what are all of these really small discharge units and should we care? Are they just small processes up against the probe? Um, they are a majority of the data that we're seeing. So I'm gonna end with what, what I'm doing at Hopkins. And this is, you know, what's wrong with NeuroPixels 2? And the answer is it's still too big on the outside. The base is still big to tacker, to stacker tile probes. If you wanna do a brain activity map you need a lot of shanks. You need to get them in without causing excess bleeding or unacceptable damage. I don't know how to define this, the second one. Um, something like 16 to 40 shanks, 400 channels per shank in a mouse. I, 10,000 to 20,000 recording channels simultaneously, I think is a useful objective. And this is what it's gonna look like. This is a project that's already been funded by the National Institutes of Health at a very generous level. We're gonna shrink the silicon another factor of four and increase the channel count by a factor of one and a half. So we're gonna make a probe that's something like this. And um, a, most of the head stage just goes away. And so this is a 2.0 probe. You can't buy them yet. This is what an NXT probe, which IMEC likes to call 3.0 will look like. 800 micron wide flex, um, 1.2 millimeter wide base, or, because that's the smallest they can handle in the fab, one eight pin interconnect and, and, you're, and you're done. Um, and so the question is, you know, should we make that or should we make this and four times that? So we have a 2,600 channel device with 600 channels on each of four shanks. The numbers, um, we're, this is why I put in for nano. So um, we're going from 130 nanometer aluminum, which 2.0 sort of pushed to the absolute limit to 110 nanometer copper in the middle. That's not a big change in thickness of, of, of the trace, but we can do several more layers of copper than we can do aluminum, probably 650 channel shank, something like that. The real change is in the CMOS. We're gonna use 55 or 22 nanometer copper CMOS 22 nanometer copper CMOS can be really expensive. A mask set, for those of you who know what that means, costs $1.75 million. You usually need two to do a project. Again, three X plus smaller reduced power. We're probably gonna bump on the base onto the shank because it's too expensive to make that all in 22 or 55 nanometer copper. Thing I think that will really help us is that, that we're gonna go to eight connector flex. You're not likely to be able to buy them before 2025. Um, I will come to you and ask, do you wanna buy the, the pilot ramp up probes because NIH cut our budget such that the free ramp up was no longer available. I'm gonna just go to the end and say, electronics is not the major driver in EFIS. It's background and we need to learn how to deal with it. I don't think we deal with it very well. There's lots of opportunity for recording capacity. The major challenges, in my opinion, remain data analysis. There's interest in electrical stimulation, especially in primate community, both humans and non-humans. If I don't get to answer your question, send me an email. Thank you very much. Uh, two minutes over, sorry, Rafa. No problem, <laughs> Tim. Thank you for this very uh, spectacular talk, I would say. <laughs> um, we can take questions from the audience. Um, uh, there is actually one question from Arjun Barioki. What is your intuition about how would these predictions from the UHD change with NeuroPixel 2.0? I don't think I understand the question. We get an yes, audio. I, um, yes, I think the um, uh, you were uh, comparing UHD with the NeuroPixels 2.0. Oh, uh, you're you're right. Yeah. You're right. The yeah. answer is not by very much because because we've only decreased the, 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 the sort of sampling space by about 30%. Um, the fill factor of the shank is 30% bigger for 2.0 than 1.0. And so it will, it will, the, the, the 2.0 layout is simply to give us a better chance of fixing drift. I don't think it's very much better for trying to understand what are all the small signals coming from? Should we care or should we ignore them? And how does that help us spike sort 
we have the data from 2.0. I just didn't have time to show it. Um, Tim, I have a question and maybe I can provide you with some feedback from someone like myself uh, uh, representing a field that does imaging where uh, we are in a way complementary technology where we can see everything that's in there, uh, but we cannot record from these uh, neurons structures with as fast uh, time resolution uh, and maybe signal to noise as you can with your electrode. So the question is, um, um, can you give us an intuition? If you have a volume um, and you have one of your shanks going through it, what percentage of the neurons are you picking up? And uh, my intuition is that this, uh, even the UHD uh, recordings were very sparse. I would have expected with your pitch in your probe that you would be uh, overloaded with all kinds of signals. Almost every electrode would pick up something, whether it's a neuron or a dendrite or an axon that's passing by. So, so I just don't understand how to um, uh, rationalize uh, or, or, or how to intuit your your results. If you yeah. imagine you had this movie of a square uh, yeah. cubic millimeter and you're going through it. Huh? Well, uh, three thoughts, Rafa. The answer is that mostly the brain is quiet. And so there's a lot of neurons, but they're not all firing apparently. Um, but the second thing is, is that I have long suspected that much of the signal that we see on, on, on EFIS probes is coming from processes, but I haven't yet thought how we uh, assign it and how to use it, um, that much of the signal does not look anything like what the models would tell you a soma discharge should look like. They're, they're too small, they're too local. Um, and so we don't understand. And very, very few of the, of the units that we find appear to be more than 40 microns away. And so, and so I guess the, the the, the, and then the, the last thing that I like to say is, is that if you look at a picture of brain tissue and then ask what happens when I stab it with a sword that's 70 microns wide and 23 microns thick, I think the answer is I don't really have intuition as to what I did about the activity I might have measured. We need to do photo, two photon imaging either in parallel or simultaneous or serially to see whether or not the activity that you see optically correlates with the activity that you see electrically or if somehow you've changed the, the density of activity. Um, but you're right, as we should see everything close and we don't see as much as you, as, as that my intuition told me I would. I completely agree with you about the, uh, maybe providing some ground truth with two photons so that simultaneously you can see uh, who you're recording from and who you're not recording from. Uh, that would be a, a wonderful experiment. Uh, yeah, uh, it's an experiment that needs to get done. We just haven't gotten to it yet. And I've always thought that 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 maybe I should just partner with Chris Zhu because um, silicon does not absorb 1.5 micron light. And so maybe three photon is is a less, mm -hmm. you know, get gigantic artifacts from a two photon beam because that's right at the silicon band edge. But three photon might make very small artifacts. And therefore it would, you, you don't need, you don't need, you know, high framing rates or anything. You just want to know who's close that's active. Exactly. I would strongly recommend that collaboration. And uh, you have also my support. Uh, if you want to have a go with uh, 2P, um, I, would, I would love to, uh, to try to help you uh, do that experiment. I think that's a critical experiment to, to, to see the power. Um, so Aitzol has a question. Aitzol, uh, do you want to go ahead? Yes. Am I unmuted? Let me... No, no, no you, you can. can you're you. fine. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I had the, the window, the window cover. So, Tim, since you're not staying for for the panel, I had one question for you that I was waiting uh, to ask you. Checking your publication record, I realized that uh, we come from very similar worlds, separated by some years. I, I gotta say, but you worked uh, quite extensively in near field microscopy in the nineties, right? I did, in fact. And, the, and also the in quantum near field level. came as a result of my insistence to Eric Bedzik and my postdoc, Jay Troutman. <laughs> well, the question is that, so back in the day, you used to be a nano person and now you're a neuro person. So how was, how was your path from nano to neuro and how you did it and if you have any advice for I people like I, me. I will, I've often thought I should give, you know, a wisdom talk called how to be successful without being able to keep your job. 
<laughs> How is that? How is that? Develop a little bit, please. Well, I think the answer is don't be afraid to ask dumb questions because <laughs> you know that if you switch fields, you're going to ask a lot of them. But it, you know that that it's possible to simply, if you think clearly and ask good questions, and you're not afraid of who gets the credit, then I think you can switch fields and be effective. All right. <laughs> I just want to say before I go to hello to Ziran Bao, who was my colleague at Bell Labs, one floor down. I have not seen her for more than 20 years. Wow. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, fantastic to see you again. Um, if I ever get to Stanford, I will stop and visit and catch up. I, I read your papers. We have not talked in a very long time. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so glad to see you. And I, I see the, the Bell Labs uh, principal in, uh, <laughs> asking critical questions and not afraid to ask them. Thank you again, Rafa. I'm going to have to leave you all. Thank all you, right. Tim, for your talk. With that, uh, we go to the next speaker, who's Ander Ramos uh, Murialdai. So he's uh, Basque, but he works uh, in Germany. In fact, he has two labs, one at the University of Tübingen, and the other one in the Basque country in Tegnalia. And uh, the reason he's been invited is because he actually works with humans. Uh, he's applying neurotechnology to humans, uh, brain computer interfaces. And uh, this is uh, at the end of the day, the reason we all, we all do what we do is to help uh, patients and help people. So uh, Ander, you have 25 minutes and uh, there will be five minutes for Q and A for you. Welcome. We can see your slide, but can you project the full screen? I think we, uh, if you could uh, just hit this button here. Uh, wait, I think we just lost under. <laughs> Sorry, right, no, no, so. I'm here, I'm here. Just like I could not share my screen. I mute myself at the same time somehow. Um, All right. I'm done now, so I'll do that again and I'll do, go for a full screen can you see it now uh yes you're good to go you're good to okay, go okay thank you very much uh well thank you very much first for inviting me um i feel myself like an outsider um and uh well rafa just introduced uh that i work in humans and i'm actually going to talk about that so i'm going to change gears a little bit uh, instead of talking about the technology and the and, and the hardware and, and mostly hardware and maybe software, I'm gonna talk about how to use that uh, in, in humans uh, for, clinical, for clinical use. I'm gonna to try to do that. All right, so just let me give a brief introduction about what I'm gonna call here neuro rehabilitation, which is uh, using the, the neuro technology to basically um, try to solve a, a clinical problem. And this has been used before in a, in a cognitive domain for depression, schizophrenia, dementia, for example, for the motor domain in hemiplegia, uh, traumatic brain injury, um, any kind of neuro uh, motor neuron de degeneration, organic functions also like constipation or, or urinary incontinence. And I'm gonna focus this talk about the motor, uh, motor rehabilitation in this case. So I'm going to talk about stroke. Uh, I think everybody is affected by closely by somebody that had a stroke or family member, friend, something. So we will know what it is. Um, and when once a stroke happens, uh, normally uh, there is a, a lesion that impairs a brain function. In this case, I'm going to talk about motor function. So normally you use lot, you lose motor control, but you also because of the, this uh, loss. You also lose volume and, the, and then you need such atrophy produced that you also have spasticity which, nor, which normally induces a hyperflexion. And uh, some of the muscle synergies are, are control the muscle domain from the brain. So top-down commands is affected, but there's also compromised sensory and there is a huge lack of motivation. So most of the patients suffer from uh, depression actually after the stroke. So uh, taking this into account and, 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 and knowing what is actually out there for this kind of rehabilitation, it's normally physiotherapy, it's kind of some devices, um, some occupational therapy. Also there are of course robots and functional electrical stimulation, also brain stimulation with non-invasive techniques. Some of all the groups have already tried invasive techniques too, but then, we try to use neural interfaces. So basically try to use the technology, the technology that you guys 
produced uh, to try to um, induce some rehabilitation in this case. So there are many options to record this brain activity and to try to solve uh, this problem. Uh, and as you can see here, there are many means of doing that. You have non-invasive means like uh, near infrared spe spectroscopy, also the fMRI, the EEG, which is the, 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 the easy one and the most uh, available one. You also can use invasive techniques, uh, intracortical electrodes, uh, electrocorticography, and even deep electrodes to basically get the signals out, do some signal processing, and then use that as a control signal for a device. So I'm going to simplifying a lot the concept of what we use, basically the concept. So when, when the signal goes down to the muscle and you move and then you see what's going on. But at the moment uh, that you have a stroke, this not, does not work. Um, and, and we want to restore that. So the way we want to restore that is basically by producing functional movements. And we do that in, uh, by doing uh, action, reaction, and following heavy mechanisms of neuroplasticity. We try to... Uh, after doing this instrumental learning paradigm, reconnect the brain. We did that in a, in a clinical set, in a clinical data, clinical trial uh, with non-invasive uh, means first, as you, what you can see here on the right panel, this is a, a, a patient. This is actually three channels of the, his EEG activity. And we use that to decode intention to move. When we decode that, we move that robot. So what we do is basically close the loop from the top down command. By doing that, uh, we managed to improve uh, clinically these patients, uh, then after, right after this intervention with the neural interface, they got daily physiotherapy to in, to basically generalize the results to the to the normal uh, daily living activities. So we had two control, I mean, one control group and one experimental group, but these are the results that you see here. The control group is the C plus, the sham group is the S. So you can see here, this is the clinical scale, only the experimental group in which we connected the brain, con brain activity, intention to move to the movement of the robot, they recovered a little bit, uh, but it was significant. And the other group, uh, they also got the same therapy, but the movement of the robot was random. So they thought they were controlling it, but indeed it was actually random movements of the robot. So this loop was artificially connected, but it was not paced to the brain activity. It was not brain state dependent, and this did not actually elicit recovery. Here's one of the patients, you can see what he recovered. So these are were all patients with absolutely zero movement on the hand and very little movement on the upper arm. And you can see here that this patient managed to open a little bit the hand and move the screw around uh, in space after being many years completely paralyzed, not being able to move the hand at all. So this basically, um, help us to understand what's going on. We obviously did some recordings before and after the intervention. And we saw that uh, the brain activity that normally happens when, uh, when you're trying to move, uh, in this case, the left hand, um, and you, you get the right hemisphere is mirrored. So this is the right hemisphere and uh, it's normally more active than the other one. But when you get a stroke, what you get is what you see here in the pre-assessment. So you get basically activity all, all over the brain. So the brain is trying to compensate what's not there this function by activating everything that is out there. But after the intervention that we did, we actually managed to lateralize again, this activity towards the lesional side. And, and by doing that, we also checked the EMG activity, which is the ultimate output of the brain, uh, of the brain which is the motor neurons affecting the muscles. And then we can see here before, this is the non poetic hand. So you see here EMG activity on the finger extensors. You can see here clearly when they're trying to open the hand that you get this activity. On the other side, on the parietic hand, you see basically nothing. After one month of this rehabilitation, you can see this activity here that was not there before. Still very small. If you see at the scale, it's like about 10 times smaller or uh, in scale to what we see on the right side, which is a healthy participant, uh, sorry, a healthy side. But you can see that there is activity and you can use that activity uh, to decode that activity and assist the rehabilitation uh, con a contingency that in principle would assist or would enhance heavy and learning and heavy and neuroplasticity. We also had to check the neuro uh, neurophysiology um, a little bit more in detail. In this case, the, the synergies, the muscle synergies. And what we saw is actually that in the patients that recovered better, the motor synergies changed in the uh, functional synergy uh, index uh, recruitment index, so in, in a, it basically is a time domain aspect of the recruitment of the synergies 
they improve that too. So basically we, tr we, we managed to show that the connection between the brain and the muscles influenced not only the brain activity, but also how the brain was connected to the muscles. And that indeed induced some rehabilitation that was even measured by clinical scales that we know are not sensitive normally. We can also see the importance of the longitudinal, the longitudinal recordings. And we're talking about an EEG and we did a, a month, but we're we need more time. We need more time to see how are these changes to understand a little bit better, how long do we need to record? How can we use those that activity to be able to understand what we're doing and to optimize these means? We also did uh, some uh, offline analysis to basically understand uh, how could we record that activity in patients that have no residual hand movement, no residual muscle activity, we start recording from the brain, but some of them had residual EMG activity. However, when we did an offline recording, none of them uh, got better decoding results when we used the muscle activity or the combined muscle and, and brain activity, which actually inclines the balance towards using brain recordings for those patients that cannot really move. And that actually opens a little bit at the door to see if we can actually maybe go inside the brain. So this is a work that has been replicated by many groups and, and literature is growing. There are meta-analyses out there showing that uh, blinking the brain with the muscles could actually elicit some motor rehabilitation, had some effects there. But still, the, measure, the measurements that we've done and the data that we have did not explicitly show that it was really, really, really that what induced the rehabilitation and how how important or how significant is this rehabilitation for everyday life of these patients? So this is just a figure how many different uh, clinical trials are ongoing at the moment with uh, this kind of technology, neural interfaces for, uh, for rehabilitation. So there are a couple of them, to be honest. Uh, so many of them, most of them are non-invasive. Uh, but there's a problem with the non-invasive. The problem with the non-invasive are the artifacts. So here we know that when, whenever there is an artifact and everything is affected by, by the artifact and, and, and doesn't allow stability of the signal. Not only that, but the lesion. So where is this lesion located? When you're actually using means of non-invasive non -invasive means of recording and you have the volume conduction, then you have a problem because everything gets there uh, in, into your electrodes and, and affects many different populations of neurons. So basically changes your normal uh, decoding that you have tested, uh, for example, in healthy participants, you have to be aware of that. And it, that actually makes, um, changes the decoding. So this is basically one example that you can have here uh, the, uh, on the right side. Here, this is the paretic side. So you see when they're trying actually to move, they induce a lot of compensatory movements, movement with the head, movements with the trunk, movement with the other limb that induces artifacts in the EEG that we need to filter out to be able to ensure this contingency between the brain signal that the brain signal related to the intention to move and the, the, the periphery, in this case, the feedback that we provide the patients, uh, in this case, with an exos exoskeleton, a robotic exoskeleton. So this is only to show, it's just a complicated slide, don't even pay attention to it, but this is like, we need to go into very complicated means of using machine learning tools to clean that data when they are non-invasive, to be able to make sure that the signal that we're using for this contingent link between brain and muscles uh, is there. So another problem is the movements, movement of the head. So we have seen uh, that when we're moving the head to the different directions, that actually induces micro movements of the cables of the EEG or even the EEG electrodes, uh, little tension on the skin. And those little, little, little artifacts, little movements can be, uh, introduce, can be introducing a bias in the decoding. And we demonstrated that with placing some IMUs on those electrodes. So what I'm trying to say here is basically that the non-invasive has many limitations. Uh, we also have the EMG, so we thought, why not using the periphery to record that data and, and the residual EMG activity and improve the decoding? So we need to know the output also and how is the output with regard to the central top-down command. So therefore, we design a hybrid, uh, hybrid BCI. In this case, this, uh, this includes EMG activity and brain activity. And it could be non-invasive and invasive, obviously. This is only one example of uh, one of our patients controlling the exoskeleton for di different functional tasks. You can see here the EEG activity of one of the channels that we're using for the feedback, the EEG, that when, once it's detected that he's trying to move, then we change to the EMG control 
which is a decoding of velocities in, in this case, seven degrees of freedom for this exoskeleton that you can see down there. So the render is what it should be doing and, and, and what is actually doing the exoskeleton. And, and these kind of approaches help us to, um, to induce some rehabilitation. But um, I hope you're not hearing that this is too loud. No, we don't hear anything. Oh, okay, great. That's fantastic. Uh, so here on the top uh, left corner, you see how the process to, uh, to boot all this technology. You see, it takes a lot of time. I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit. So you see it's uh, quite tedious. Uh, and then you have to put, place the, the arm of the patient into the exoskeleton after sticking all the electrodes of the EMG and on the top, uh, the, the EEG electrodes, make sure that the impedances are right. So this slows down a lot the process and obviously the patients are there. It's, um, it doesn't make really practical the use of the system. Although we can get into scenarios like immersive scenarios, playing games that you know help and motivates the patient to use this technology. But the key here is how much can we, so stability of the signal and how much um, do they train? Uh, we also have closed loop systems, but for the lower limb, there are many groups that have been trying uh, this technology, some of them with invasive means, we do that with non-invasive for now, uh, using um, magnetic stimulation from the spinal cord and closing the loop doing that. The problem here is the same, so we have elect electrodes that are non-invasive, you have the same to, to face the same issue with regards to uh, the artifacts, filtering that is not trivial, but we managed to do that. And indeed, we tried uh, on, on several patients and we uh, doing the same idea that we had in the, for the upper limb. We tried it on lower limb and we induced some significant rehabilitation in these patients. So there is there is a line of work here that, you know, it, somehow it's uh, is exciting for us. So another another problem. So can we can we achieve a better decoding? Can we induce more or better plasticity using neural interfaces? Can we speed up or uh, this, this setup time? Well, we think we can, and there are many groups that are uh, just going to show a couple of examples uh, um, that are basically the latest example that I have videos from. And this is from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. So controlling with two intracortical arrays, uh, the different degrees of freedom of some avatars and some robotic hands that are external to the body. You can see here the patient moving a little bit in the hand, trying to move to induce some movement. And with that, he's controlling that video here. This is with an ECOG implanted electrode, moving also an exoskeleton in a 3, uh, 3D domain to, to, uh, to uh, touch little sensors here. And here we can see from uh, Lausanne, um, basically the idea that they have regarding identifying the cycle of the gate and stimulating the spinal cord. And now they're trying to close a loop between the brain and the spinal cord. This is one of the patients that after closing the loop between intention to move of the legs and spinal cord stimulation, he recovered. So it's not, we're not talking here about assistive technologies like, like the top ones, which you need to wear the exoskeleton all the time. But if you wear it long enough, long enough, you can induce neuroplasticity. So you can actually restore the connection between the brain and the muscles. There are some papers showing biological effects already with magnetic fields in the range of 50 milliteslas. Did you consider this issue? fixing a frequency similar to five Hertz, how much do you think that the magnetic field could be increased? So the, um, uh, to really delineate the effects of magnetic field itself versus nanotransduction, mm -hmm. one should always perform control experiments, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we do that. Uh, the, um, there is, um, in terms of frequency, the it should not be uh, one should not um, kind of mix the frequency uh, that is let's say a waveform frequency, so which we call a quasi magnetostatic frequency in the context of five hertz if it's a sinusoid, versus let's say if you have sharp pulses. So if you have sharp pulses at five hertz, but your ramp rate is still at, let's say in a nanosecond scale or even a microsecond scale, your gradient of, your time gradient of magnetic field, your dBdt can be quite high and which will result in inductive effects, which is what TMS uses. So this is uh, the fields that we're working with are all in the magnetostatic regime. So even if you go to hundreds of kilohertz, you're still in the magnetostatic regime as long as the, your, your field is uh, weak. So where, so where does a, a, 
um, in terms of having sort of the sinusoidal field, where does it begin to break down? This is something called the field frequency limit, also known as the Brezovich limit. And that uh, is about 5, 10 to the 9 of kiloamps per meter per, uh, uh, per second. So uh, this are amps per meter per second. So and so ultimately that maybe you can do 40 millitesla at 500 hertz. That's what it translates to approximately. So the um, but uh, again, if you want to do five hertz but sharp pulses, then uh, you need to really watch out for your DBDT so you don't end up in the TMS uh, territory. <laughs> Um, so I have a question for uh, Ander and Paulina, uh, and the question has to do with human uh, use. No? So uh, we have a lot of a portfolio now as a field of different uh, new methods that are coming, most of them from uh, nanoscience, but not only. Uh, we heard today about uh, uh, nanoparticles, quantum dots. We heard about uh, the magnetic uh, nanoparticles and magneto. Uh, genetics, uh, uh, there's chemogenetics, there's optochemistry using cage compounds, there's optogenetics. Uh, so people that are not uh, experts are probably lost with all these different options. And from a practical point of view, uh, to use these things in humans, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, what, uh, how would you, uh, help people think about all these options from the point of view of the human use at the end of the road. No? So I don't know, Andrew, you want to go ahead since you are the, uh, the, the user? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. All right, so I'll give my, obviously my, my, my personal opinion on that. So there is a, a, a long road from, uh, from discovering or, or designing this or implementing this new, technologies or, or, or means um, and using them or testing them in humans. However, there are many, many creative options to, to test several of the of, of things that you just mentioned and we just saw today in, in humans by creating or implementing surrogate systems. Of course, there are some cases in which, in which some of uh, the applications could be applied in patients, uh, patients that do not have any other treatment and are, are about to die. And, and there is um, ethically uh, a, an open window to test things on these patients. Obviously, if there is some preclinical work done before that. Uh, I, I see some of the things that we saw today, I, I think they're closer to, to be tested in humans uh, because there's already, um, I think, a lot of data or, or data that is recording at the moment in, 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 in animals and non-human primates. And um, I, there are many ways of doing that, uh, but I think we still have a long way to go to test that in, in, in humans. I, I'm actually, I'm gonna save some of my opinion to uh, after, after hearing what Bolina wants to say, uh, because maybe I can, I can come back later and wrap it up. All right, Paulina, you're next. <laughs> so, um, okay, so the uh, I um, I would say that I'm a very conservative um, neural engineer, uh, and uh, so far, so my group develops the nanomaterials uh, for neuromodulation, but we also develop a sort of a variety of implantable devices with different capabilities, which uh, I didn't talk about today, and. Um, often people approach me with the idea of like, let's try those things in humans. And I, I'm the first one to say, uh, for the longest time, I was the first one to say, we are not ready. So the, um, and it's in terms of um, this scientifically, a lot of those technologies might be ready, but there is uh, in terms of, will they perform their function? Uh, yes, they will. But the question is what else will they do? So, and this is the, um, um, and I think uh, the, a lot of um, sort of safety uh, of these technologies needs to be assessed and it needs to be assessed in the organism that is comparable to the size of a human uh, rather than the mouse. Uh, and, you know, we can do 600 experiments in mice, 
but a human brain is so much larger that we may overlook uh, particular effects or overlook complexities associated with scaling something to, uh, to, to such a massive brain. Uh, so the, um, but for people to kind of to start structuring it for, you know, uh, as a, let's say young neurosurgeon, you're looking at the field of neuromodulation technology and you're getting confused. So the first question you should ask yourself is, am I comfortable with genetic um, uh, modification? And, the, um, uh, and that's uh, a uh, uh, ongoing process, right? That we are recently seeing uh, up to genetics going into clinical st studies for blindness. So there is a lot more appetite for uh, gene, uh, gene modification, gene therapy now than there was, let's say a decade ago. So that is, and if we are um, sort of open to genetic modification, then there is um, sort of all the precise, well worked out techniques such as optogenetics that are now uh, sort of becoming available. Then the next question is, am I um, sort of the, the next branch is, am I open to uh, invasiveness? So can I, am I open to hardware? And if the answer is no, then you have just cut out yourself out of all optical techniques. So now you're like, okay, now I'm limited to ultrasound or magnetism. And you are, and, and then after that, you're looking for resolution trade-offs of those two methods. And uh, um, uh, so that's, um, uh, uh, and there are sort of uh, for, um, uh, for ultrasound, the resolution is coupled to penetration depth, so you can go deeper, but you lose resolution. Or uh, in magnetism, you don't have that coupling, but your resolution is perf is completely determined uh, by your positioning of transducers. Unless we are talking about transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a, a well-proven technique that is uh, is used in clinic right now, but is currently limited by the penetration depth. Uh, because ultimately, you know, your field will be higher at the point where your coils are. So it's really, I would say that rather than thinking about a, a map, we should think about it as a flow chart, is that what it is I want to do, what am I comfortable with, and go down to this sort of hierarchy of technologies, figuring out what, um, what, what, is, uh, what is workable. That is if safety is uh, established. And that is uh, something that we all collectively in the technology development field should be working on and working on to some degree. But those are not the problems that really lend themselves well to academic research, right? You can't defend a PhD in method yep. safety. So, and that's where partnerships with industry or uh, or other sort of uh, involved entities would be helpful to all of us. <laughs> Great. Maybe I wrap up now. Thanks. Yeah, um, you, you, you can go back and then Paulina can go back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks. It was, it was actually uh, great what she said, right? So it, it is important to, that's why um, I think many of us are working on, on invasive and non-invasive means, right? So because the, the ideal scenario is when, when a person has an issue and you have an, a, a solution to that problem, a clinical issue, then you can come as like, really, here you go. Uh, here is the non-invasive solution. Uh, and this is the risk and the benefit. And here's the invasive solution, and here's the risk and the benefit. So that would be fantastic. But in order to do that, we need to investigate. We need to do research. And she mentioned trans, uh, TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, is used in the clinic, and it is uh, for many different things. And it's approved. It's now approved also in closed loop and combination with brainstem dependent stimulation. But we don't really know much about what's really going on in the cells when they, we do that. I mean, we just like boom, sending a, a shot there to the brain. Um, we know that, you know, some cells are firing and that's it. I mean, there are some work there and trying to understand what's going on there, but we're far away from really understanding what's going on there. And I can say the same thing from many other techniques. However, if we really want to understand what's going on, we really need to go deeper um, and more um, to the neuron or cellular level. And I think that there are cases that would justify that. So compassive treatment, for example, for a patient that is suffering from a high level glioma, cerebral glioma, 
and you offer that person an opportunity of using the technique that Polina is developing to do hyperthermia and, and kill those cells, those cancer cells that are there uh, without surgery or with, or with not so much of an invasive treatment. Or yes, you have to go invasive in a certain manner. But you can do that, you can record that and, and you can do histology after that. And that's how, how science progresses. And I think that's, I believe that uh, if we can work with humans, it's much better to work with animals because we can really check what's going on and you don't need a model for that. You just go to that level and see what's going on there. But I think, and I believe that we also need translational um, models that can help us um, interpolate and extrapolate data from the animals and from in vitro and ex vivo to basically humans. And those right now with this hype of the of the artificial intelligence, machine learning, computational neuroscience, I think there are models there that can help us do that. But there is a lack, a, a huge lack of inputs in those models that can be created, which is human data. And human data invasive, what I mean, is like recording that data at a cellular level and ex vivo, maybe a little bit more, but, and, and, and that's where we're missing the data and we need to fill that gap. And I think that's where we should go. Um, if I can follow on what uh, the two of you were saying, uh, uh, I, I couldn't agree more that there is this gap between the basic research uh, and uh, and then the, the clinical application or the application to humans. And uh, as Paulina is saying, uh, you're not going to get a PhD for uh, taking something and fine tweaking it so that you can use it in human. And, one option is to wait for the industry to do that, but the industry, it's even more conservative. <laughs> they're, they're not going to want to touch anything until uh, there's proof of concept, until it works. No? Yeah. So, um, so in fact, that was part of the reason that uh, originally the Brain Initiative was created so that the, the, the original proposal of the Brain Initiative was to create a national laboratory. So it would be like they have in physics and chemistry and in astronomy where uh, there could be uh, teams of people that are high level and they're paid by the federal government or by uh, the government uh, in other countries of critical work. So, and I, I saw today uh, many of cases where this is needed. Now, for instance, in the morning, so optimizing uh, quantum dots. Well, someone has to go in there and build a whole bunch of them and train them all and derivatize them with different uh, um, uh, different moieties to see which one works better in the in the neurons, no? Uh, or just today, what uh, what you guys are saying, what Paulina was was saying today. You know, I, I see uh, the data that Ander is is recording. I said, well, why doesn't Ander have like a NeuroPixel Pro? And the part of it is because neuro, even the person that develops NeuroPixel, like Tim uh, 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 Tim Harris doesn't know exactly what is the ground truth because no one has done that, that type of hard work because you, you don't get a PhD for doing the, the ground truth. No? So I, I think we, we have this sort of problem that uh, it, unfortunately the brain initiative is not really helping to solve. No, it's still there. And, uh, and I, I wish, um, I don't know, private companies or foundation would jump in or, or, or governments no, and, and decide, you know what, this is critical. I mean, we should get these ideas from the lab to the to the bedside, and someone has to do that that uh, proof of concept in between. No? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I I saw. Do you have any comments or any uh, questions? Really, I was lis and listening there. listening to you all with with a lot of interest, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. feel like I have anything in, uh, let's say intelligent to to say. So. Yeah. Um, well, so one uh, suggestion that I have, uh, we don't seem to get that any question from the audience. I think people may be a little bit too tired. So one suggestion is that we take a five minute break before we go to our keynote address of uh, Shannon Bao. So if this is okay with you, uh, we'll reconvene everyone at in five minutes from now at 2.05 um, in the yeah. East. Yes. One little thing, uh, if the rest of the panelists are here, uh, if they wouldn't mind, I would love taking a screenshot of the of all of us, because 
they they asked me to do so. So <laughs> the more the merrier. So Sinan, you're not you're not here, I think, right? Oh yes, you are. Okay, thank you so much. The person in charge of the conferences here will be very happy when when she sees all our faces. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. So this will be so, the photograph for, for this conference. <laughs> so we'll see everyone in five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Without further ado, let me introduce to you uh, Nan Bao. She comes from uh, Stanford University. She was uh, educated in China, Nanjing, material science, a PhD at the University of Chicago. And then she went to Bell Labs where she uh, was an MTS who's working under Elsa Reichmanis. Um, and from there, she went to Stanford, uh, where she's now the chair of, um, of chemical engineering, um, as well as uh, some additional uh, appointments. Um, Shenan has also involved in, she's involved in uh, several startups, and she's received many awards for her work at the US, uh, the US National Academy of Engineering, American Association of Arts and Sciences, the Bell B. Medal and Prize, the Willard Gibbs Award. And uh, she's invited for two reasons. One uh, is for her work, for her work on organic field effect transistors and organic semiconductors for application, including flexible electronics. And she's pioneered uh, uh, the work in, in biology, and she's going to be talking to us about it. Um, and the second reason uh, is also as a role model, as a, as a successful uh, mentor uh, and leader in our field uh, as a woman. Um, and, uh, and this is someone that, uh, that we can uh, look, up, look up to, and this is someone that uh, could inspire uh, many people uh, and many women in their uh, early career years um, to pursue uh, this area, which uh, has been traditionally seen as being uh, more hostile to, uh, to to women. So we're we're ready to change this, uh, Shanann, and we want you to uh, lead us with this final keynote. Uh, thank you. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Raphael, for the um, invitation and also kind introduction. Um, I really enjoyed uh, listening to all the earlier talks. Uh, and uh, as uh, Raphael in introduced uh, that, uh, I, I was actually a, a material chemist uh, and trained as an organic chemist, a polymer chemist. Uh, so um, uh, my interest is really to um, uh, kind of promote the field of organic electronics, uh, but um, uh, we don't want to just uh, blindly kind of promote an uh, area without really finding a uh, place where um, uh, this, um, uh, this field can really make a, a, a meaningful difference. Uh, so uh, that's why um, in my early days, I've been working with uh, flexible electronics using organic materials. Uh, and uh, when I moved to uh, Stanford, um, uh, I, I identified uh, ski-inspired electronics uh, as a uh, really, I, I think, a direction that um, uh, organic materials uh, and also I think nanomaterials uh, can uh, play a unique role. Uh, we uh, see um, uh, analogies uh, between skiing and uh, the electronics we want them to be in the future. Of course, uh, current electronics are still rigid and brittle, but we see that uh, the um, uh, skin actually, uh, if you think about it as a material uh, it or electronic uh, system, it actually has sensing function, signal processing function to generate digital spike signal um, that transmit uh, through the nerve uh, and then get to the brain. Uh, so we, we have all the parts that we want to have in our future electronics. And furthermore, skiing has um, uh, the um, uh, stretchability, biodegradability, self-healing properties that none of our current electronics have. And uh, we, we thought that if we're able to develop 
uh, such kind of electronics with these uh, skin-like properties, then we may be able to change how um, electronics will interface with um, uh, human. And also this creates a uh, great um, kind of motivation um, uh, to, to allow us to really develop uh, new materials in a new chemistry because now such electronic materials existed before. Uh, so we create a problem for ourselves uh, to work on. Uh, and over the past, um, uh, uh, 10 years or decade, uh, we have been uh, kind of developing mat materials, electronic materials, one by one, uh, from conductors to semiconductors, uh, where we add the uh, stretchability, self-healing property, biodegradability, and at the same time, without compromising the uh, electronic property, uh, our electronic property still cannot compete with silicon, cannot compete with single crystal silicon, but they are at a level that is uh, at least uh, as good as amorphous silicon uh, and get into the, um, uh, the uh, uh, polysilicon regime. And in terms of conductivity, they are getting into the regime that's um, uh, not yet as good as metal, but getting uh, close uh, as well. Uh, and then in terms of um, uh, devices, uh, we, we try to build them also one at a time, uh, transistor arrays uh, with um, uh, increased uh, density. And uh, this is of course very important for miniaturization and um, uh, also uh, real funct functionalities. Uh, and then all the different components um, ranging from wire uh, diodes for wireless communication and uh, LED, uh, photo detectors, the battery, all kinds of sensors. Um, and, and these are all the components uh, that we start to, to, uh, to build using the um, electronic materials uh, that we uh, develop. Uh, so in this talk, uh, I will talk about um, uh, kind of uh, uh, two major areas. Uh, uh, one is uh, to uh, generate the, um, uh, the uh, signal, biomimetic signal um, uh, for uh, that's mimicking the uh, artificial mechanoreceptor, uh, which is important for uh, nerve interface uh, to uh, uh, for neuroprothesis to take the sensor signal um, uh, and uh, communicate with uh, with nerve. Uh, and then the other major part I want to talk about is to develop um, high conductivity, high density conducting polymer based electrode arrays for neural interface. We heard the neuropixel talk um, and uh, here we want to use soft materials uh, to uh, hopefully eventually achieve something uh, probably not as high density as neuropixel, but I hope uh, enough density, but uh, can cover much larger uh, surface area. Uh, and then uh, finally, some unique applications that may be enabled by uh, these um, uh, materials and the devices. Uh, so we started actually uh, uh, working in uh, the field that kind of start to, to have some interface with neuroscience uh, because we were uh, inspired by work, uh, a lot of work that are ongoing related to brain machine uh, interface uh, where um, uh, now uh, it's at a stage that uh, um, uh, with a recorded signal from the brain, uh, then uh, these uh, signal can be used to um, uh, control the um, uh, either a robot um, uh, to, to perform certain function uh, or use the signal to um, uh, be able to, uh, to type out uh, speech or language. Um, and, and also um, uh, in that case, of course, it's reading information from the brain. Uh, and there are also other really exciting work that are ongoing that um, uh, put sensors onto prosthetic hand. Uh, and then these sensor signal are feed into uh, either peripheral nerve or directly into the brain uh, to um, provide uh, uh, bi-directional bi uh, prosthesis. 
And uh, so we started uh, uh, looking at uh, um, uh, kind of uh, this area from the uh, point of view of uh, sensors for perthesis. Uh, and um, uh, uh, of course, uh, you can make uh, sensors that can sense the pressure or uh, shear force or vibration. And there have been a lot of work ongoing. And we started by doing that um, uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, but then uh, when we uh, look at the um, uh, biology of um, mechanoreceptors and how they generate uh, generate signal that can communicate it with brain, uh, we were uh, really um, uh, intrigued by the fact that uh, the um, mechanoreceptors, when they are stimulated by external uh, force, uh, uh, in the case of, for example, slow adapting mechanoreceptor that senses the uh, um, uh, amplitude of pressure, uh, it will generate these uh, uh, spikes uh, that uh, firing at different frequencies. Um, and the, the uh, higher the frequency represents uh, higher uh, pressure uh, the uh, mechanoreceptor is being exposed to. Uh, and uh, for the fast mechanoreceptor, they basically just generate a number of spikes and then they, uh, the, the spikes uh, disappear uh, over time. Um, so essentially the, um, uh, the mechanoreceptors uh, are generate digital signals and the implication or, or the um, uh, uh, really the, the significance is that one uh, digital signal can transmit much longer distance uh, without uh, losing the information. And second, it provides the opportunity uh, for the digital signal to be combined at or pre-processed at a synaptic junction. Function. And uh, these uh, digital information can add, uh, uh, being added at the synaptic junction and generate a certain patterns of spike train uh, that can be um, uh, transmitted through the nerve system. And uh, uh, this pre processing of signal uh, significantly reduces the energy consumption. Uh, that's needed uh, for uh, processing tons of data from uh, the um, uh, our skin, which may be collecting these data um, uh, uh, constantly. Uh, so this is uh, quite important. Uh, and uh, so after learning about this literature, it um, uh, made us uh, define our electronic skin is really a system, a electronic system. It's not just about one piece of sensor, but rather uh, the sensors need to be, um, uh, the, the signal need to be converted into uh, these uh, spikes uh, and ideally pre-processed before even going through the nerve system so that we can take advantage of the um, uh, the, the essentially uh, neuromorphic uh, computing kind of uh, scheme uh, to uh, reduce the uh, uh, energy consumption uh, of uh, these um, devices. Uh, and also more recently, we were very excited to read uh, another paper in the uh, field of uh, bidirectional neuroprothesis. Uh, this group in EPFL studied uh, different patterns uh, of uh, signal that can be used to, um, uh, to, to uh, uh, perform nerve interface. Uh, they use amplitude-based uh, signal or um, uh, frequency-based signal or combination of uh, amplitude and the frequency signal or combination of the two signal, but in a different uh, uh, pattern that's uh, used to stimulate the nerve. Uh, and then they have, um, uh, they test these signal on human and uh, ask a human to, to um, uh, basically re rate the naturalness of the signal. And it was, <clears throat> found that so these bars, uh, the, the higher these bars, uh, the, the more natural uh, uh, the, um, uh, the patient found the signal to be. And it was found that it's a combination of these, uh, uh, the amplitude and the frequency signal gives the most uh, natural uh, sensation to the patient. Uh, so that also suggests that um, uh, having the uh, signal uh, to be uh, biomimetic uh, uh, is is uh, very uh, important. 
So how do we realize that uh, with, um, uh, with uh, uh, our materials? Actually here, we used uh, some nanomaterials for the sensor. Uh, basically, the, um, uh, this is a pressure sensor, but it could be any other type of sensor, temperature sensor, uh, shear sensor, or vibration sensor. Um, and um, to generate the um, uh, spike-like uh, signal, uh, we use uh, a simple circuit. Uh, it's a ring oscillator uh, circuit combined with an edge detector. Uh, so the input from the um, uh, pressure sensor will change the voltage um, uh, applied across this ring oscillator and change its uh, frequency. Uh, and then uh, as a result, the um, uh, pressure amplitude will be turned into the uh, frequency signal uh, that after converting from this ring oscillator, which consists of um, only uh, several transistors. Uh, the minimum is uh, six transistors, but of course, um, uh, more transistors, high stage uh, circuit would be more uh, effective. Uh, and then the edge detector consists of about 50 transistors uh, that uh, sharpens the peak um, uh, after going through the edge detector. And then this signal will come into a uh, transistor that we develop. It's called synaptic transistor. Uh, basically, in these transistors, um, uh, there are ions can move, move in and out the semiconductor uh, upon applying an electric field on the gate voltage. Uh, and then this uh, synaptic transistor can, uh, because the ion will um, uh, stay uh, at the um, uh, inside the semiconductor for a certain amount of time, which is controllable depending on the material, uh, then th this basically uh, can generate uh, uh, memory in the uh, device. And if we have uh, multiple sensors, uh, then we can collect, connect the input uh, from multiple sensors into this, um, uh, this uh, synaptic transistors, uh, then the signal will add together. Uh, so for example, if I have two pressure sensors, uh, each of them will generate different pressure information uh, on the top. Uh, the um, uh, pressure is uh, 20 kilopascal after going through the ring oscillator and the edge detector, uh, then it becomes uh, this uh, spike uh, that has a certain frequency. Uh, and then lower when the pressure sensor has a, a higher pressure, it's 80 kilopascal here. And then the signal will, you can see, compare with the top one with the lower pressure, this one will have higher frequency. Uh, so this mimics the, um, uh, the firing behavior of a uh, uh, slow mechanoreceptor. Uh, but then these spike signals signal can be uh, used as input for the synaptic transistor. Uh, and then this signal uh, will add um, uh, together uh, and come out as this uh, uh, signal output. So you can see the pattern of uh, signal uh, coming from the synaptic transistor. Uh, and this pattern can have um, uh, both the control of um, uh, the uh, amplitude as well as the uh, uh, frequency uh, as needed. Needed. Uh, so uh, this basically is a way of uh, pre-processing the, uh, the signal. Uh, and um, uh, this pattern, uh, of course, uh, depending on what kind of object uh, this uh, um, uh, sensor is being exposed to, for example, uh, if um, uh, the um, uh, sensor is uh, 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 being positioned uh, in this uh, parallel fashion, and then we have uh, a, a rod rolling across, and then the spike um, uh, pattern uh, added in the uh, synaptic transistor will uh, mimic that uh, pattern uh, or uh, rolling the uh, vertically, then you don't see the, the roll uh, going across two individual transistors, uh, or two individual sensors. And then for the Brill pattern, uh, there are all kinds of combinations uh, of um, uh, different dots uh, being, uh, uh, being sensed. Uh, and then uh, this can uh, give rise to a, uh, its unique um, uh, uh, output patterns uh, with the frequency and the amplitude that uh, uh, we'll be able to, to obtain. Uh, so then uh, these uh, provides uh, some uh, very simple initial 
demonstration of concept of uh, potentially uh, building uh, electronic skin uh, that can uh, collect the sensory information, but also pre-process uh, the information. So we see this um, as a, a potential pathway for us to take um, uh, flexible material, even stretchable materials. Uh, and uh, um, uh, as we develop uh, sensors and uh, circuits, uh, then we will be able to really make a neuroprosthetic uh, skin that uh, will directly generate a signal uh, that can uh, already pre-processed uh, and combine uh, that, that's related to uh, say certain texture of an uh, object or or, or uh, size or shape of object uh, that can be trans uh, interfaced with a uh, nerve, um, uh, nerve system. Uh, next, I want to talk about uh, uh, the uh, nerve interface uh, with uh, electronics. Uh, we've heard uh, a great talk on really high density um, uh, neuropixel, and uh, that's a really amazing um, advancement. Uh, and uh, in uh, those cases, the, um, uh, the probes are made with uh, rigid material. Uh, and uh, um, uh, of course, uh, our uh, tissue uh, uh, or brain uh, has a very, very low modulus, uh, many orders of magnitude lower modulus uh, compared to those of uh, silicon or metal. Uh, so there have been a lot of interest uh, to uh, develop uh, electronics or neural interface uh, uh, electrodes that can be more in the range of um, uh, mechanical property that's similar to, um, uh, to human brain. For example, uh, uh, Tim mentioned that uh, uh, they suspect that uh, the, uh, the movement of the animal or breathing uh, uh, of the animal may be causing some sliding of the probe uh, and uh, that caused the shift in where the location of the measurement. Uh, so we, we hope to see um, whether soft probes uh, uh, could potentially uh, uh, kind of alleviate uh, such issues. And um, uh, also uh, there have been other uh, studies uh, suggesting that um, uh, for uh, uh, hard, uh, hard probes uh, may, uh, in addition to potential scar tissue uh, formation, uh, but that may not always be the case because uh, the Utah array has been uh, implanted for years and since people can still be able to record information from it. Um, uh, but um, uh, there, uh, there are also other uh, changes uh, potentially. Uh, the, um, uh, the the rigid inter uh, interface with cells uh, uh, can uh, change the uh, uh, behavior of uh, the the cell uh, differentiation. Uh, so so may change locally the um, uh, the, the um, uh, tissue uh, uh, in that region in contact with uh, electrode, even though uh, probably more studies are needed. Um, uh, so so these, um, uh, these are possible areas, uh, soft probes uh, may, may solve certain, uh, may address certain issues, uh, but I think the movement aspect uh, could be one area that soft uh, uh, electrodes uh, may be particularly interesting. And the other areas, uh, uh, potentially are uh, could be related to uh, our um, uh, our organ is con constantly moving changing in size uh, so these are areas uh, uh, again soft materials that can adapt to new shape and the size uh, could be uh, interesting uh, there are also other uh, possibilities to achieve um, the uh, accommodation of uh, uh, size and shape uh, by uh, making rigid materials uh, with um, uh, uh, these uh, kind of uh, stretchable interconnects, uh, then one sacrifice uh, it will have is uh, the uh, density of electrodes. So uh, for example, uh, here, the, um, uh, the electrodes are these uh, squares. Uh, they're separated by these um, uh, gold, uh, or, or metal-based uh, stretchable wires uh, to accommodate these uh, stretchable wires, uh, then the density of the probes uh, cannot be uh, super high. Uh, and also the um, uh, bending stiffness is possible to be reduced by making rigid material 
very, very thin. Uh, and uh, this, uh, because bending stiffness uh, is uh, inverse relationship with the thickness, uh, but then uh, that will make uh, it quite challenging to uh, deliver or handle these kinds of uh, really thin uh, meshes uh, and uh, uh, implant them into the um, uh, into biological uh, system. Uh, so, so here um, I want to show some development of a soft electrode array, and then very quickly mention uh, some of the places we have applied them to. And finally, uh, as a future direction, uh, we're looking at a cell type specific thick uh, interface uh, between electronics uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the neurosystems. Uh, so here uh, we are working with uh, conducting polymer uh, electrode interface. Uh, of course, uh, modulus and the softness, uh, bending stiffness, these are all mechanical properties we can tune, and that those are potential advantages of uh, conducting polymers. But there is one other, I think, um, even more important advantage of uh, conducting polymer, that is uh, uh, in terms of uh, performance, recording quality of data. Um, that's because conducting polymer actually um, uh, typically uh, has this um, uh, conjugated uh, molecular system. This is for electronic conduction, uh, but this polymer is uh, uh, doped and also stabilized uh, with a, um, uh, a uh, PSS, uh, this uh, polystyrene um, uh, 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 sulfonic acid, and then the proton will be transferred to the uh, conducting polymer uh, and allow the of the polymer to increase the conductivity. Uh, but this negative uh, charge, uh, uh, after doping, this poly, uh, counter ion becomes, uh, uh, is negatively charged. It also serves uh, to stabilize the conducting polymer uh, in uh, aqueous uh, colloid solution. Uh, and uh, this system also is an ionically conductive uh, system. Uh, so as a result, uh, if we have large surface area at the same time, uh, then uh, the um, uh, impedance uh, for this kind of uh, electrode uh, interface with um, uh, tissue uh, in the circuit model has uh, both the uh, resistance, um, uh, resistive component and the capacitive component. And for most metal, this capacitive component is um, uh, really small uh, and uh, metal uh, doesn't have any ionic conductivity. Uh, so, uh, but for these conducting polymer, we can, especially at low frequency, uh, kilohertz or below, um, uh, depending on the material, but below kilohertz, uh, this capacitance term can be very, very high and uh, play a very important role to lower the impedance um, between the electrode and the tissue. And this lowering in the impedance uh, can be as high as uh, several orders of magnitude. So what that means is that if we use smaller electrode size compared to metal, uh, we can get the same um, uh, signal to noise ratio. Or if we use the same size of electrode uh, area uh, compared to metal, we can get potentially higher signal to noise ratio uh, because of this uh, lowering in the impedance. Uh, and uh, this is just a further illustrated, uh, for example, in metal, you see a very, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, impedance is mostly dominated uh, by only just the resistance term at low, uh, 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 low frequency. And for metal, of course, people have uh, tried to, to make a uh, uh, larger surface area by making actually nano grass in platinum, and this increased the capacitance um, uh, uh, term, and then this will uh, uh, lower the impedance uh, to a certain degree. Um, and uh, uh, in the con case of conducting polymer, I mentioned it's ion conductive. Uh, and uh, also the other reason is uh, uh, for high in uh, low impedance uh, is because of this uh, high surface area. Uh, that exist in the uh, conducting polymer film. Uh, this is after we remove all the solvent uh, in the uh, in the film. Um, 
we can see the, these uh, highly porous uh, structure. And in our case, uh, we found that the charge injection uh, current uh, for these kinds of electrodes can be several orders of magnitude higher than uh, those of uh, platinum electrodes uh, of similar size. Uh, and the result is if we use that to stimulate uh, uh, the nerve, of, um, uh, uh, in this case, is in the uh, mouse model, uh, stimulating the uh, sciatic nerve, uh, then uh, the voltage needed to stimulate uh, is much lower. So this uh, y-axis is to induce any uh, leg movement using the electrode, uh, and um, uh, x-axis is the stimulation of uh, voltage. Uh, for the blue is with our conducting hydrogel material. We can use a much lower voltage to uh, observe um, uh, uh, movement, while with the platinum electrode, we need to go to higher uh, voltage. And this is is a result of lower uh, impedance uh, with our conducting polymer electrode. Uh, and of course, always uh, for organic material is electrical conductivity may not be uh, high enough. And uh, this has been the major challenge for, for us. Uh, that is um, uh, softness uh, in the kilopascal range, similar as brain or tissue, that's not uh, too, too much a challenge. We have many ways to realize that. Uh, and also many uh, other groups that have have been able to realize uh, the uh, uh, low uh, modulus, but it's really the challenge is to get to high conductivity. Uh, and um, uh, here, this is uh, uh, kind of from the material design point of view, what we have been working very hard on. Uh, our initial um, conductivity uh, was uh, uh, 4,000 siemens per meter. Uh, uh, and the, the most recent version now is much increased. Uh, so now it's um, uh, 4,000 siemens per centimeter. Uh, ITO indium tin oxide is uh, uh, in this kind of range. So it's not yet uh, similar as metal, but uh, uh, can uh, this is uh, uh, quite high conductivity, among the highest for conducting polymer. Polymer, but in our case, it's low modulus and also uh, stretchable. Uh, so the key in our case to realize high conductivity is really to through tuning the molecular interaction or the actually ionic interaction between our conducting polymer and the um, uh, this anion that's used to stabilize the conducting polymer. Uh, and um, uh, uh, it has been found that uh, depending on the uh, ion concentration in the solution, one can tune this polymer to be gel phase or precipitate out or it's a uniform uh, colloid dispersing liquid. Uh, so the key that we found was to really find the right ionic species to induce this gel phase formation, but at the same time, making the conducting polymer to be interconnected with each other. So we were able to find, uh, for example, uh, these type of uh, ionic liquid uh, when they are uh, introduced into the uh, P dot PSS solution, they in, uh, induce the nanofiber formation of the P dot conducting polymer. So these nanofibers uh, uh, not only provides the mechanical strength, but also uh, was the key for us to realize a very high conductivity with these uh, uh, polymers. But of course, the ionic uh, uh, liquid is, uh, uh, many of them are not biocompatible. Uh, so in our uh, process to make the electrodes, what we do is first induce the nanofiber formation by adding the ionic liquid. Uh, and then we um, uh, make this into a film and dry the film. And then we can wash away the ionic liquid. And with that film, we will be able to perform any microfabrication that's needed to get to the resolution needed for the electrode. Uh, 
And then finally, when we uh, re-immerse this uh, uh, electrode into the um, uh, into the aqueous solution, uh, then uh, the, um, uh, the the polymer will uh, be uh, uh, re-swelled with water, and actually the thickness will increase uh, uh, six times, and this makes the soft conducting hydrogel uh, that has very low um, uh, low modulus uh, that can be used to interface uh, with uh, uh, with uh, tissue without uh, with very low uh, softness. Uh, and the uh, uh, the patterning was basically uh, in our first generation, uh, we have to deposit a metal to protect the polymer and do photolithography uh, on top of it and then perform etching and to get to, to uh, micro si micron size, uh, feature size of the electrode. Uh, this works, uh, but the uh, sometimes the yield uh, could be limited. Uh, our most recent generation, uh, we were able to uh, formulate this uh, PDOT material to have uh, both uh, the uh, really high several thousand semen per centimeter um, uh, conductivity, but also can be directly photo patterned. So we just coat the polymer, uh, expose it to UV light, pattern it uh, to micron feature size, then this way we can make a dense uh, electrode arrays, uh, and it's a stretchable uh, electrode, so very good mechanical property and very low impedance uh, uh, compared to uh, metal electrode. Uh, and also having the high conductivity will allow us to uh, make these uh, interconnects as long as they are not super long, then the conductivity may not be sufficient. Uh, but now the conductivity is uh, sufficient, at least if we want to implant in, in mouth or not too deep into the brain, then all the interconnects uh, are sufficiently conductive uh, using our uh, uh, all polymer system. And one may uh, also ask uh, whether this is uh, potentially really uh, scalable uh, in the future, because with uh, these polymer systems, uh, the fabrication is uh, still something yet to be developed. Uh, indeed, uh, we are working very hard towards that direction. Uh, our first generation, these are even more complicated. Uh, these are uh, transistor arrays uh, that has multi-layer uh, structure uh, and the interconnects uh, that we have to fabricate. Uh, first generation, we were able to get 350 transistors per centimeter square. Uh, our most recent uh, generation that will come out next week will be um, 42,000 transistors per centimeter square. And this is uh, based on uh, all, all the materials are directly photo patterned. So no additional photo resist, so direct photo pattern of uh, uh, all the active materials. Uh, and then uh, the next generation, we hope to get to 100,000 per centimeter square. And then this um, uh, fabrication can be done uh, on the wafer scale using all the tools, uh, lithography tools uh, that are readily available. Uh, I see my time is almost up. Uh, just want to say that um, uh, maybe I'll skip some of these. Uh, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, the uh, biocompatibility, uh, we have um, uh, uh, have not really done extensive uh, recording using these electrodes, uh, but we've done some uh, study by implanting uh, uh, soft electrodes uh, into the uh, mouse brain uh, for four weeks where the mouse was left uh, running around and uh, uh, did some uh, immune um, uh, response study. Uh, and we compare that with uh, these are uh, kind of the stretchy electrodes we use. And then we compare them with uh, carbon fiber that has uh, uh, rigid silica. Um, uh, coding uh, on the surface uh, as a control to compare. And we found that the um, uh, response, uh, the GFAP uh, sting uh, response uh, much lower with our soft electrode uh, and also the other uh, marker also uh, shows much lower response uh, compared to the rigid, more rigid uh, probe. Uh, and uh, also the, um, uh, these are additional response uh, that we have uh, measured. So probably I think uh, uh, the time is really uh, up. I should just say that uh, the future opportunity for these um, 
um, uh, devices uh, potentially uh, could be uh, in addition to um, uh, kind of soft interface with um, uh, brain with the nerve system. And also the other one is accommodate the growth uh, of, the, um, uh, of the organ. Uh, this is a work we have done uh, to uh, look at uh, uh, the, this nerve cuff uh, that can change shape without asserting any uh, mechanical force uh, to, the, uh, to the nerve. And after the nerve is double the size, um, uh, we can still perform recording and uh, uh, stimulation after uh, two months of implantation. This is uh, on the sciatic <clears throat> nerve uh, of, the, uh, of the rat. And the final uh, kind of, um, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, direction, I think really exciting uh, that interface uh, um, uh, organic chemistry, polymer chemistry uh, with um, a nerve system uh, is uh, the uh, potential opportunity for um, uh, genetic targeting to uh, um, uh, uh, synthesize uh, polymer directly at the um, uh, cells uh, uh, that are of interest uh, to, uh, these can be neuron cells that we are interested in modifying their firing behavior. Uh, this is work done in collaboration with uh, Kyle Desroff, uh, where uh, these um, uh, enzyme, uh, so-called A, uh, Apex2 enzyme is being um, uh, delivered to uh, certain neuron uh, surface, uh, and this can initiate the uh, polymerization of conducting polymer uh, that's uh, only at the location where uh, this oxidative enzyme is modified. Uh, and we found that um, uh, can, uh, depending on the polymer uh, that we use uh, to coat the surface of the uh, neuron, it can change the firing behavior of these neurons. Uh, so this could be um, uh, potentially a, uh, a way for us to, uh, uh, to change uh, the um, uh, uh, electronic interface uh, between our uh, stimulation and the um, uh, cells so we want to uh, interrogate uh, in the future. So to summarize uh, uh, here, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, opportunities uh, for uh, really uh, materials development, uh, tool development, device development uh, for um, uh, interface with uh, biological systems in general, and also specifically in uh, the uh, neuroscience area. And I echo the um, uh, panel discussion and the earlier speakers uh, um, uh, uh, kind of sentiment uh, sentiment on the uh, one challenge is the signal processing uh, area and the other is uh, really uh, understanding the, um, uh, the, the kind of long-term impact of these new type of materials and devices uh, on the biological system. Those are really important uh, future directions uh, that, that we need to have better understanding. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, thank my research group, uh, uh, funding agencies, and the many collaborators uh, for uh, their uh, support and uh, help over the years. And thank you again for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Shannon. Um, a very uh, uh, creative uh, uh, work, I have to tell you. <laughs> uh, so um, let me just start with one question. So um, is the idea that this uh, flexible hydrogel um, conductive um, electrodes would uh, eventually be degraded in the body uh, or will they remain up for a long period of time? I, I didn't understand that. I didn't catch that part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the, um, uh, the conducting polymer hydrogel uh, currently, um, well, the, our implanted time is still very limited. The longest is a few months. Uh, and we are also uh, just simply putting them in a buffer solution and see if they will change chemically over time. Um, and currently, these materials are, are uh, we found that they are quite stable. 
uh, in the um, uh, biological environment. Uh, but I don't know over years uh, whether that will still be the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, in this case, uh, I mean, they could be also uh, a good feature now that you uh, expect them to essentially get absorbed and disappear from the body, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that would be uh, something uh, for certain uh, applications that may be, a, mm -hmm. uh, that, that may be uh, something you, you would want. Yeah, mm -hmm. There's no, yes. no trace left behind, so speak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, certainly for, for some applications about having biodegradability, it could be desirable. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was fascinated by the idea of having the, uh, essentially the mesh carry the, uh, the, the signal as opposed to the old concept of a wire, the single wire. So uh, does that create, um, so I, I, this is the first time I, I, I think about this, but uh, uh, is the intuition, you were saying that the conductivity would still remain very high or could be even better? So mm -hmm. why is that? Because I would have expected that it would take uh, more uh, ch uh, current to charge up the whole network and you get many other mm -hmm. ways for the current to leak out. No, I, I, I don't have a good uh, intuition. Yeah, so, so it's mainly because uh, we were not really fully uh, taking advantage of the uh, of the material um, in the uh, in the thin film, uh, so I think uh, uh -huh. it's uh, maybe yeah. So so actually, the um, normally for uh, in order for this uh, conducting polymer to be stable in aqueous solution, uh, it has this uh, negative counter ion and it's in large excess. So that's preventing the conducting polymer to form a continuous conduction pathway. So that has been the polymer that uh, uh, we have been using and that's what's commercially available. Uh, so basically there's a lot of insulating component. And what we are doing is making the red part to be interconnected by forming the nanofiber. And yep. then also the, um, uh, the, the other access insulating part during this process, I didn't mention in great detail, it also phase separate to a certain degree. And now we can remove it by just simply washing. Um, uh, washing it away. Uh, so we're we uh, basically uh, cre creating more conduction pathways uh, using the existing material uh, to enhance the conductivity. But ultimately uh, for even higher conductivity, of course, we want to have more conductive components, uh, as much uh, conductive component as possible to have the highest conductivity. Great. Um, so there's a question uh, from Arjun uh, Barkiove. What methods do you use to implant soft electrodes into the brain? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't they deform during the implantation process? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there has been, uh, we, we're using the uh, method that others uh, have already uh, explored, basically uh, coating the surface of the soft electrode uh, with uh, a uh, water soluble uh, material. This could be a uh, biocompatible polymer uh, that's of uh, higher modulus, high modulus, uh, or uh, some kind of uh, sugar coding and then once uh, it uh, after the coding the, the probe becomes rigid and then we can insert into the brain and then uh, within uh, five or ten minutes uh, this uh, coding slowly kind of dissolve uh, into the uh, surrounding uh, tissue yeah. thank you oh. right, so do you have any questions for Shannon. I have a very simple question. I didn't understand something. Uh, when you were showing the, press, the pressure sensors that you developed, the, the electronic skin, I didn't really quite get what do you do with them. Do you implant, implant them in any uh, living specimen or? Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, what we... Uh, 
imagine or, or what we hope to do is to uh, put that as the uh, uh, basically the skin onto per, uh, per thesis. And then the uh, signal from it uh, can be directly used for uh, to uh, uh, connect with the um, uh, the nerve peripheral nerve, uh, and uh, then that signal already carries uh, the uh, biomimetic uh, signal or uh, information uh, that can transmit through the uh, uh, peripheral nerve. So so far we have not really. Uh, uh, tested that on, uh, of course, on human, that's still a long way to go. We have uh, used that kind of signal to stimulate uh, the, uh, uh, the nerve, peripheral nerve of uh, mouse. And uh, we're able to, to show the uh, kind of, uh, the, the uh, basically close the, the uh, loop of uh, sensing and uh, sti uh, nerve stimulation. And next we want to take the signal to uh, send to the brain and then have the brain to control some movement uh, of the animal. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, one idea that came to my mind is that if uh, you would connect this to, to, uh, to humans, let's say that it could also be used to understand what signals do we perceive as what mm -hmm. things, right? And so I, I, mm -hmm. that's the that's idea that I had in mind, but as you right. said, there is still a long way until... You can yeah, do that. I, actually, I, I think uh, the um, uh, it will be a long way if uh, we try to use the nerve interface that's not already uh, FDA approved, but our signal could potentially be connected to the nerve cuff that uh, the uh, scientists are already using for uh, peripheral nerve uh, stimulation. Uh, so if that's the case, then it could potentially uh, be used to uh, do the kind of testing that you were suggesting. Yeah. Okay. But we needed to make the connection with uh, people who uh, do this type of experiments. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Shannon, I had a question also. Um, if you could uh, share your candy thoughts as how to bridge the gap between uh, you're building this exquisite technology that could be potentially uh, supersede what people use in, in the, uh, definitely in the clinic. Uh, uh, you heard the, the talk by Ander. So imagine uh, people walking around with this type of uh, of flexible uh, electronics, which are biocompatible, etc. So, um, in order for that to happen, uh, how how can we get? How are we going to get the stuff from your lab into the clinic? How how do you uh, plan, or what are your steps to to do this? Mm -hmm. Well, I I, I think uh, uh, this. Um, um, uh, from the lab to clinic, uh, there are uh, still a lot of um, development uh, is needed. Uh, I see the, the uh, path that uh, NeuroPix uh, uh, takes, uh, that kind of path that I think is needed uh, for any technology to really uh, get there. There needs to be, uh, well, first, uh, uh, hopefully a commercial product uh, that um, uh, such as uh, Neuralink is building uh, can uh, really show the uh, possibility to uh, use in a space that's beyond just research. Uh, and then uh, there really need to be um, uh, quite a lot of uh, investment in uh, really developing the technology, the scalability and reliability uh, to the uh, stage uh, that's, um, uh, that's commercializable. Uh, but I think uh, from uh, the uh, lab point of view, some of the initial proof of concepts are already there. Uh, and uh, the, um, I think our challenge is uh, to show the long-term uh, long-term capability and also like uh, what Paulina said, it's that kind of study is difficult to do with the PhD thesis. And um, uh, so that's the, the challenge uh, uh, that, that we face. You know. um, there's a question from Shenpeng Chin. For the genetically encoded polymer, what are your thoughts on how this can be used and future directions? Yeah, so, so for the um, um, 
uh, genetically targeted uh, conducting polymer, uh, we see possibilities. Uh, one uh, is um, uh, if it uh, changes the um, uh, firing uh, pattern uh, of the neuron, then it potentially may allow us to, um, uh, to stimulate uh, certain uh, neuron cells uh, that are uh, modified specifically uh, without uh, impacting other neurons because otherwise uh, whichever uh, the, um, uh, the, the neuron cells that are in contact with the, uh, with the electrode will get stimulated. But uh, if we can have these uh, difference uh, in the frequency in stimulation or potentially maybe the impedance uh, uh, between the, um, uh, that uh, is changed at the interface, uh, then the voltage required for stimulation might be uh, different. Uh, then we will also be able to achieve uh, selective stimulation. Uh, and also alternatively, there are some uh, diseases, um, uh, for example, uh, the um, uh, uh, some some uh, Parkinson's disease uh, where uh, the uh, uh, neuron firing uh, um, pattern uh, cannot be uh, is uncontrolled. Uh, maybe uh, using this kind of approach uh, can modify the, the firing pattern and could be a way of uh, uh, potentially treating certain uh, disease. But th that's probably a longer longer uh, path to go. Yeah. So um, there is another question. Oh, no, sorry, that's the same question. <clears throat> so I don't think we have other questions. Uh, and I think we're uh, pretty much uh, out of time. So, mm -hmm. um, so Shannon, we just wanted to thank you for your uh, keynote and for your inspiration. And I uh, wish you good luck uh, with this research, which could open so many doors for, for so many uh, people. Thank you. Um, Thanks again for having me. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> with this, uh, I think I'd so then I can give a final comments. Um, yeah. So you want to go ahead, Daitsol, or you want me to go ahead? Either way. No, yeah, I can I can say a couple of words. So I would like to thank uh, all the attendees to, to the conference. To me, it has been a, a super interesting conference. We I think we covered quite a wide range of, of topics. And I hope people enjoyed the conference as much as I did. And I would like to thank all the speakers for accepting our invitations to, to talk. And hopefully next year, we will see each other in person in San Sebastian for the next edition of Nano Neuro 2022. And I don't have anything else to say. So Rafa, if you want to say yeah. something. No, I, I wanted to echo your comments that uh... Uh, we're doing another edition next year. So this is, we want this to be uh, essentially a beginning of the summer uh, tradition to have a meeting in Nano Neuro. We're very uh, passionate about the future of this field. Uh, you can see this from uh, the exquisite uh, talks that we've heard today. They were absolutely brilliant and, and exquisite. And we still haven't covered uh, all the terrain. There's still uh, so many more people that we can uh, we will invite to to speak at this meeting. So, mm -hmm. so this is definitely a growing field, nano neuro, uh, and hopefully we will help uh, to put it in, in the map. Um, and behind us stand uh, not just Columbia University and uh, the DIPC in San Sebastian, but also the Kaplan Foundation. So the Kaplan Foundation uh, has been uh, supporting this from the beginning. Uh, they are very committed to both neuroscience and nanoscience. And in fact, I wanted to announce that the Kavi Foundation just uh, created uh, a program, a pilot program, which is called a Nano Neuros Fellow uh, Program, which uh, I'm going to share my screen with some information about it. So this is a fellowship for postdocs uh, that uh, will be covered for three years to work in nano neuro between uh, Cornell uh, University and Columbia University. It turns out that Cornell has a nano uh, science uh, Catholic Institute and Columbia has a neuroscience Catholic Institute. And we have, uh, we have today uh, Chris Shu speaking from Cornell and he's part of this uh, 
a nano neural fellows um, program committee. So the idea is that you, as a postdoc, you spend uh, three years working across two labs, uh, one uh, in each institution, and uh, and the uh, the cost of the fellowship will be paid partly by the Cavley Foundation and also by the Columbia and Cornell Cavley Institute. So the uh, the applications uh, the deadline is been extended until uh, July first, um, and I'm going to uh, put in the uh, in the web some information. Uh, well, you can find information in the web, but uh, maybe um, we can let me actually post in the chat now if any of you is interested in, in applying. Uh, there is uh, there is an application form that you can. Uh, let me just put it uh, for every attendee. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that this is something that could be uh, could be of, of interest uh, to people. And this is just one of the examples of uh, how you could uh, uh, you could um, bridge uh, these fields by having younger people getting trained in them. And with that, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone for attending, and particularly James uh, Holland and Leili Aligari, who are the people behind uh, the scenes here. And I wanted them to turn on their cameras to say hi and to uh, to receive our applause, <laughs> Leili and James. Uh, so we're applauding you, uh, sending you uh, uh, our thanks uh, for running these meetings so smoothly, uh, flawlessly. Uh, like uh like this is not the first time like you always do anyway so uh, with that uh thanks and see you everyone uh next year hopefully in person that's it <laughs> bye, bye see you next year